So I'm genuinely embarrassed about how long this video ended up being, but I don't think it was very avoidable considering the goals, which is to answer all the complexity and the debates that go on in this passage. And I tried to answer it as succinctly as I could, but to actually answer it. That's why I've given you timestamps, right? I think every piece of this video is valuable for answering these questions, but the timestamps are there so you can navigate your way through it, find what you need, including just skipping to the conclusion. If that's your most interested part, go for it. Whatever helps you is fine, but this video is there because it's meant to help everybody. So it's got all the content. That being said, I say, let's get into it. Um, the head covering stuff, all the debates, all the difficulty, hopefully bringing you confidence and clarity by the end. All right, this is the infamous head covering video. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. This is going to be the in-depth analysis of the most famous and very infamous and hotly debated passages in the Bible, even amongst Christians, on the topic of head coverings and male and female relationships. That's 1 Corinthians 11. So there's tons of controversy in this passage. There's tons of complicated debates and I'm trying to bring clarity. We're going to go deep into the difficulty so that we can bring clarity out and have you walk out so that at the end of this video, you will understand, you will understand, hopefully, here's my, my agenda for you. You'll understand the major and minor debates on 1 Corinthians 11, what they are. You'll also hear points for and against each view so that you can have, hopefully, finally, fairly confident conclusions on what you think this passage really means, both as it applies to the topic of head coverings and as it applies to male and female relationships, especially for those who don't know, this is part of my whole women in ministry series, as it relates to like authority relationships between men and women. What's the deal here? What is the Bible actually teaching us? So the complementarian versus egalitarian views. Complementarians being those who hold that uh, men and women have different roles, though they have equal value. Um, and and equal inheritance in Christ and their heirship in Christ and all that, but there are different roles related to authority. And the egalitarian view who holds that there is no such thing as different roles related to authority when it comes to gender. And so let's start by just looking at the passage. That's the first task. And as we do this, we're just going to read through. I'm going to read it without commentary. First Corinthians chapter 11 verses ultimately 2 through 16. This is the focus we're in. I just want to read it as you think about it, because one of the most important things you'll need throughout this whole video is that you just have a sort of broad awareness of 1 Corinthians 11. This is an analysis of a scriptural passage, not an extra biblical debate. It's a, it's a discussion of this passage of scripture. We've got to have this really sort of drilled into us so that by the end of the video, you'll be like able to quote parts of this by memory, most likely. So here we go. Just gather your questions. I'll read this without commentary. You just think, I wonder what that is. Oh, why does it say that? Or, oh, I think I see a flow here. Just kind of, you know, begin your understanding. Uh, now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to cut, to have her hair cut off or, have, or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the sake of woman, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. That's the section of the scripture we're going to be covering. I hope you've gathered some questions about it, but let me just tell you some of the broad claims that we're going to be covering. This is the stuff you're going to hear about 1 Corinthians 11 in response to the things you just read. 
Some claim that um, this passage teaches, at least for the first century Christians, that head coverings are a rule. Women are to wear head coverings, in particular, at least in worship settings. Then they will also go on to say, in addition to that, it's because this whole passage is supporting complementarian gender roles. That's the purpose of the head covering. Others will say, well, yes, it's about head coverings. You're right about that. But there's no complementarian gender roles. This has nothing to do with authority or who's in charge or anything like that. It's really just about, um, you know, maybe about sexual partners, you know, communicating something about who your partner is, that sort of thing. Then there's a, a third view that is that this passage actually, we're completely reading it wrong. Most Christians throughout time have read it wrong. It's actually refuting head coverings where you think it's telling you women should wear head coverings. Paul actually goes on to say, no, no, all that's wrong. That's not necessary. That's not required. It's refuting head coverings. Others will be even more extreme, and they'll say that this passage simply doesn't belong in the Bible at all. And I'm talking about scholars here, not just random strangers you meet. There are scholars who write whole papers or books on these topics, and we'll be getting into that. So they'll say the whole passage, verses 2 through 16, doesn't belong in the Bible at all. Um, then there's others, and we'll deal with this one as well, that say um, it's actually not about head coverings. It's about having your hair done up. There's no cloth covering in view. Every time this passage you think is talking about cloth coverings, it's really talking about someone's hair being done up. There are yet other views in addition to all these things. Um, this has even led some scholars to say that the passage is hopeless. That is, there is no way to understand it, not because of our lack of wisdom or our lack of clarity or our misunderstanding, but rather because it literally doesn't make sense. I kid you not, there are scholars, not that many evangelical scholars, uh, not necessarily, but there are scholars of the New Testament who will say this passage literally makes zero sense. It's nonsense, um, which I would take to be a very arrogant position and one that I would never hold towards any scripture at all and call me religious, uh, but I am, and you should be too. <laughs> so uh, you'll see the counter behind me. We're going to be using that later because we will be putting timestamps as we kind of cover all these other things. Uh, and on top of the sort of overview issues I just mentioned, you have tons of your own questions about this passage. You're probably wondering, why does it say in verse 10, because of the angels? Like, what is what is up with that phrase right there? Because of the angels. There's a whole bunch of debates on that. Is it saying that angels have lust issues towards women? Some people claim that. Lots of people, actually. Um, lots of Christians who are solid Christians, right? They would say that. Um, and how are we supposed to apply it today? I have found that almost none of the scholars who deal with this passage spend any real time asking the question of how to apply it today. They just have like two or three sentences on it, and that's it. We're going to spend real time on that question today. It's a huge issue that most most of them just kind of either, they don't ignore it exactly, they just kind of wipe it away with one sentence. And that's not sufficient, at least not for me, who wants to take this very seriously. And there's actually a, a very big and growing, to, to my knowledge anyway, my impression is there's a large and growing head covering movement of Christians who read this passage and go, seems like I'm supposed to wear a head covering. I want to honor the Lord. And they're doing that. I'm not going to ridicule them, but I'm going to pro provide some analysis of that. Um, actually, we'll get there. That'll be at the very end of the video. And you got timestamps. You could just skip to it if you really need to know right now and don't want to hear the reasons why. <laughs> so go for it. Do what you need to do. Also, uh, is this passage saying that men should not have long hair and women should not have short hair? Is it saying that? Well, that that's pretty relevant too as well. Um, and what does this passage mean by referring to Adam and Eve? And why is Eve or woman in the glory of man? Like, what is all this about? Tons of things we're going to discuss today, timestamps to section everything off into its different area, and we will address it all. And parents, if, you, if you're watching or if you're a very young, very young person, you want to pause the video now because there are adult details that I will be covering in detail in this analysis. There's an increasingly, here, here it comes, there's an increasingly popular claim that the key to understanding 1 Corinthians 11 that has eluded us for all these years is that it's talking about, and I kid you not, is a very serious view that is talking about a woman's hair throughout the passage as if it functions as a testicle, biologically as a testicle. And they'll say, hey, that's what medical thought viewed at the time. And that's what it seems Paul is saying. And if you understand that, the whole passage starts to make more sense. Um, I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to push back really hard against that view. I think it's very wrong for a number of reasons, um, but I'm going to take it seriously. There's a whole scholarly debate we'll get into in that section of this uber long video. Many complicated debates. Um, and lots of timestamps for you to bounce around. Welcome to part 10 of the Women in Ministry series, everything the Bible teaches related to the topic and all the scholarly debates. We have so far dealt with, let's just say we have dealt with a lot of things. 
a lot of things. Uh, let me show you real quick. Series so far, the series so far, the first five videos, you can just read on your screen the different topics we dealt with. Old Testament stuff, New Testament stuff. Uh, we're women apostles, women leaders, and women in ministry in the New Testament and uh, women positions in the Old Testament. Then the next set of videos we've got on your screen um, right there. And yeah, basically we're covering tons and tons of topics. And this has led us to video number 10, which we're doing today. Pay attention. Here's the format for the rest of the video. I've given you the intro. I've showed you some of the scope of debates that are going on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to teach this passage to you, 1 Corinthians 11, five different ways. I'm not going to, I'm going to try and move pretty quickly, especially the further down we get. I won't keep repeating myself, right? But I'm going to teach it five different ways so you understand how these people have these different angles and views of this passage. And you'll, you'll see the complexity before we can bring, hopefully, simplicity back to things. First, it'll get very complicated, then it'll get simple. Um, so I'll teach it five ways. Second thing I'll do is I'll identify key debates versus peripheral ones. It's confusing, this passage and the debates, because partly we don't recognize that most of the debates are not essential, right? They're, they're like more secondary issues. And what we tend to, like, what, what tends to sparkle and grab our attention and have us run, ooh, what about that issue? What about the angels? That's actually very secondary. It's not a key to understanding the passage. It's a secondary issue. So we're going to split these things. And then I will have 14 questions we're going to be asking about this passage after, after all that. We're going to answer 14 questions. And I feel that if we answer these 14 questions, if I've done my job good as a teacher, you're going to understand the passage very well. And you'll have solid conclusions as to your views. We'll tackle these 14 questions in two categories, the key questions and then the peripheral questions. And then finally, I'll give you conclusions. That'll be the very end of the video, of course. So here we go, starting up, I'm going to teach it five different ways. The first way I'm going to teach it is called the traditional interpretation. So here, here we go. Look at that. See, look at this teaching aid. It's this really poorly made graphic I've, I've got for you. The traditional interpretation is the following. This, I use the word traditional here in um, a loose sense because for at least the key elements, it's a rather common view throughout time. Like throughout history, this is t a typical, gen you know, the broad strokes, a typical view for Christians throughout time. Um, I'm also using the NASB for today's study, not the ESV. That's because the ESV makes decisions for you that we'll talk about later. It translates the word woman as wife throughout the passage. That's the primary reason. And I don't want to get there yet. I want to leave it more ambiguous. NASB does that. So we'll get there. So here we are. Let's look at the passage itself under the uh, perspective of the traditional interpretation. So starting in verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. In, in these verses, we get a, this traditional interpretation. I'm speaking from that direct direction, which is sim similar to my conclusions as well. Uh, but there's a lot more details you'll need. God's divinely given authority structure, according to this passage, is that man, the man, singular, is the head of a woman. That's that's interesting. Now, we, we have this coupled with sort of transcendent realities. Uh, Christ is the head of every man. We certainly see this as including his authority. God is the head of Christ. Well, Christ submits to the Father. In fact, I'll share it with you scripture on this real quick. But, but also the man, singular, is the head of a woman. This could be husband and wife. And that would be consistent with other places where Paul talks about a husband and wife having a relationship of authority. Ephesians 5, it tells us, let's look at that. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Same term, headship, that's used in 1 Corinthians eleven three, As Christ also is head of the church, okay? And it's connected to Jesus' headship as well. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands and everything. This is clearly a husband-wife situation. Maybe that's what's in view in the passage as well. In 1 Corinthians 11, where it uses terms like woman, man, could be referring to husband-wife. Um, now, it also says here that God is the head of Christ. And some people wonder what the traditional view of that would be. And how is God the head of Christ? And here we would be emphasizing the Father, and 1 Corinthians 15, 28 actually talks about this. When all things hmm. when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. 
That is, there is a future yielding of the Son to the Father that happens throughout time, starting at least at the incarnation and continuing on through time. Some say that the Son was always yielding to the Father, it's always submitting, and um, I'm not promoting that view. And, and my interpretation, this is key, my issue, my, my case for the complementarian side, which is where I've fallen in this study, um, does not depend on the idea that Jesus was in submission at any time before the incarnation. It can include that. It just doesn't depend on that. It's not necessary. Okay, so how does this verse, though, the, this this section, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 3, which I'm spending a little more time on, how does this fit the rest of the passage? Oh, this is key because this is like the intro. He's like, hey, you, you know, you typically do the things that I've asked you to do, but here's something really important I want to drill in. I want you to understand. And that is sort of this verse 3 in particular. This serves as the um, overarching principle for the whole teaching on head coverings. It always comes back to this. He's The head covering issue is about reinforcing male headship. That's the key. That's the focus of it. That's the, basically the traditional view. All of Paul's concerns are going to flow from this. And what follows are going to be a series of applications, like wearing head coverings, and arguments that Paul gives. His like case. Here's another reason why you should wear head coverings. Here's another reason. That's what he's going to do throughout the passage. So... It's all meant to support verse three. Let's look at verse four. And here it says, every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now I get that this is like strange to our modern ears, but for a second realize your modern ears are listening to an ancient conversation. You need to understand it from their perspective first, then you can try to apply it to yours. But let's start with theirs. Cloth coverings are clearly in view in this passage. It was it, historically, first century, this was usually part of, for the guy, part of the toga, just like extra cloth they had built into the toga, like a sideways hoodie, with, I mean, sort of like that. Which is, they would just pull this cloth over their head, right? And it wouldn't even cover their whole head. It would be like here and back, just kind of the back of the head. And this would be a head covering for, maybe it was a, a ritual thing they were doing, or maybe they just felt like doing it, or maybe they did it because rain was coming down and they could pull it over their head. And the woman had something called the pala. And then this is like the female version of the toga with also extra cloth that they could pull over their head at a moment. That's It's like a, like a shawl or something like that. So Paul wants the Corinthian women and men to do opposite things here. The women are supposed to wear head coverings and the men are not supposed to wear them. And this is specifically, in the, here's, this is key to understanding the passage, when praying or prophesying, right? When praying or prophesying, it's not in every scenario, it's when praying or prophesying. But there's something here that tons of commentaries completely ignore, um, and, and even sometimes intentionally dismiss, not just ignore, but dismiss. They go, that part doesn't count. That doesn't really, that's just a hypothetical thing. And the thing that they miss is that Paul doesn't just care about women wearing head coverings, although that's what everyone thinking is thinking about when they click this video. He cares about men not wearing them. That's actually a really big deal to him, men not wearing them, at least for the first century context. We need to remember this for later because what we'll find is that bad interpretations of 1 Corinthians 11 very often have this in common. They ignore verse 4. They ignore it and they ignore it later on when Paul reiterates the same idea that men, I don't want you wearing head coverings. That's a bad thing. When you stop ignoring these verses, it pushes the right interpretation of 1 Corinthians 11. This is my understanding, at least after many hours. Let me build the case and you decide for yourself what you think. So Paul sees head coverings. Here's a big deal too. As and this is in the traditional view. As relating to headship. And so the one who wears the head covering has a, a human over them who is head. That's kind of like the summary, right? Who is their head? Well, the woman, or the, especially the wife, has a husband who is her head. So she wears the head covering. And then the man who has Christ as his head, not some other just human, he goes uncovered. That's the idea. This isn't about head coverings in all situations. As I said, it's about praying and prophesying. Um, now, here's a side note. Apparently, women were praying and prophesying, and it was not a big deal. There are those who are going to push back and say, no, no, they shouldn't. We'll talk about that later. Um, I think actually in the next video, we're going to talk about that, 1 Corinthians 14. And they'll say women were, were never to pray or prophesy in public. Well, that, that is definitely not the case. We'll get into that in more detail. But this is really sort of against Jewish and Greco-Roman context, where women mostly just observed and were 
uh, non-participant observers of the rituals and religious things that were going on, for the most part, not entirely. But it seems that like in Corinth or in the early church, any woman could just pray or prophesy uh, and, and participate in the service with some limitations. We'll talk about that. But there was large participation, much more so than what you would find in the ancient world. So I wouldn't call that modern and counter countercultural in the sense of the modernism. I, I think that's going too far because then that just starts to anachronistically read today back into the past. We have to let it be its own thing. Let's just call it Christian. <laughs> All right. That being said, um, verse five ends with a new section, the last part of the verse. He, he gives the hypothetical, hey, if a woman is um, going to be uncovered when she's praying and prophesying, well, then guess what? She's one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now, this begins a new section. Paul's laid out his principle, but now he offers like sort of five different arguments or reasons to support his overall principle that women should, at least in the first century in, uh, in the church, should wear head coverings in order to um, protect the idea and reinforce the idea of headship male headship and women should men should not wear them to reinforce the idea of Christ's headship so that's the that's the idea here um and here's the arguments that he offers five different arguments let's look at the first one the first one starts she's one and the same as if the woman as the woman whose head was shaved for if a woman does not cover her head let her also have her hair cut off but if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved let her cover her head you see it's an argument he's like hey if this then that Here's how Paul's first argument works. And, and let me first offer an analogy for my own little argument. Let's say that your, uh, your, your 13 year olds like goes out and you say, be home by this time, seven, seven 30 or something like that. You say, be home by this time. Then they come home and it's like eight 30 and you tell them you should have been home at seven 30. And they say, well, I think I'm old enough to do what I want. And you say, okay, well, here's my argument by analogy. As long as you, as long as I'm buying and paying for your home and cooking your food and you're living off of me, then you'll be home when I say you should be home. If you want, here's Paul's analogy, if you want to be coming home whenever you want, then you should also be cut off from all of my finances and all of my protections. And do you see how he's saying one thing is like the other, so it should lead to the other. And that's what Paul is doing here. That's how his argument works. He's saying to, and I'll just leave it on your screen here for you to look at. He's saying to them, um, hey, Corinthians, you already believe that men should have short hair and women should have long hair. You already believe that. Just like your kid already believes you should pay for all his stuff and put food on his table. Right? They already believe that. So I, I, uh, I want you to take what you already believe and argue for the thing that you're neglecting, coming home on time, or in this case, putting head coverings on. So it was actually a punishment in their culture to shame a woman by shaving her, her head or cutting her hair off. Uh, not like we're saying that's something we want to bring back exactly, but uh, but it was considered, you see how they, they universally saw it as a shameful thing. So they already think that hair length is significant and it's disgraceful to have your hair cut off and you have your head shaved. And Paul's arguing, hey, you already believe that? I'm just telling you that relates to head coverings too. You see, because hair is kind of like her covering in a sense. And so I'm asking for I'm asking for an additional covering. You see how the, the analogy works. If one covering is good, then the other has a similar function. So if the Corinthians can see that a woman's hair covering her head is a good thing, which they all could, then they should see that the cloth covering can have a similar good quality. It seems odd to people today, right now, but it wouldn't have been odd to the Corinthians. Most cultures throughout time, most cultures throughout time would have probably followed the logic of this argument more than many of our modern readers. And guys, we're the weirdos. We're the foreigners to the scriptures. We need to let us, let ourselves under understand its environment better to understand it better and not try to keep hijacking it and throwing it into a uh, current thinking you know whatever is whatever is the, the the rightness and political correctness of today okay on to the second argument now here this is verses 7 through 10 paul's second argument again in support of head coverings he's trying to persuade them to use the head coverings this argument is based upon creation's order like how god made adam and eve in a way that demonstrates a truth that head coverings support you got, it's a truth, a principle that head coverings reinforce, and that's why Paul at least wants the first century Christians to be using them. We will talk again at the end of the video about applying it today or not. And of course, whether or not that even is the right interpretation, as we'll offer several other options before annihilating them. 
<laughs> at least I think that's what's going to happen. You decide for yourself what you think. Uh, you think this passage teaches and you honor the Lord the best of your ability. So the argument number two goes like this. Hey, um, the way God made Adam and Eve shows male headship and it gives another reason for head covering practices. Here it is, starting in verse uh, seven. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. And that's why the man should not have his head covered. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Then you get this mysterious phrase, because of the angels. We're going to talk about that in detail much later on. It's one of our 14 questions. It's a peripheral one. We'll deal with that. So what is this passage saying? Um, basically saying male and female roles on the traditional interpretation are very different based on how God created them. Note that there's structure to these four verses. Verse 7 and 10 provide the, the sandwich what man should not do, man do not wear a head covering, and then the application, right, what women should do, they should wear a symbol of authority on their head. Then verses 8 and 9, and the remainder of verse 7, offer the reasoning behind it, offer his support. So he's just reiterating his original point, men don't wear it, women do, at least when praying and prophesying, and then here's the support for it, and that's what we get in the remainder of the passage. So um, the reasons come uh, because man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Then it seems like expanding on that idea or explaining that idea is that man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Then there's a whole different concept about purpose, not origin, but purpose. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. That is the woman's purpose. So let's talk about these two sort of principles. Uh, the first thing is who came from who? Verse eight, who came from who? So some call this primogeniture. Um, that is the idea of being the first one born. Um, but that's not totally accurate because it's not about so much first one born. It's about who was made first because Adam and Eve are not siblings. They're not in a household in that sense. So it's related. It's There's a similar thing happening with primogeniture that people will bring up in this passage, but it's not the same thing. It's who was made first. Most importantly, Paul is giving us a Holy Spirit inspired interpretation of what Genesis 1 is talking about when it shows that Adam was made for, formed first and then Eve was formed from Adam. He's literally interpreting Genesis chapter two in particular in verses eight and nine. That's a big deal. Most, catch this and read this on your own. Egalitarians, I challenge you to read this. When you look at egalitarian scholars who interpret Genesis one, you will notice that they rarely, if ever, make reference to 1 Corinthians 11, especially verse nine. Yet this is God's own inspired interpretation of what he told us in Genesis. That's super relevant to me. And I think that we need to incorporate a holistic understanding of scripture, not just a the, the sort of biblical theology where you, where you separate all the authors as if there is no overarching Holy Spirit inspiration across the text. <clears throat> okay, that being said, the first argument is who came from who, okay? Paul's like, hey, the fact that man didn't come from woman, but woman came from man. That weighs in on the idea that there's this male headship. And in that principle, he seems to be talking about a level of authority between male and females, specifically and most applicable, ac applicably, that's a word I'm pretty sure, it's in marriage. Then in verse nine, we have a separate argument. It's who was made for who, a purpose argument. This is from Genesis 21, 18, which, or two of verse 18, excuse me, which says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Paul's deriving from this through the inspiration of the Spirit that woman was made for man's sake and that this weighs in on their roles today. That, that means that he's interpreting Genesis 2, not Genesis 3 after the fall, but Genesis 2 as though it's weighing in on male and female roles today. That's the traditional interpretation and one which we will go on to examine and look at all other views as well as we keep going. I just want to highlight I, I got to highlight this. Egalitarians, not only will they ignore this passage when referring to Genesis, um, this is just consistently, I've seen this in the scholarship, they will also ignore verse 9 when interpreting 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, this this blew me away. I, I just kept going back to the Egalitarian writings where I would have a, an author who's dealing with 1 Corinthians 11, and I would look, where do they talk about verse 9? Where do they talk about verse 9? Because it seems like a really strong indicator of purpose. If woman was made for man's sake, then this is implying his headship, that she should be following his lead to some degree, at least in marriage and in some other 
respect, we should be open to that at least, right? Um, if you want to be biblical. But they ignore it. The, over and over again, the, egal the egalitarian authors simply ignore verse 9 entirely, like they'll offer no interpretation of it whatsoever. And most of the time, this is what I've seen, not every time, we'll talk about at least one or two who offer some kind of interpretation of verse 9, and we'll test those interpretations much later when we're evaluating these views uh, in light of the debates. So, the Corinthians should therefore use cloth coverings. That's the argument. That's how Paul's logic works as he's arguing for the Corinthians. Hey, since man was made first and woman was made for man, not the other way around, it shows male headship or the greater authority role of the husband. Therefore, the Corinthians should use cloth coverings for women to, re to reflect that truth. And men should not wear them so they don't violate their headship, which involves a sense of leadership. Um, this is something I actually have to say like I'm apologizing because our culture is so, so allergic to these possibilities. But if you approach scripture with the belief that every everyone who affirms these different roles is inherently immoral in those views, then you're, you're not going to be able to let scripture lead you where it goes. What I'm going to suggest here is that the problem is not the scripture, the problem is our modern culture. But that's always been the problem. When is when is human culture at any point in history just been generally smart and right about everything? Like it just doesn't happen. You've got to filter script. Uh, you've got to filter culture through scripture, not the other way around. So here we go. What does verse seven mean? Here's a here's a big kind of tough one that people wrestle with. I think, and we'll just deal with it briefly from the traditional view. Um, does verse seven with this language does it imply that women are not in God's image? Right, for man ought not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Is this, it doesn't actually say she's not the, in the image of God. What, what is this, what is it saying here? So the first thing we'll recognize is that scripture does interpret scripture. Genesis 1 clearly affirms that men and women are both in God's image. And we see this, you, you partly might be like, well, it has the word man. Let us make man in our image. That's just, but no, no, the word there means, and throughout first, first, the first chapter of Genesis, every time the word man is used, it refers to men and women collectively. That's every time. You can see this. I already did this in my video analysis of Genesis, which is in video number two in this series. Um, so he makes man in our image according to our likeness and let them, you already see it's plural, rule over the fish of the sea so they have dominion over all things. Then in verse 27, we have this, and read the whole verse and you'll see, it's definitely men and women. God created man in his own image. Again, that word can mean men or it can mean men and women. It can be used in both ways. You have to let the context dictate it. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Same thing, this him is the way of addressing a male or the way of addressing male and female. That's how it's used in that language. Uh, we're very interested in having like very gender specific terminology. The Bible's inclusive language is masculine. That's just, that's the inclusive language uh, in lots of in lots of different languages. It's like that male and female, he created them. Okay. That's the clincher male and female. He created them. Okay. So the male and female that were created that are mankind, they're made in God's image. This is the clear teaching of Genesis one. So some would be like, well, Paul's teaching the opposite. Paul's disagreeing with that. Uh, no, Paul taught the following things that are in concert with this, that connect with this. And that is. In um, uh, in his epistles, he teaches that women along with men will be conformed to the image of Christ. Romans 8, we're being conformed into his image. All of us, male, female, we're all being conformed into the image of Christ. This is the fullness of God's image that is in our destiny, our, our future like eschatological destiny. Men and women all in the image of Christ. So Paul doesn't exclude women from that in any respect. Uh, later Gnostic teachings tried to do some weird things with that, but no, not the Bible. Um, also, he said there's no male or female in Christ. Now, this gets complicated, but I've already dealt with it. Video number seven dealt with what it meant to be no male and female in Christ and for all of us to be sons when it comes to our inheritance in Christ. We're treated as sons who get the full inheritance. Male and female both get that. So there is. So Paul's not teaching women aren't in relationship to God that we're not both in his image, but he is teaching something different. And this is, I think, key to understanding this topic, complementary and egalitarian and all this. Seeing that there's a relationship we have with God, there's a relationship we have with creation, and then there's the relationship we have with each other, and that's where the differences are. So men and women made in God's image, yes, but as it relates to men and women relating to each other, there's a difference. 
there's no uh, male and female, right? There's women along with men in the image of Christ, but men and women together constitute different roles. And those roles involve man having a different authority than women. This just seems to be the teaching of scripture. We'll push back against this for other views. I'll teach those views as if, I, as if I'm defending them. Well, sort of, because um, I think they're wrong. So I'm, I'm not just going to lie to you. But in relationship to each other, we have different roles. So it means the same thing that complementarians and patriarchalists have been saying all along. I'll leave the passage up here for you to glance at as I summarize. Um, and here it is. Okay. What we've been saying all along, the complementarians and patriarchalists, that men and women stand as God's image bearers over creation, true, but in relation to each other, we have different roles. And this seems like a transcendent principle because it's based upon our created order. So it's hard to say it's just cultural. Paul's like, this is the truth. Why? Because that's how God created us from the beginning. Like it really doesn't feel cultural at that point. Um, all right, for more on that, see video number two where I dealt with Genesis in detail. Um, why does this lead to head coverings? Because the outward covering has a symbolism that is connected to this, these role relationships between men and women. It's, it's assumed that this covering represents saying, hey, I am in that role of him being my head. And to switch those roles or subvert them somehow is considered a bad thing. The Bible actually cares about gender roles a lot. So somehow man covering his head sends a message that he's not in his headship role or that someone else is his head, some other human is his head. And the woman uncovering her head sends a message that she's in the role the man is or that she doesn't have any head covering for her. Um, is that in every culture? We'll deal with that later. Let's get to argument number three. This is in verse 10. Verse 10, argument th number three, what I'll call argument number three is just these four words, because of the angels. Um, this is really brief. It's hotly debated. We'll get into it in much more detail later on. I'll just offer one possible interpretation. Um, perhaps it's that angels who witness the creator order of man and woman in Genesis, who also desire to see God rightly worshipped because they're angels that are on God's side, they are also attending the worship gatherings of Christians. The angels are there and there's a display that the church displays God's glory. And so they want to see God rightly worshipped. So, hey, preserve the created order. Even the angels want to see that. There's other views, but what you'll find is your view on because of the angels will not generally radically impact your view of the rest of the passage. So we'll be dealing with that as a peripheral issue. So there, are, uh, the main complaints about any kind of authority are about to be dealt with in verses 11 and 12. The main complaints about any kind of authority difference between men and women are these two things. One, it devalues women, and two, it leads to abuse. These are the two main complaints that I hear. But consistently, the Bible adds information to refute and stop those views. In Ephesians 5, when wives are told to submit to their husbands, the husband is told he must love her self-sacrificially. Now, when you take the full teaching of Scripture, it doesn't devalue women, and it doesn't lead to abuse. In 1 Peter 3, when wives are told again, to submit and yield to their husbands, a husband is told to honor her as a co-heir in Christ. And, and there's a warning, first, first Peter 3, that if he doesn't do this, his prayers will be hindered before God. Like, that's a huge warning. Like, you want your prayers damaged before God? Don't treat your wife as a honorable co-heir in Christ and dwell with understanding with her. So that doesn't devalue women and, that's, and this removes the abuse. If you take the biblical view, now, if you take these sort of worldly patriarchal kind of like men are in charge men are the boss do what i say well, you do all that yes it leads to abuse and devaluing but that's not the biblical teaching so we shouldn't pretend that it is verses 11 and 12 do this however in the lord neither is woman independent of man let's remove your idea that maybe this makes her not valuable nor is man independent of woman right there's a, dep a mutual dependence in verse 11 for as the woman originates from the man, that would be in creation, so also, you know, Eve was made from Adam, the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. So we're saying here there's a mutual dependence that we have for each other, um, different roles, mutual needs. We need each other, but we have different roles. That would be the full complementarian view. I think that that gives the balance, and that's why he starts it with, however, because he wants to make sure to provide the full balance so that, that it would not lead to abuse. And that's why I like the term complementarian, because it really emphasizes that we need a balanced view 
and not just patriarchal, which the term itself seems to imply that all we're doing is observing male headship and we're not trying to provide this balance that scripture wants to give us over and over again. And that's why I prefer the term complementarian. It forces you to talk about the whole picture and not just half of it. And that's something that's important. All right, that's verses 11 and 12. So it's mutual dependence. Uh, the woman's not treated as extra, less important, less valuable. And you can think of Paul's analogy in uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, a chapter later, where he talks about different body parts and how they're all important and they have different order and different roles, but you don't devalue and you don't abuse them. And then we get to argument number four, Paul's fourth argument. And that is in verses 13 and 14 and 15. Okay, here it says, basically, um, that nature has given women long hair, and that's like a head covering too, and that shows the goodness of a cloth covering during your worship. I'll explain, but that's the basic idea. It's like, hey, nature did something similar to what I'm, I'm suggesting, so this is in keeping with something you already believe. You being the First Corinthians uh, audience. So judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray with, to God with her head uncovered? And here's what he wants them to think about. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. There'll be plenty of other views on that. Here's the traditional perspective. What does he mean by nature? Probably what philosophers meant at the time, the way things are without human intervention. So nature in the strong sense of like, hey, this is kind of how God made everything. Um, doesn't it, don't you listen to what God's revealing to you through nature? That would be the way this argument's going. And um, what is it that, that nature's teaching you? That women's hair naturally glow, grows longer. And this is biologically true. I had to do some research on this on two counts. Uh, one, we have uh, their hair fact does in fact grow longer, not necessarily faster. Men's hair, apparently our life cycle goes quicker. So our hair grows quick, but then it just you know, gets ratty and split ends and dies if you try to grow it long. It's harder, not impossible, generally harder for men to have a nice full head of hair than women. Um, but also there's male pattern baldness. This is the second issue, is that most men, as they get older, their hair, you know, you, it becomes more impossible for them to have that long hair. So it, it's more of a female thing. Naturally, long, luxurious hair is more of a woman trait. And so he's like, hey, if that's true, if God supplied women with naturally longer hair, then you can recognize that as her glory, a glorious thing, a beautiful thing about her. So to a head covering, it can be seen as like an extension of that same reality. It brings her glory and it honors her head, which just like her long hair honors her, brings her honor, it also honors her metaphorical head when she wears a head covering, brings her honor and her humility and her modesty and brings honor to her head because she's observing the headship that's there. So this might seem weird to some of us. I, I don't think it's weird. Like maybe I've just spent so much time in the passage that I don't think there's anything strange about it. Um, and maybe you should too. Um, so hair is like a covering. That's what we get, we get in verse 15, this highlighted section. Her hair is given to her for a covering. Paul's like, hey, hair, long hair, it covers her. It's like a covering. So I'm arguing for an additional covering, a cloth one. And you can see the consistency between what nature did and what I'm asking for. You can see the consistency between what creation did and what I'm asking for. That's how Paul's argument goes. Paul's concern throughout the passage isn't just head coverings. It's to preserve gender order and not ignore it or reverse it. So we, as Christians, traditional interpretation, we should be concerned about gender order, especially in our current day when so many want to destroy those very concepts of gender order, male and female roles. We should exalt them. We should consider them wonderful and not something to be ashamed of. All right, so then we get to number five, the final argument that Paul has on the traditional view. I'll move faster on the other views because you're, gonna, you're getting more and more familiar with the passage as I teach this, I, I suppose. Here we have verse 16. <clears throat> but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice nor have the churches of God. The basic summary here is, hey, you're on your own. Like if you don't want to observe this head covering rule that I'm giving you, every other church is doing it that way, showing you that you're totally on your own if you don't. Um, not, this is, I, I got to separate now because I'm aware of the Orthodox or Roman Catholic uh, audience that might be listening thinking, yes, yeah, see, this is totally a Roman Catholic thing. Um, and this is not the case. Uh, notice the difference here so we can understand Paul. It is not the kind of claims of Catholics or Orthodox teachers when they say, here's their claim, the universal church has always believed such and such and always done such and such because those claims are not historically 
true. Did you catch that? The problem with both the Orthodox, from what I can tell, right, Eastern Orthodox, uh, their claims, as well as Roman Catholics, they are largely claiming for all the church to follow their teachings and practices, which simply do not trace back to the first century. That's what makes it primarily different. I'm cool with being exactly like the first century church was universally. I just don't like other people coming in and pretending the church in the first century was like them 700 years later. And that's not, that's not the truth, historically speaking. And so that's a whole other debate. But just notice the difference there. This was literally the first century churches, literally all of them in agreement as a whole, in total agreement, and not later. They're under the direct influence of the original apostles in concert with their teachings. So this is this is a true universal church argument as opposed to the stuff we hear like uh, Vatican II, which literally makes up fake history claims about what happened in the early church, um, about like, say, all the seven sacraments were known and taught universally by the church fathers and handed on by Jesus himself. Like that's historically false, like, just absolutely historically false, but it's part of their canon. So moving on. All right. that You guys understand verse uh, 16 there. That's the fifth argument. So to summarize the traditional interpretation, uh, Paul wants to drive in a transcendent principle. And that principle is to celebrate gender differences in our roles based on male headship and God's created order of how he made man and woman. The principles are um, men, are, men are the head and then um, God made men first and made woman from man. And also he didn't make man for woman, he made woman for man, right? But then he balances this with the verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, we're mutually dependent upon each other. So there's incredible value and personhood and all that stuff. <clears throat> so he wants to see this represented in the Corinthian church in the form of head covering specifically. That's the application. So the principles are all about transcendent gender rules. And then the application for the Corinthians for sure, maybe for all of us, is head coverings when praying or prophesying at least. Um, and he supports this with five different arguments that are meant to convince the few Corinthians who are rejecting it. I do think it was just a few. I think there's hints in the passage. The Corinthians would have understood this logic, even if modern people think it's weird. You're the one who's weird to the New Testament. So just be aware of that. I'll handle the question of how to apply it at the end. Um, but it's easy to see how this applied to the Corinthians. Easy. They were to practice these head covering rules. And that's where any interpretation should start. For some of us, this is the only interpretation you've ever heard. The one I just gave you, it's the only one you've ever heard. But there are four more that I want to cover before we get into the debates. So here is the hairstyle view. Um, the hairstyle view is promoted by egalitarians like, say, Philip Payne. He's like one of the big proponents of the hairstyle view. He's written lots and lots and lots on the topic. And the hairstyle view just really changes your understanding of this entire passage. 1 Corinthians 11 is no longer encouraging women to wear head coverings and men to not wear them, it's now saying, men, I, it's all about your hair length, and women, it's not just about your hair length, it's about your hair style. So men, whenever I say I don't want you covered, what I'm really saying is, I, I don't want you to have long hair. So keep your hair trimmed short. And women, whenever it says, you know, wear a covering, what it's really saying is, do your hair up, like up in a bun or wrapped around the head or something, have your hair up in some sense, and that represents the covering that Paul is actually reinforcing. So this is a totally different view of the passage. You might be like, how does he see the passage? Well, Philippine has helped us out a lot because in his book, he gives us an actual outline. And if you guys want notes to where all these things are, I'm finding them and all the original sources. I have it all. My notes are freely available for the entire series. They're freely available. Link down below um, or on my website or email us if you're having trouble finding it through BibleThinker.org. You can send us a message and we'll help you find it. Um, at any rate, <clears throat> Philippines' general outline is to say, when verse 3, it says that man is the head of woman, it doesn't mean anything about his authority. It, it just means he's the source of woman. It, nothing in the passage on Philippines' view, nothing in the passage has anything to do with gender-related authority. There's no authority for men in this passage. So headship is purely source. When Eve was made from Adam, that's source sourcing. So headship doesn't mean what moderns think when they hear the word head. Verses four through six are largely about sexual immorality. And now you, you may have thought when we went through the traditional view, well, but sexual immorality never came up in the passage. But he's like, no, no, that's the main concern of the passage. This is a critique of hairstyles symbolizing sexual freedom in the Corinthian church. 
for men in that culture, according to this view, Philip Payne's view, um, the hairstyle view, long hair is a sign of the man trying to be like a woman and possibly could lead to homosexuality. That's an interesting thing to add there. That's an important piece, though. He needs that piece for his case. For women, hair hanging down loose, not just long hair, but hair hanging down loose as opposed to done up, that's a sign of sexual freedom. She's sexually loose. And why isn't Paul more clear about this being about sexual things? Philip Payne says, well, that's because Paul is being sensitive to crudeness. He doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want to be offensive. Um, and he doesn't want to be crude. And so he doesn't really spell it out. He kind of hints at it, but they would have picked up on it. And then in verses 7 through 10, there is, uh, what, what does Paul mean by saying that man is the glory and image of God and that woman is the glory of man? Let's talk about that. Here's Philip Payne's view, and I'll share with you some quotes from him. So Philip Payne says that uh, men wearing effeminate hair were deliberately making their hair look like a woman's hair, thus making themselves into the image or likeness of a woman. Paul reminds these men that bearing the image of God obliges them to accept themselves as the men that God made them to be. So it's all about not looking effeminate. Uh, when it comes to men being God's glory, it simply means men are not women. Uh, I mean, I don't know how else to put that. Men are men and not women. Not really clear how that makes them God's glory, what that reference is. It has nothing to do with authority here. So, Okay. What about women, though, being the glory of man? That's the next thing Philip Payne has to interpret. And he says, Paul's appeal to woman as the glory of man affirms woman as the proper sexual partner for man. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide some pushback because I can't help it um, at this point, and I should. I, otherwise, we'll lose it later when we get into other details. So she's man's glory. Right? When, when the Bible means two very different things. And it talks about man being God's glory and woman being man's glory. Woman is man's glory in that he glories in her by thinking of her as the most beautiful of God's creation and being his proper sexual partner. You can't translate that to the idea of man being God's glory. This does not make man God's proper sexual partner. That is going to be a continual problem for egalitarians. Their, their, their interpretations, we'll get into that in more detail, but I, I can't just ignore it. I don't want to mislead anybody by the way I present this. Um, so Paul's argument, he says, is Philippine here. Woman, not another man, is the pride and joy of man. She is the human splendor that catches man's eye. Again, you can't apply this the other way around. That would seem to imply that males, men, not women, are the pride and glory and joy of God. But, I mean, right, so, so you're getting an unbalanced interpretation. You're interpreting the same word in the same context in two different ways without, I don't see clear re reason for it. So we're going to push for consistent interpretations in our final analysis. So Payne has two very different meanings of glory in this passage. Um, now, woman is made for man. That phrase, uh, let me put that verse back up. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 8 and 9. I guess 7, 8, and 9. I'll leave it on your screen there. Um, <clears throat> so, woman is made for man. That only means that she's his proper sexual partner. So, according to Payne's view, don't mess that up with the cultural symbolism of what you wear. It would be natural for you to ask how that makes sense with the idea in verse 9 that man was not created for the woman's sake. right? If, if in verse 9, woman's made for man's sake means that woman is man's sexual partner, why does it say that man was not created for the woman's sake? Does that mean man is not woman's sexual partner? No, again, we have just imbalances. Interpreting two phrases, the same phrases, two totally different ways. Payne never explains that. Uh, he never addresses that argument, to my knowledge, in his, in his writings, the ones I've read anyway. So verse 10 does not refer to a woman having a symbol of authority on her head. When you get to verse 10, there's no authority on her head. Um, this is a mistranslation on Payne's view, and lots of egalitarians will agree with him on this. And you'll notice this phrase, a symbol of, is in italics. You see that? That's because the translators of the NASB added it for clarity. If you look at other interpretations or other translations, it may not be there. Maybe she just has authority on her head. Maybe it's not a symbol of. Maybe it's just authority on her head. And in that case, whose authority is it? Is it, is it the man's authority or is it her own? Well, that's the egalitarian view. In many cases, she's the one who has the authority. Let's look at Philippine's understanding of this. Um, there we go. It is responsible. It is, it is Oh, excuse me. I'll just, I'm halfway through the sentence here. So Corinthian women had a moral obligation to exercise control over their heads 
by not letting their hair down, since that symbolized sexual looseness. Sexual looseness. So the woman is supposed to exercise authority over her head. She's the one with the authority. So do you see how that removes the idea of male authority from the passage, at least from verse 10 in the passage? Um, then verses 11 and 12 are taken very, very strongly. Um, he rejects the translation independent in these verses. Independent is the wrong translation, he suggests. And he says it just doesn't go far enough. It's not just saying that women and men aren't dependent. Here's what it's saying. This verse proves, these two verses, 11 and 12, prove that there is no authority difference between men and women. So previously in verse 3 and 10, he removed the idea of uh, male, his interpretation suggests there is no idea of male authority in this passage. Because verse 3, when it says headship, it just means source. Verse 10, it's the woman with the authority, not some man. Then in verses 11 and 12, he's going to argue, not only is it not there, it's actually argued against. Verses 11 and 12. So here's his interpretation of those verses. If this is applied to 1 Corinthians 11, 11, it gives this, this translation, neither is woman of a different nature than man, nor is man of a different nature than woman in the Lord. So Philippine here doesn't translate as independent. Rather, they're of no different nature. There's no different nature. But he goes on to say something stronger. In short, although Christ overcomes the hierarchical privileges that society not God, society assigns by gender, there are still biological differences between men and women that enhance and complement their relationships to one another. So, Philippine's view here is verse 11 and 12. Paul is refuting complementarian views and patriarchal views, but he still affirms biological differences that should be reflected in outward signs like hairstyle. All we're saying is that man and women, men and women are proper sexual partners of each other, and hairstyle is meant to represent that and show that you have sexual fidelity. That's his interpretation. Um, if you, if, you know, you guys can, you guys can see your own, your own views on these things. I hope this exhaustive video will, will bring clarity to you and not more confusion. It'll start confusing, but it'll get more clear as we go. So let's look at, um, the idea of hierarchy. Um, Payne sees verses 11 and 12 as evidence that verse three Further, is when it says a uh, man is the head of woman, a man is the head of a woman, excuse me, that it's, it's just saying source. It doesn't have any authority related to it. It just means source. The word kephale just means source. We'll talk more about that later. Really dealt with it a lot. I'm just going to lean on my prior, prior work for that. So here, man is the source of woman and woman is the source of man. Right? Because if, if man's headship is based on him being a source, well, guess what? It's kind of undone because verse 12, woman is the source of man as well. That, you see how it becomes egalitarian, this passage. To further reinforce the way in which uh, this hairstyle done up, you know, view, this Philippine view, along with others, he's not the only one who holds this, he's just like a chief proponent of it. Um, to further reinforce the way that they see this passage as ref not only not teaching male authority, but actually refuting it, you have to understand the following quote. This is from Philip Payne. He says, 1 Corinthians 11, 12, C, the last part of verse 12, emphasizes that God has ordained the equality of man and woman. It is ultimately God who repudiates a hierarchy of man over woman based on source. And you can see this simply by looking at the verse itself when you interpret it the way he has. It makes sense if, if, if he's right, uh, which we're going to talk about that. So if you look at verse 3, let's back up, look at verse 3. The idea that a man is the head of a woman, if you take this as to refer to male headship, not in the typical sense of when people think of headship, but rather man is the source of woman. But then when you go to verse 10, it says that, or verse 11 and 12, it says that woman is the source of man. Man has his birth room, so they originate from each other. So then in that sense, Philippines, it's understandable his view. Hey, God acknowledges the, the males, you know, were the source of women, man was the source. But guess what? Woman's the source of man. So there's, boom, egalitarianism. It totally repudiates any idea that you may have had of the alternative perspective that this was a complementarian passage. And so you can see why a complementarian and an egalitarian will both reach for the same passage and say that it promotes their view when they have these different interpretations. We need to make sense of them. We got to figure out which one's right. So verses 13 through 15, how else does he view this? Uh, verses 13 through 15 are a big deal. 
he sees his whole interpretation, ultimately, I see his whole interpretation is hinging upon this view. Uh, Paul, in verse 13 through 15, is not making an analogy. Let me put it up in front of you. Uh, the traditional view says, hey, there's an analogy. Hey, head coverings are like long hair. You already know long hair is nice. Nature kind of tells you that for a woman, and so head coverings extend from that reality. Um, no, that's not what's happening here. Uh, this is where he says that hair length issues are the whole issue, and hairstyle is the whole issue. It's not about cloth coverings. Verse 15 in particular, this phrase, for her hair is given her as a covering, is seen as kind of like the key to the passage. Oh, every time you said covering earlier on, you meant hair done up, because hair done up is a covering. Do you see how that flips our understanding as a different perspective on the passage? Paul's saying that hair length and hairstyle are the only issues that matter. Hair can serve as a covering, so there's no need for a cloth covering at all. Paul's refuting that. Verse 15 is where it comes to a head. All right, verse 15. Let's look at what Philip Payne says about this. He says, Long hair is disgraceful to a man, but long hair is a woman's glory if she uses it as a covering. You see how he interprets verse 15? Uh, when a woman's when is a woman's hair her glory? When it's done up, respectably. So uniquely, <clears throat> her hair becomes her glory when it's done up. Not when it's long, but when it's specifically done up. That's Philip Payne's view. And that becomes the hinge on which the entire passage swings because verse 15 is now seen as that sort of revelation moment. Payne's view requires an interesting understanding of what counts as covering. It has, again, Philip Payne has these different interpretations when you apply the same word to a man versus a woman. So like he did with glory, right? So he does here. Um, for men, the word covering refers to long hair, just long hair. And so he should cut it because he doesn't want men covered. So cut your hair, don't have it long. And for women, long hair is not a covering. It's long hair done up. Now she's covered. If her Long hair is hanging down. She's uncovered, even though a man can have long hair hanging down, and now he's covered. I have to point this out because it's it's a glaring issue in the interpretation um, and shows some problems with it. Verse 16, at the end here, um, the thing that none of the churches do in verse 16, uh, nor have the churches of God, we don't have this practice, is none of them fail to have men with short hair and women with their hair up. They all They all do it that way, so the Corinthians should too. Okay, those are the, the next views we're going to cover are going to be a lot quicker. Okay, so let's talk about the refutation view. The refutation view, and I have an amazing graphic. Oh, check that out. Up until now, we've treated this passage like it's all stuff Paul is teaching. And so the debate is, what is he teaching? Because whatever it is, that's what the Corinthians were supposed to do. The refutation view is a whole different perspective on this. This view holds that much of 1 Corinthians 11, a significant chunk of the passage, is stuff Paul is refuting, not teaching. He's actually quoting the Corinthians, something they say, and then he's showing how it's wrong. Well, that flips our complete understanding and application of the passage because now it's reversed. You, you don't want to agree with a lot of what it says if you want to be truly biblical. So proponents of the refutation view will often interpret the passage much like the traditional views. They'll often be like, oh yeah, yeah, the yeah, head coverings because it preserves male headship. They'll interpret it that way. But they'll add one more factor. But that's what Paul is refuting. He's refuting head coverings. He's refuting male headship. That's the real meaning of the passage. So most of the stuff about headship is gone now. It's, it's actually refuted. God doesn't want men to be seen as the heads, even though Ephesians says that they are later on, and that's no, no one no one says that's a refutation. Um, the claims about proper hairstyle or head coverings in worship, they're gone. That was the Corinthians who were asking that. Paul's not asking that. The more egalitarian sounding stuff towards the end where verses 11 and 12, it's like, hey, you know, man originates from woman too. That stuff, that stuff's from Paul. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry to laugh, guys, but this is a super convenient and really we'll talk about it. We'll evaluate the view later. Um, so the passage is actually very egalitarian and it's refuting complementarian ideas. It's not teaching them, even though it is promoting them in a section but that section is refuted. So why would people hold this view? Um, well, I mean, every hard part of the passage disappears. Um, it's all a claim that isn't quite right. Everything everything in the passage that doesn't fit 
doesn't belong. It doesn't fit us. It's, it's, it's actually refuted. Um, that's why Paul has to refute it. Something's wrong with it. And what, what else is for this view? And this, this is important to recognize. Paul actually does this refutation thing in other places in 1 Corinthians, sort of. We'll talk about how he does it later when we evaluate the view. But 1 Corinthians 11 um, could be like those other places, where in like chapter 6, where, where they say, all things are lawful for me. Paul quotes them, and then he offers a, a response to that slogan that they had. But this, past, this view will not be seen as reasonable. You will see major, major problems with it. Um, we'll talk about that more in evaluation. Um, okay, the, the it doesn't belong view. This is even worse. I don't know. It's worse. Okay, look, I'm just being honest with you guys. Look, it's not like we can pretend these views are all equally good. If you think that that's the job of, of a teacher is to pretend that all views are equally good, then um, you're going to be misled a lot of the time because you'll fall into views that are wrong because you felt like you you had to have someone tell you they were all equally good. It, it's just, it's not wise. Here's a view that's not good. The it doesn't belong in the Bible view. Um, the, This view, which we'll talk about in detail, has that verses two through 16 of chapter 11. Paul never wrote that. Like this literally doesn't belong in your Bible. These 17 verses, or excuse me, 16 verses, simply do not belong in the scripture at all. This is what scholars call an interpolation. That's the fancy term for a little piece of scripture that's like, hey, that wasn't originally there. Somehow somebody inserted it intentionally or unintentionally, and it got printed in your eventual Bible. Now this solves all the problems. This is like super convenient because guess what? You don't have to wrestle with any of this passage if none of it belongs in the Bible in the first place. The question is, is it a reasonable view? And we'll be evaluating that today as well. Then we have the cloth covering view. And this would be um, the not just the cloth covering view, but it's it's it because that's the traditional view. But this is a egalitarian version of that. So it's it is about cloth head coverings. The Corinthians were supposed to wear cloth coverings, but that doesn't refer to submission. So Dr. Craig Keener holds this view. So you don't have to have the hair up view to be an egalitarian. Dr. Craig Keener has his view, and we'll talk about this in detail. Let me just give you an overview of this because it doesn't just dismiss the passage; it actually offers an analysis of it. And I'll try not to cover too much ground we've already covered. So let me just start by saying there's a bunch of stuff Craig Keener already agrees with that the traditional view holds. So what the covering is, right? Uh, Craig Keener says, most of our evidence points to a covering that conceded, uh, that concealed only the hair from view, that that's the covering in 1 Corinthians 11, not hairstyle. In another quote from Dr. Keener, it says, uh, Paul presents four basic arguments for why married women should wear head coverings in church worship services. The order of the home, the order of creation, the order of nature itself, and church custom. That's actually the same four arguments I've offered. I only call because of the angels an additional argument. He doesn't list that as a separate argument, though I think he treats it as a separate argument. So that's actually the same as the traditional view. Okay, he's got the same view there. It's cloth covering, and here's the arguments. Paul, his outline of Corinthians is the same. Um, and three, the passage shows that gender distinctions are good. So the Corinthians shouldn't cast off this cultural one about head coverings. You see, he he assigns it a culture value. We'll talk about that later. Side note, um, he thinks it's primarily about married women. And so to say the ESV, who translates the word woman as wife throughout the passage. And that doesn't mean it's only about married women, and he'll acknowledge that as well. It doesn't mean it only applies to them, but it, the primary focus is married women, but then most of the women were married. So it could be an inclusive way of talking about women. Yada, yada. Okay. But this is where he disagrees. Here's where Dr. Keener goes a different route and says, I don't agree with the traditional view. And <clears throat> he wants to say there is nothing in the passage that teaches that men have any sort of God-given higher authority in any way. Now, you already know some of the key passages, like the head, verse 3, kephale, verse 10, the idea of authority, uh, verse 9, how it says that women were made for man and not man for women. Like these are some of the, the passages we're look, interested in, the very idea of head coverings and what they represented. So... Here's how he views verse three, the word kephale, where it says, that's the Greek word, where it says, um, man, a man is the head of a woman. He thinks it only has, there's two options for how we interpret this verse, and he handles both of them as possible, as genuine possibilities. One, it only means the word, can you guess, source. Just like um, Philip Payne holds, just like many egalitarians hold. Kephale just means source. This, I've dealt with already in a previous video, but but that's the perspective he'll take. Okay, it only means source. It carries no connotation of the man having, or the person who's the head, having any authority or leadership in any way. Eve um, was made from Adam in verse, um, I believe it is verse, now I'm blanking on it, seven? 
no, eight, verse eight, Eve is made from Adam. And so that's how Adam is the source of Eve. And that's all head is meaning. It just means source. Um, in this case, <clears throat> if that's what you inter interpret it as, it's a transcultural rule because it's about creation. It's about how Adam and Eve were made. Source is transcultural. So man is, man is the source of woman in a broad sense. And you should honor your source, but this is not about men's, men's authority in any way. The alternate view Craig Keener entertains is that kephale does mean authority or it, it refers to authority. Not that you translate the word with the word authority, but it, it, you translate it as head, but that it implies authority. He goes, hey, if that's the case, if it means authority, then it's only cultural authority. And we'll test this claim later on, but you can see how he deals with verse, th verse three. Male authority, if it appears anywhere in the passage in verse three, it's purely cultural. And so it's not something Paul's teaching, it's something Paul's dealing with. And there's times where the Bible does this, where it doesn't teach some unpleasant state of affairs, it just deals with those state of affairs. We'll deal with that later. Um, number two, second way he disagrees with the traditional interpretation is one of the main reasons for women needing a head covering in verses seven through nine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the passage. Well, I'll explain it and then I'll read it, is not distracting people during worship. Let's read the passage, understand his view. This is talking about one of the major issues here. It's talking about not distracting people during worship. Women in particular, wear a covering so you won't be a distraction to others, at least for the first century. For man ought not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, nor but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. This is one of the major concerns here is distractions in worship. According to his view, let me share with you a quote from Dr. Keener about this. He says, in short, Paul says, because woman was taken from man, she reflects man's image, and therefore she ought to cover that image in worship, lest it distract observers from attention to God's image. So by making it about distractions, we can set aside any implications about submission. Right? We, we've, we've, we have to answer why Paul is applying this, right? So it's about distractions. There's questions about, does that mean men should be uncovered so people can look at men as they're worshiping and pay attention to them as watching male faces enhances our worship of God? That would be the natural understanding, the balancing that out, but I don't, he doesn't teach that. I, I don't I don't believe it. Um, but such is the reality of how, how it be. All right, the fourth way in which he differs from the traditional view is when verse nine says that man wasn't made for woman, but woman was made for man, that's not really what it's saying. Like that's that's a misunderstanding of the passage. Let's look at verse nine. This is a misunderstanding. So complementarians take this verse about the purpose and they take it to imply that the husband has a higher role of authority in relation to the wife um, or man to, to woman based on what Genesis is saying about one of the purposes of woman versus man's creation. Okay, that's how the traditional view tends to go. Dr. Keener doesn't comment on this in detail, in any detail, but he provides his own translation of the passage. So he gives his own sort of translation slash paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 11. And that's the only place I can find him doing this. And instead of it being for the man's sake in this passage, instead of that phrase, it, it's the phrase through man. For indeed, man was not created through woman, but woman through man. Now I found that egalitarians in general, as I mentioned, and I will mention again, they do not interpret or explain verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 11. The only place where Dr. Keener does is in his, um, really in his translation of 1 Corinthians 11, his own translation, where he translates it as through instead of for. Keener doesn't comment on it in detail, just gives his translation. Um, it just reiterates verse eight then. So verse nine, which would imply male authority, it just here is a, it's saying the same thing as verse eight. Man doesn't originate from woman, for indeed man was not created through woman, but woman through man. So you see how verse nine just kind of is, is absorbed into like reiteration of verse eight. It's not offering a new idea or a principle of support of four, seven, do verse seven because of this and because of this, and rather it's just one idea. And then the fifth way in which Craig Keener's interpretation differs from the traditional view is that verse 10, uh, you could have guessed this, is about the woman's authority, not someone else's authority over her. So the person holding the authority is the woman, and so there's no 
no uh, complementarian kind of teaching that's going on there. Let me share with you what Dr. Keener says about this. <clears throat> He's pretty strong about it. He says, some translators, translations and commentators interpret the text as if it spoke of the woman's being under someone's authority or as if the head covering merely symbolized her dignity. But these are not natural ways to read the Greek text here. And he goes on. The only normal way to read the Greek phrase is to read it that the woman has authority over her own head. That's the only natural way. We'll talk about this in detail later on. But this is a big sticking point um, because you don't now on the on the complementarian view, you don't need verse 10 to prove your view, but it helps. Like it would be more proof. But on the egalitarian view, you need it to not be complementarian. So that's important. Um, so there's three options, according to Dr. Keener. One, she has authority here in verse 10 to uh, choose what she wears. And so she she gets to choose her clothing, and therefore she should choose wisely. Uh, number two, she has authority to pray or prophesy in public. That could be the authority that verse 10 is talking about. She ought to have authority to pray and prophesy in public. Or three, she has authority over the angels. Now, Keener thinks it's probably the first one, her authority to choose whether or not to wear a head covering. And so here's his understanding of it. So, um, just a second, make sure I'm in the right spot. Um, while Paul acknowledges that these, these women's authority over their own heads, he calls on them to submit to the head coverings so as not to cause offense. Right, so she gets, no one can force her. She's not supposed to, she gets to choose what she wants and she's supposed to do this. Like he's asking them to make a wise choice, a good choice. Paul does not require head coverings, but only except for cultural reasons while qualifying in verse 10 that the authority of choosing whether to wear one or not ultimately rests with the woman. Uh, the main issue here then is <clears throat> for verse 10, the authority belongs to the woman. It's not some authority she's under. Okay, that's the main egalitarian view here that, Keener and others will represent. So you see some of the spectrum. Okay, that, that, those are the interpretations. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's tons of other debates we're going to get into today, which is why it's going to be a long video, which is why I'm, I don't know. I don't even know who's going to watch it. But, for, but here's the idea. For those who watch it, it's because you needed this. And it should give you clarity. As much as I may have just muddied all the waters, the rest of the video is going to make it clear. As much as I may have caused confusion, that confusion, I've just shown you the confusion that exists on the passage. The rest of this video is going to be dedicated to clearing it up. And that's where we go now. How do we make sense of all this? How do we make sense of all this? Um, and, and what do we do about the whole woman's hair functioning as a testicle thing? We'll talk about that as well, right? And what is because of the angels? Mean? We'll talk about all that. Let me give you an overview of what we're going to do now. This can seem super confusing because it just is. And that is, you know, whether I want it to be or not, that's just how it is. But I've tried to organize the rest of today's teaching in particular in a way that will be understandable to people and avoid some of the confusion. Most of the debates of all the stuff we've just read can be summarized by just 14 questions that we can ask of 1 Corinthians 11. And we need to answer these questions. That's why I got this counter back here. I'm going to do 1 through 14 here. We're going to go through these questions one at a time. But um, uh, we want to separate the central questions versus the peripheral ones. So let me just show you what I mean by that. Here's the questions. Here's the rest of today's video. Central questions versus peripheral ones. Okay, you you can just look at them on your screen there. If you're if you can see such small writing on whatever screen you happen to be watching on, you know the first question is does it belong in the Bible? We'll talk about whether he's refuting rather than teaching most of what's in the passage. What does kephale mean in verse three? Then we have. Uh, all these other questions. You can see there's central questions, peripheral questions, and finally we have what I'm going to call the annoying question. I'll explain why I personally do find annoying, just being real with you. Is this whole thing based on the ancient medical idea that women's hair function is a testicle? Yeah, I just spend crazy numbers of hours just to answer this question that nobody should be asking. Um, but we'll get into that. And finally, we'll talk about how it applies today. And I will give a serious and sincere and hopefully thoughtful, thorough treatment of how it applies today. Um even though that is probably one of the areas where I feel less confident, but I will share with you things to think about. Okay, for those who are interested purely in the women in ministry topic and you don't care about head coverings, you really only need to answer questions one, two, three, and seven. Okay, that's it. You could skip to those and move on and that's all you need. Um, the one and two are gonna be quick and easy to answer, relatively quick and easy to answer as well. So it's going to be not that crazy of a video for you. But if you want all the answers, of course, they're all going to be there for you. So let's dig into those issues 
Here we go. Starting with number one, this is going to be, does this passage belong in the Bible? Okay. This is a fairly new view. It, it, it like kind of started taking off in the seventies a little bit. 1970s here. In 1975, there was a scholar named uh, W.O. Walker Jr., right? He argued for uh, the idea of removing this section of scripture from the Bible. We got to cover this question first because literally nothing else matters if this doesn't belong in the Bible. It's all just curiosities and nothing applicable for a Christian. He claimed that the section was originally three different fragments from three different sources and it was smashed together and added to 1 Corinthians at a later date. Now, that's a pretty elaborate explanation for 1 Corinthians. No, he doesn't have good evidence. Jerome Murphy O'Connor offered a response to him. I have a link to that in my notes. You're welcome to check out. You can get my notes in the description down below. Um, Lamar Cope, another scholar, argued for its removal in 1978. Then in 1980, yet another scholar, G.W. Trump, argued for its removal. Now, this is interesting. I think this is very relevant. Um, while you cannot just guess at people's motives, and I don't like to do that, when people tell you their motives, you should take that at face value. Okay, so G.W. Trump, he wanted to deal with what he perceived as a major problem. He thought that the passage looked sexist to a lot of people, and he thought the Bible was egalitarian, and he wanted to present that as, as the case. He thought if it's complementary and it's sexist, and I don't like that, I don't agree with that. So he says, and I quote, Trump said, there are surely so-called sexist statements, right, in 1 Corinthians, in verse 11, chapter 11, implying women are subordinate and exist primarily for the sake of males. Okay, I, I do not agree with that. Like, pr they exist primarily for the sake of, where does it say that? Mm, no, that would be a weird extrapolation uh, beyond what is said there. But he he didn't, um, he didn't actually believe the passage didn't belong in the Bible. This is the weird thing about Trump's article. He doesn't think you should remove 1 Corinthians 11. He wants to argue his best case for it anyways. He was undecided, he said, but he put forward his best case against the passage to stop people from saying that Paul was sexist, his own explanation of his own agenda. So he tried to champion a view that the passage didn't belong. Uh, this is really what gets at the heart of the, of the why this passage doesn't belong in the Bible view is it's a problem passage. And I'm not even close to the only one saying that. We want to just get rid of the problem. What evidence, though, could someone offer? And let's get into the details. What evidence could anybody offer for removing this passage of Scripture from Scripture? I mean, if, if, or really saying it doesn't belong. It was never really part of Scripture. It was a mistake. <clears throat> one, reason number one, and the only reason they offer, really, it's not consistent with the way Paul thinks elsewhere. This is a very fishy way of reasoning to remove a text of scripture. Like imagine if you took like, say the Lord of the Rings and you read a section of, on, on Tom Bombadil, right? Those who've actually read the books and you read Tom Bombadil section and you go, this is not consistent with the things that, you know, Tolkien writes elsewhere in Lord of the Rings. And you're right. It's a weird, weird section, but he wrote it. Like you, you can't just say, this doesn't seem consistent to me. You need to have more specific details. You need to have like real arguments for this. I went over this when I went over Mark 16, does the last verses of Mark belong in the New Testament or not? Um, and we talked about like how you can argue that something's inconsistent when you talk about like syntax and stuff like that. And this is not a good way of arguing. Um, Craig Keener summarizes well, he says, this is a thesis that is quote, more than a little questionable. <laughs> you need more data than just saying, it doesn't feel like Paul to me. Uh, just, yeah, seems consistent to me. Now, if you're an egalitarian, if you think that all the rest of the, of the scriptures promote egalitarian views and you look at 1 Corinthians 11 and you can't find a way to reconcile it and you go, this looks pretty complementary and patriarchal to me, then you might say because of your egalitarian position, it doesn't seem consistent. And that seems to be one of the things that was driving people. But when I've studied Paul, look at the rest of the videos in the series, the Genesis all the way through the New Testament, it seems very consistent, complementarian all the way through. So normally... If you wanted to be a normal, responsible scholar and you wanted to argue that a passage did not belong in the Bible, you do not argue, it doesn't really feel like the vibes. I don't get Paul vibes. Like, this is not how you argue. What you do is you go to ancient manuscript evidence and you look at old, old, old copies of 1 Corinthians and you say, huh, it's not in some of these copies. How do we explain that? Maybe it wasn't originally there. That's what you need to do. That is not the case here. Um, Craig Keener does not pull any punches, and here I'll put a quote from him up on your screen. 
He says the textual basis, right, manuscripts, for removing this passage is impossibly weak. That is not an exaggeration. It is literally impossible to build a case based on the text. Let me give you guys some details. Here's some stats for nerds. Um, Craig Keener adds in a footnote. Neither ne the Nestle Alon nor the UBS text notes any texts omitting it. I'll ex let me explain some of these as I go through for those who haven't, you know, I'm not, I don't expect you to know all this stuff, okay? For those who know it, good, good for you. Those who don't, the Nestle Alon and the UBS are like ancient, are, are just resources where they, they give you a shortcut and they basically look at all the ancient manuscripts and they mark any differences or any variants. And then they kind of like make a source book so you can quickly go, hey, are there any you know, manuscripts that don't have this passage or that have it differently. And so you open these texts and none of them note that there's any ancient text omitting 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16. It's in every text. Bruce Metzger, second point here, uh, he has a textual commentary. He's considered one of the most well-respected textual commentators in history. And he has no discussion of the problem. <laughs> like it never comes up because it's not a problem. And that that's exactly what Keener says here. It is not indeed a textual problem, but a question of removing a difficult passage. You can read more of this quote here. This is some stuff that Craig Keener gives you for details here. Good, good resource on that. Thank you, Dr. Keener. Um, there is simply no reason to remove 1 Corinthians 11 from the passage. Imagine the insanity. Imagine the utter folly of removing from Scripture sections of text that are found in every single copy of available. What is safe anymore? This is um, bad. This is uber bad. Now, sometimes I've heard egalitarians toss this out, not as a view they hold, but the way that GM Trump did in 1980, they throw it out in an interview and egalitarians being interviewed on 1 Corinthians 11 and they go, well, you know, it's also possible that this passage wasn't original to Paul. We don't know. I'm not saying it wasn't, but it might be the case. And they throw it out there as an irresponsible swipe at a passage of scripture that is difficult for their position. That is something that needs to stop for those of you if egalitarians, your scholars or, or, or teachers who've been interviewed and you throw that out there like a yeah, maybe kind of possibility, you're, um, you're, you're making a big mistake. So it's horribly lacking in evidence. And, it would, and that principle to, to do, remove scripture that easily would undermine so much of the Bible that we wouldn't have no confidence about it. All right, let's go to question number two, since it does belong in the Bible. Is Paul actually refuting rather than teaching most of what we read in this passage? This is pretty key to understand. Um, this is actually something Paul does, as I mentioned. I'm going to give you some examples. Here are some examples in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul quotes and then responds to stuff that Corinthians are saying, not stuff that he is exactly saying, sort of. We'll get into the details. Here we go on your screen. Okay, in yellow, then this is a well-accepted example. This is not controversial. Super, like, just about everybody agrees. The stuff in the yellow is stuff that Corinthians have said, and Paul is the green. So he says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 13, all things are lawful for me, say the Corinthians, and Paul has a rejoinder, but not all things are profitable. Yeah, you're not under the law, but it doesn't mean you can do things that are going to bring you harm or not help you, not help others. They say, the Corinthians, all things are lawful for me. But Paul has some nuance, he adds. But I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, right? That could lead to gluttony. So Paul, he brings in more information. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Now that's how they see 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 as like Paul's quoting and then responding to something the Corinthians are saying. That's an interesting view. This is the refutation view. There aren't that many scholars who support it. Um, there's actually very few. It wasn't as easy that easy to find them. Um, here's two in particular. Kath Catherine Bushnell, who was one of the first to promote this view like in 1910, right? In a very little read um, document, right? But more currently, there's a guy named Alan Paget. Alan Paget promotes this view, and we'll come back to this because, well, it becomes rel more relevant later, but I'll save you the complexity for now. So this is how he and Catherine Bushnell view the passage. Take a look at this. It says, um, oh, no, take a look at this as I give you, wait. Oh, there it is. Now it's on your screen. 
Okay, you may have seen it, but for me, something was glitching there. All right, so 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. I'm not going to read the whole passage to you, but you can see a very significant section is now yellow. This is stuff that Paul is refuting. All the stuff about verse 3, where it says every man, uh, Christ, excuse me, I'll just skip to the relevant stuff here. Uh, man is the head of a woman, that's gone. Um, the instructions about head coverings, that's gone. Where it comes in and becomes Paul is halfway through verse 7, where it says, but the woman is the glory of man. Right? So Paul doesn't affirm that man is the, the image of glory of God, he, but he does affirm that woman is the glory of man in this passage, and that you know, everything else you see. How does this make sense of the passage? Um, well, it removes a lot of the questionable stuff. Um, you, in verse 10, you affirm that it was the woman who had authority and then all the other stuff like, you know, headship and stuff like that. Like that's all stuff Paul's refuting instead of affirming. I'll leave this on your screen for you to kind of consider as I'm talking through seven problems with this view. <clears throat> Okay, here's problems with this view. I'm trying to summarize this data as much as I can, right? One is this. To have such a long quote from the Corinthians is nothing like the other times Paul quotes the Corinthians. It doesn't match the pattern when Paul does quote other people. When he does, it's always these pithy phrases like, all things are lawful for me. Food's for the stomach and the stomach's for food. Like, these are the pithy phrases Paul quotes. So this does not match at all what Paul says elsewhere. This seems like a powerful problem because you have a huge section um, where Paul quotes them. And yeah, uh, the second issue, add all these problems up together and it just defeats the view, I believe completely. But the quote isn't just different from other quotes in that it's longer. It's different in another way. It's substantively different. So this, the quotes we have earlier where Paul quotes the Corinthians are things like, all things are lawful for me, right? But this includes deep theological teaching. It's not just about uh, their behaviors. They're using a principle to talk about how they have freedom of behavior and they're having too much liberty and license and worldliness. There's nothing like that. This is deep theological teaching without just fo focusing on application. This is very different, right? Verse three says, I want you to understand. <laughs> Corinthians telling Paul, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and that man is the head of a woman and that God is the head of Christ. Like This is nothing like the substance of what we get in the other Pauline quotes. The third problem is that Paul doesn't respond to everything he quotes. If you read this passage, and I'm leaving it on the screen here for a long time, just you know, for those who would, notice how many things in verses three through seven Paul never reacts to. Everywhere else where Paul quotes the Corinthians, the handful of times, he always responds to the quote, directly responds to every element of the quote. Here, there's no response to the majority of what is said. So why include quotes from them with a bunch of data he's not responding to? Why wouldn't he just quote the relevant portion and then respond to that? It doesn't really make sense. Number four, fourth problem, there's no clear indication that this is a quote, not even a subtle one. Not even a subtle one. There's a, like What in the passage cues you in on knowing this is a quote? It was the pithiness of the statements before that told you it was a quote. It was his response of, Here's the truth, but here's this other truth you have to balance it with. Uh, there's nothing here that you're getting. There's there's the word but halfway through verse 7, literally halfway through a sentence. Now we're randomly switching, but it, it just seems weak. Number five, fifth problem is why start a quote from them with, but I, singular, want you, plural, to understand. Verse three, literally, it's, I'm sorry, I, you guys look. It's okay to react to bad ideas as if they're bad ideas. And I'm just saying, this is not a good idea. Supposedly, the Corinthian quote starts with, I want you, plural. But look at verse two of 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, I, singular, praise you, plural, because you remember me and everything and hold to the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Then it switches to the Corinthians saying, but I, singular, want you, plural, Paul, to understand. That makes no sense. It just makes no sense. Number six, the sixth problem is, it's odd to think that Paul stops a quote from them midway through verse seven. But woman is the glory of man is part of the logic that is defending the earlier statements. It's not just a random thing that responds. It's, it's not a negation of something that was said earlier. It's a defense of something that was said earlier. It's not a rebuttal. It's not a qualification. Like we have in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, for instance. It's a justification for the idea that a woman and a man have different roles. 
So verse 7 is not a suitable place. It's a bad place to start the, the quote from the Corinthians. It's a bad place to end the quote from the Corinthians. Um, sixth problem. It's very odd to think that Paul stops a quote from them. Oh, I already read that one. Uh, seventh problem. Uh, seventh problem. Verse 8 and 9 read as another continuation of the same argument, not a correction or qualifier. Let me read them to you. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Right. This four in verse eight is a just a continuation of the same argument. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, verse 10, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head or have authority on her head. However, you're going to read that. Verses eight and nine are, again, the, so what we're saying here is the Pauline section, the supposedly Pauline section, is not actually a rebuttal of anything you've read earlier. That's a significant issue. It continues the same logic. There's other problems with this view, but it seems so horribly weak on the face of it that I will not continue listing them. Just remember that the, um, the argument fails, and it fails in a number of ways. It's not a refutation. Both the interpolation argument and the refutation argument those who say the passage doesn't belong or those who say Paul's refuting a lot of it. It's, um, it just demonstrates that this is a passage a lot of people want to avoid. I think it does. Because when there's no evidence for it, you then have to ask, what are you doing with your interpretation? And what, say, Alan Paget does, his interpretation, his, that he sees it as a refutation, that's necessary for him concluding that egalitarianism is true on his, on his view. And so you see, well, what are you doing with this thing that has no evidence? Oh, I'm 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 supporting my egalitarian views with that thing that has no evidence. Like this just shows that this is a problem passage um, for that view. So, um, yeah, it also interprets. I'll just add this for for FYI. Okay, it also interprets verse sixteen in a unique way. Um, he interprets we have no other practice in kind of a reversed fashion. Um, it's key for the refutation argument to interpret verse 16 this way. If they're right, it means they have no practice of cloth head coverings. So he's, he's actually saying the opposite of what just about everybody else thinks it means. Verse 16 is like saying, hey, the church is all doing exactly the thing the passage is telling you to do. Here it's the opposite. It's, it's that everything you guys are saying, the whole church rejects that. When nobody does that. Nobody does that. So it doesn't seem reasonable, but we'll move on to number three. Question number three, what does head, the word kephale in the Greek, what does that mean in this passage? Now, this I'm going to be quick here because this was such an involved debate that I had to devote an entire separate video to it. I'm not going to rehash that whole debate. I'm not going to try and duplicate my own content. There's no need. Go to video number eight on the video on is male headship biblical. The playlist is below. You can find the video real easy. Let me just share with you the conclusions from that video, which I tried to establish very thoroughly throughout the content of the video. Um, Headship implies authority. That's the major conclusion. Headship does imply authority. Kephale, when you say that someone is the head and you're using that as a, as a metaphor, it does imply authority. Um, the common medical thought of the time seems to support that, their understanding of what a head did. Um, against egalitarian claims, we went deep into that on detail. Uh, Paul's multiple metaphorical uses of kephale in relationship to both Jesus and husbands supports this. He uses the word, talk about Jesus being head, husbands being head in the same breath. And it's clearly it's clear that Jesus is head with authority in that in those contexts. I dealt with that in detail. Um, so the husband is too. Uh, church history totally supports this. This is the consistent view of church history throughout time. Even Greek speakers who knew Greek, they thought that this implied authority. Lexical study of the New Testament usage of the term supports this. When you look at ancient lexicons and the way the word is used, it also supports that against egalitarian claims. That was some of the worst stuff. Uh, we went over that in the in the headship video number eight down below. And uh, common egalitarian claims about the term are seriously problematic. So the word headship means or does imply authority. You don't translate it as authority. You translate it as head. But it implies authority. It carries with it a connotation that is very important. That's a huge deal. If a man is in a certain authority role in relation to his wife, not domineering, not abusive, not um, treating her like a child, nothing like that. But there's a sense in which he's the head of the home, the head of the household, the head of the marriage. If that's the case, then this is this whole passage, 1 Corinthians 11, is going on to support this, this position, this singular truth about male and female relationships. If verse 3 implies headship and authority for men, then 
I think that that's, I think it's a game changer for the entire understanding of the passage that this becomes key. So a gal, a, here's egalitarian responses to this possibility. Um, Craig Keener says, and, and we'll get into this now, um, since I already dealt with Kefale previously, let's deal with responses to that information. Craig Keener says, if it does mean authority, if, if head implies authority, then it's purely cultural. And so it's, it's not transcendent. It's just cultural. Now, if that's the case, then yeah, 1 Corinthians 11 is not, does not provide, provide any information that supports modern complementarian views. Um, but this is one of my continual issues with egalitarian interpretations, is that they assign things to culture without good evidence. Let's look at Dr. Keener's reasoning here, and we'll try to evaluate that. Again, beloved brother in Christ, I would happily go and uh, hang out with him and have lunch and just listen to him tell me all of his stuff he's memorized about everything in ancient culture. It's very impressive, actually. But I think he's wrong here, and it's fair to talk about that. Okay, so here Dr. Keener says, if Paul is using head here in the sense of authority, he could simply mean that the husband was the one in the position of authority over the wife in that culture without demonstrating that all husbands are to rule over their wives in all cultures. I'm going to leave this quote up on the screen here because I want to first, before I respond to his claim, I want to deal with his rhetoric. Um, the rhetoric is important. So let's briefly recognize it. The term rule over their wives, I think, is a hugely loaded and weighty term. And this happens all the time with egalitarians. They will find the most, not always, okay, but it happens a lot. They will find the most pejorative way of characterizing a complementarian claim so that it seal, feels inherently abusive and inherently immoral because that is one of the biggest drivers of egalitarian views in my, in my studied opinion on this topic is the belief that it's inherently evil and therefore it must be wrong. <clears throat> so reinforcing that with rhetoric here and there is, a, is an important element of their view. Um, so we don't use that term, rule over their wives. Like, do I teach men should rule over their wives? I don't, I mean, I'm just saying as far as English, modern English is concerned, I don't use that term rule over for anybody, right? Do I go to like the boss of, of, an, of a business and be like, you rule over your employees, right? You rule over them. You rule over them, right? I do I go to the employees? Like your boss, right? He's your boss, right? Yeah. So he can tell you what to do. Well, yeah. Does he rule over you? They would probably be like, well, no, because because in modern English, the phrase rule over you implies some kind of abusive overuse of authority. That's what I'm suggesting here is that we shouldn't load our language with dialogue that's full of rhetoric. So it implies abuse. Um, I prefer the term that the husband has a higher degree of authority in relation to his wife. I think that's more accurate. I think it's just simple and accurate. I don't. I think it's offensive to people. That's fine. I think they're offended by reality um, in this case, and I'm trying to convince them to come back to reality. Um, but it doesn't mean she has no authority. It doesn't mean she has to follow everything he says without exception. It doesn't mean he can abuse her or domineer her in some way. Um, none of that. So there's the rhetoric. Now, let's talk about the substance of the argument here. Um, if kephalae means authority, then it was just in that culture. Well, he just says it could simply mean, could meaning it's possible, but was any evidence given that it was only in that culture? No. And you could read Dr. Keener's own work yourself and he will give you zero evidence that it was only in that culture, at least to, to my reading. Okay. I didn't see any. I looked for it. I like to deal with it, but I didn't see any. Um, how about evidence against it? Can we offer evidence that this is not purely a cultural thing? Um, and some of you are going to assume, even as you're watching, well, this is Mike's doing this because he wants to do this. That's fine. I actually wanted to be egalitarian. I was being honest when I said that. Um, but I want even more to just follow scripture where it leads. And I sincerely believe that this is the case. So what about evidence against the idea that this is merely cultural? Well, look at the verse. 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. I want you to understand. Okay, this is something he wants them to understand. It's a very important principle for them. That Christ is the head of every man. Is that is that cultural? Christ is the head of every man? No, obviously not. It's not cultural. If you pretend it's cultural, you're just stretching reality for your own sake. Christ is the, he's the king of kings and lord of lords and, and every knee will bow. And man, the man is the head of a woman. They'll say, well, that's cultural. And God is the head of Christ. Is that cultural? Is God the head of Christ in some remote culture? First Corinthians 15 goes on to say that that's always going to be the case. So moving forward in the future, that the son will submit to the father. So yeah, that's not cultural. So here we have three statements 
about headship, all about headship. Two of them are clearly transcultural for sure. And the third seems to be as well. Like it, you would just naturally take it that way unless you had some re reason not to. Further, Paul connects all this to God's created order in verses 8 and 9. God's created order and purpose. Two different issues, order and purpose for man and woman. The underlying principle seems transcultural. Man does not originate from woman, speaking in, of Genesis. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. This is a reason to support his overall principles. Um, yeah, and that's transcultural. So the passage itself, 1 Corinthians 11, gives us transcultural vibes, okay? <laughs> to use a really sloppy term. Um, <clears throat> further, um, my own study of Genesis 1 through 3, where I went through in video number two in the series, it seems to affirm the same thing, transcultural principle of male headship. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, let's just look at that again, because these are all related and they all are all in harmony. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. But that's just cultural, right? As Christ also is the head of the church. Well, that doesn't seem cultural. He himself being savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Then the husbands are to, and you, well, that's cultural. But is the, does anybody think husbands loving your wives self-sacrificially is cultural? Nobody thinks that. We just selectively pull out the pieces that we want to call cultural without any evidence. So um, <clears throat> the real issue here is assigning things to culture without good evidence. And here's what I think is happening. My honest opinion here for you to consider. I think what happens is we get in a situation where what we're really recognizing is it's not my culture. So is it biblical teaching or is it just the culture the Bible's in? And if it's not my culture, but I have no reason to say that it's culturally bound in the Bible, I end up reading my culture against the scriptures. So what I'm really saying is, it's not my culture, so it must be cultural. What's egalitarians, I would want to ask you, what prevents you from making that mistake of saying, well, if it's not my culture, then it must just be cultural in the Bible, unless you have specific reasons in the text. I mean, this statement, this phrase, this context proves it's cultural. Not just the assumption that if it's not your culture, then it must be the Bible's culture. That, that, that seems to be an open door to all kinds of places where you may go where Jesus never wanted you to be. Reading all sorts of things when it comes to gender relations, sexual immorality, um, homosexuality, um, transgender things, all these things where you can just go further and further away from the road where God called you to be because our culture is changing, so your view of the Bible changes with it. Danger, Will Robinson. Hmm. Okay, one pushback I did not deal with in that video on Kefale, and then we're going to move on to the next one, question number four is um, this idea we've covered, we've already brought up. It's that verse eight of 1 Corinthians 11 um, proves that kephale only means source, right? Because verse eight does talk about source language. Man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. And there are even complementarians who will hold that view, who will be like, hey, that's source language, okay? And I, I would agree this is talking about like a source type language. Um, but there's two problems with this. And these are two independent problems. They both need to be resolved if you want to challenge this kephale interpretation. Number one, even if kephale means source, which I doubt it does, then it still seems to carry the connotation of authority. I'm not remotely the only person to point this out. I dealt with this in detail in the video on headship. Uh, this is something I have not seen any egalitarian properly address in, to any significant way. Even if it means source, it still implies headship in the sense of authority. Um, that's a significant issue. That's a significant issue. But I do not think verse 3 means source. I don't think kephale generally means source. I don't think it means source in the Bible. So the second problem is this. Verses 11 and 12, if you interpret verse 8 as showing, well, man is merely the source of woman, then verse 11 and 12 prove too much. This is how, this is how uh, Philip Payne takes them. Because so as the, as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. So then now, men and women are equally each other's source. This proves too much because Paul is now teaching that the woman is the man's kephale. And if you, in scripture, he, he doesn't do this. Ephesians 5, he's like, man is the kephale, woman is not. She's the body in the head-body relationship. Here also, verse 3 says, he's the kephale in a way she's not. If, verse, if kephale only means source, then verse 12 proves too much, and it undoes verse 3, creating a contradiction. 
I, I hope that that makes sense. Slow down, play it back. Listen to that one more time and think about it. See if you can catch my point. Verse 11 and 12 show that um, man is dependent on woman, not that man and women are in the same headship relationship. This is nuance. It's not refutation. Paul's not refuting what he said in verse three. There's no refutation in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul is nuancing it so that you don't turn it into an abusive relationship and you see the dependence we have on each other. It proves too much because it makes Paul contradict himself in Ephesians 5, where he's like, women should submit because man, man is the head. But in 1 Corinthians 11, they take that to, to mean ultimately that woman is the head as well. So we have no body. We just have two heads, which describes a lot of marriages and a lot of um, the, the uh, gender stuff that's going on in our world today. The Kephale question, essentially, question number three here, is answered in a way that fundamentally ruins for the entire passage an egalitarian view. It's not the only question that'll go that direction, but if you take Kephale, if you follow my research and you follow my reasoning, you cannot be egalitarian. Even if we don't understand other elements in 1 Corinthians 11, even if you go, I don't know what because of the angels means, I don't know what the head covering things are all about, you should understand this seems pretty clear and it's very much not egalitarian in this case. And that has been the case uh, throughout all these studies very consistently. Let's go to question number four. The fourth question is, fourth question is, I have it here. Boom. And we are going to get into a lot of detail. In fact, I need to take a little break, breathe, step up, stretch, and then I'll come right back and teach you what were the ongoing cultural customs of men or women wearing head coverings at the time. This was honestly the most difficult part of this whole study. Uh, this topic of what was going on at the time, like were women wearing head coverings in what context did they wear them? And my answers here are not all confident. I, I wish they could be more confident. I worked really hard to try to get more confident, but I'm, I'm not. Um, but I do have a basic view that I think I think is correct. I wouldn't lean too hard on it in all its aspects, but I would lean very hard on it when it relates to head coverings in the context of prayer and prophecy, which is what most relates to 1 Corinthians 11. So let me start uh, this complicated stuff by just saying what scholars tend to agree on. Okay, here's some things scholars tend to agree on on the topic of ancient head covering practices at the time relevant to 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, number one, uh, women east of Corinth East of Corinth, they that's where most of the Christian churches were at the time. They typically did wear head coverings in public in those communities. Um, Roman men, number two, Roman men and women, and this is super important, in pagan worship did cover their heads when praying or prophesying or sacrificing. Any of those three activities, prayer, prophecy, sacrifice, they would be covering their heads. This is new information for those who are reading older commentaries. You won't even see anything about this. Um, it was relatively new, although it's solid information. It's not like invented. It's thanks to one scholar named Richard Oster. It was really pushed forward and um, now is widely accepted. So the uh, third thing that we should talk about is this was not like a hijab or a burqa. They scholars generally agree, right? For men, widespread covering use for men would just be like I mentioned earlier, a toga with extra cloth that they would just kind of pull over the head in a moment for various reasons. Or for the woman, it's a pala. Um, they would pull over their head for a reason. This is, this is what we're talking about. We're, we're not talking about a full face covering. We're not talking about a hijab or a burqa. We're not talking about those types of things as it relates to first century, um, common widespread culture issues. So let's separate the debates. Here are the debates we're going to be dealing with now as it's about to get very, very detailed. Okay. The first debate we're going to talk about is the Greek word used for covering. So I'm just trying to separate these issues because they get too complicated and overlap each other. So we're separating them. The Greek words used for covering in 1 Corinthians 11, some will say that shows that the context is talking about a cloth head covering. Others will say it's, it's, it's talking about your hair being done up. Now we're going to analyze those views, talking about the Greek in the passage. The second set of debates is over textual evidence. Do ancient extra biblical sources, like, like Josephus, that, that kind of stuff, do they show that women in Corinth had a general head covering practice or not? The textual evidence, written records. Then there's a third discussion, and that evidence will sway one way. Then there's a third set of evidence, the artwork evidence. That's going to go a different direction. And that's why this is a difficult, complicated topic to cover. The fourth thing we'll cover is the religious context of coverings in first century culture, which there's widespread agreement on this. But not a lot of Christian commentaries are are aware of this, and not a lot of them have factored in. And so this is a big it's a big issue, and it's where we can be most confident. 
Then finally, we'll just ask which view makes the most sense of 1 Corinthians 11 as a whole. Okay, let's talk about number one, the um, Greek words used in 1 Corinthians 11. So verse 15 is a big debate here. Let's start with verse 15, and then we'll back up from there to look at more of the passage. Here it says, um, if a woman has long hair, um, it, is a glory, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And it is affirming, there's a question mark there, but you, you see he's affirming that as a reality. Um, for the hair up view, the people who hold the hair up view, they say that this word for, it implies that it's the word anti in Greek, and we're going to talk about the Greek words here. It implies that um, the hair replaces the cloth covering. You don't need a cloth covering because your hair, it replaces the covering, therefore the hair done up view. Then the cloth covering view, the more traditional view, those proponents will say that it means that hair is like a covering. Anti is referring to equivalence or similarity. Hair is for a covering. Hair is like a covering. And Paul is saying, hey, if your hair is like a covering, how much more can you have a cloth covering? You guys know that view. I explained it earlier. So we have a few issues we're going to need to discuss to understand this. Um, and unfortunately, scholarship is overly complicated on this topic. I mean, because they have... Anyway, I'll try to bring clarity as much as I can. Hope I do a good job as a teacher here. Three issues will answer how to understand verse 15, I believe. And one is, does the word covering here in verse 15, does that refer to a garment or something else? This one's easy. Right? Does it refer to garment or some kind of like hair being done up or something like that? Uh, the well-established meaning of the word, right, beyond reasonable doubt, is that it means a shawl or cloth wrap around. There's some sort of cloth that you're using to cover something. Uh, that's the well-established meaning of the word. Okay, so that is one issue that you're going to be aware of, but it's answered pretty easily. Not a, whole, not a significant, worthwhile debate on that question. The second issue, is it hair instead of a covering or hair, hair for a covering? And this is all about how we interpret that Greek proposition on T that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, now the, the Greek word itself often means instead of, and that would indicate replacement. Now, there's very few people who would argue for that, who would say that this Greek word anti can mean, or should mean instead of here. Hair is given instead of a covering, therefore a woman does not need a covering. She has her hair, that's all she needs. Um, very few people would argue for this. It's a very minority view. Um, the word anti can also mean for or as, indicating equivalence. Most people on both sides agree with that, but they don't agree on what, it, what that implies. Okay, so this is where, again, it gets complicated because what we're seeing is um, there were those in the past who used to interpret anti as meaning instead of, and they're diminishing in number. The more research has come out on this term, the more those numbers have shrunk. So they've shifted, and many of who were used to be in that camp moved into the camp where they go, oh yeah, it definitely means equivalence. It means head for a covering, but we're still right that the hair, hair for a covering rep represents a replacement of a covering. I know it's complicated. They're complicated. I can't help it. So most on both sides agree that it's equivalence, right? There's an, a sense of equivalence that's going on here. It's definitely in the range of meanings for the term anti. Anti, Greek prepositions are used for all kinds of things. They all have wide ranges of meanings. Anti is definitely uh, used to represent equivalence. But also the other two times Paul has the same kind of construction, he refers to it as being not instead of something, but as similar to something. So let's look at those. They're both basically the same. Romans 12, 17, where he says, never pay back evil for evil. So this is like hair for a covering. It's the same basic structure. And here, evil is not meant to replace evil. It's meant to be the equivalent of evil. The other time Paul says the same phrase, 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, evil for evil. Um, both times Paul uses it as equivalence. Um, not as replacement. Okay, that's that's important. Um, perhaps that's why virtually every translation in the world that I could find, I mean, I looked at a bunch and bunch of them, they all say for instead of instead of when it comes to 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen. Sorry, I lost your place there. So they all kind of agree it's represented as for, not replacement instead of. That's across the world, across the board. So enter in scholar Alan Paget who he kind of entered in, from what I can tell earlier on, he was arguing that anti meant instead of. And then in response to this, another scholar, Gordon Fee, came along and he's like, hey, 
that doesn't make any sense. And he gave a list of reasons as to why that is the case. And you can look at Alan Padgett's article in response to that. Alan Padgett responded with an article saying, the significance of anti in 1 Corinthians 11, 15. And now he has w w what it looks to me as a new position. Definitely this is his current position, from what I can tell, where he doesn't argue that Gordon Fee and others were wrong. He doesn't argue that auntie should be translated as instead of. No, he argues they're right. It means equivalent to, hair is equivalent to a covering, but it doesn't matter. Uh, pa Padgett goes on to say that this distinction is irrelevant. So it's interesting because previously, <laughs> anyway, so he goes, it doesn't matter because if it's equivalent to a covering, then it also means an actual cloth covering is not needed. Because if hair is like a covering, then hair is the covering. It's in, in, end of story, end of debate. So his view seems to depend on two things. If you take his view and you agree with him, you would need to have the idea that Paul is not dealing with an analogy here. He's not offering an analogy that hair is like a covering in verse 15, but rather hair is the covering and no other further covering is needed. And two, if you want to follow Alan Paget, you have to believe in the refutation view of 1 Corinthians 11. Because he's viewing this as a refutation of most of what came before. Hair is her covering. She doesn't need a cloth covering. You Corinthians were wrong in verses 2 through 7a. Okay. But we've already, I think, dealt with that. So let's look at Philip Payne, who has something similar and dissimilar to Alan Paget's view. Philip Payne argues that um, auntie means for rather than instead of. So he's also on that same camp. But he has a different way of using it. Uh, his view depends on two things as well. He's going to say, again, that the hair being done up is the covering, so cloth coverings are not in view anywhere in the passage. His view depends on two issues, and I think more modern people are going to go towards Payne's view. Um, more of the hair up people will lead towards his view now, not Paget's, because his view depends on refutation. Uh, number one, that all the previous words in 1 Corinthians 11, all verses 2 through 14, any of the words there, they don't indicate cloth coverings ever. They always deal with hairstyle. We'll talk about that in a moment. The second view that he has to hold to take verse 15 to push the hair up view instead of a cloth covering view is that it's not an argument from analogy. Again, this is what Paget and Payne have in common, so I'm going to deal with that. Is this an argument from analogy? Let's look at a quote from Philip Payne. He says, Nothing in verses 14 and 15, however, hints that hair is an analogy pointing to the need of an additional covering. He says, there's, there's just nothing there. And he doesn't give much more explanation than that. But it leads us to our third issue that we need to deal with. Is Paul making an analogy in verses 14 to 15, or is he summarizing his entire point through the passage? Right? Is this an analogy of why women should wear head coverings? Or th is this Paul going, ha, my whole point all along has been, she doesn't. Her hair is the covering. So, why I think this is an analogy? Um, here's my case for why you should view this passage as an analogy. Number one, it never mentions hair being done up. So this is to say, Philip Payne's view doesn't work here. Uh, Gordon Fee points this out. He takes verse, Philip Payne takes verse 15 to say her hair being done up is a covering because he doesn't think long hair itself is a covering. It's only when it's done up for a woman. Long hair for a man is a covering. It's sort of two different interpretations for the same idea. Um, but Gordon Fee puts it this way. It does exist. I will find it. There it is. Um, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, which has a lot of really interesting interesting and well-respected commentary, he says that the hair up proponents need this verse to say that a woman's hair done up is the equivalent of a covering, not that her hair being long is the equivalent of a covering. And that breaks their view because, well, let me just read this. How does one reconcile the clear force of the present contrast? The woman has long hair by nature with the idea that the whole point of the argument is to, for her to put it up. All the more so since the word covering ordinarily refers to a garment that functions as a shawl or wraparound. On the whole, the sentence which proponents of this view see as in its favor is in fact its Achilles heel. Right? If nature gives women long hair, why is it, according to Philippine, that long hair left alone is disgraceful and she has to have her hair done up? Wouldn't that verse be saying that long hair, that, let me take it back to verse 15. If you take it at face value and take Philip Payne's interpretation, wouldn't it be saying that long hair 
right? Look at verse 15. A woman has long hair. It's a glory to her for her hair. Her long hair is given to her for a covering. So there were, you wouldn't even need to have your hair done up. The, the long hair alone would be a covering, but that would conflict with the rest of the passage. <clears throat> so it seems like that would be ruled out. Um, so one reason to say it's an analogy is to say that the alternate view doesn't work. Uh, number two, it follows the second analogy that Paul's given to support cloth coverings. Paul gave an analogy earlier, right? In verses five and six. Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she's one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Analogy. For a woman who does not, for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off, analog analogously, right? Um, let her cover her head. And so verse 15 is doing the same thing. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory for her hair is given her as a covering. It's a reference to it being a good thing and similar to, but not a replacement for a cloth covering. So it follows uh, in both cases, hair length is given to support the principle that men and women should display their different roles in how they look. Both times Paul's arguing from what they agree with hair length to what he wants them to agree with cloth coverings. That's the analogy view seems consistent with the other stuff in the passage. Third reason to support the analogy view um, that I'll mention is the passage loses logical flow if you take Payne's view, and this would be Payne's view, one that Paul never once mentions a woman wearing a cloth covering in verses 3 through 14. All those words are about hairstyle. Never mentions cloth covering. But suddenly in verse 15, he hinges on understanding the passage by bringing into it a new idea of cloth coverings. Number two, Payne thinks women weren't wearing cloth coverings at the time anyhow, so then why is Paul talking about him in verse 15? His interpretation seems to conflict with his understanding of the culture. Um, number three, the natural understanding of the whole passage flips in the last verse. Th this is this is problematic anytime. Every time I, I read this, I, I, heard, I heard this before, a woman having long hair is the covering, and that's all 1 Corinthians 11 is saying. And I could never settle on this interpretation. I heard it from people I respected, um, but I could never settle on it because I would read the whole passage if I read verse 15 alone, I thought, oh yeah, okay, her hair is a covering. But when I read the whole passage, it was like, I don't think he's saying that. And I'm just saying, read the whole passage. Don't just read verse 15, read the whole passage. Keep 15 in your mind and realize that it, it just doesn't make sense. Much of the passage is pointless. How many of the verses could you just erase? Because verse 15 was all you really needed. And then the fourth reason is the other Greek words we haven't looked at yet. We'll look at those in just a moment here. Um, but Philip Payne's view, the reason why we take this as an analogy, is, uh, and James Hurley, another scholar who holds this view, it depends on the idea that none of the words, right, in verses 2 through 14 refer to cloth coverings at any point. That's an important thing, right? Verse 15 is the first time cloth coverings come up. Um, remember, Alan Paget gets, gets around this by saying, oh yeah, they talk about cloth coverings, but Paul's refuting it. So you see how verse 15 forces them to have to say, Looking up, you will never see cloth coverings being promoted by Paul. But yet, we do see cloth coverings promoted by Paul in this passage. That's going to be a significant problem. So let's do that now. Let's look at the other Greek words used that may indicate a cloth covering in verse 11. Um, so I'm saying verse 15 on its own doesn't refute the, doesn't promote or support the hair done up view. Now I'm going to say the rest of the passage, the Greek words in it don't support that view either, I believe. So there's two Greek words Let's start with the, the, the hair up proponents. What words will they point to to support their view? <clears throat> okay, there's, there's two Greek words they're going to they're gonna point to. Uh, one of them is in verse 5, and I'll get you there now. And I'm, I'll show it to you in English, but I'll tell it to you in Greek. Um, Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered. That word right there. That word is uh, akatakaluptos. Akatakaluptos in the Greek, um, and you can argue about how to pronounce Greek all you want. I don't care. I'm going to stay out of that. Uh, this word, they say, uh, means hair hanging freely. So, you know, on a, you know, most people would interpret this verse to say, oh, it's talking about cloth coverings. They go, no, 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 no. It means hair hanging down freely. That's what the word uncovered means. And they'll offer evidence for this. And their evidence is Leviticus 13.34. But it's not just any old Leviticus 13.34. It's... Um, the Septuagint. Okay, so the Septuagint is the Greek translation. This was originally written in Hebrew, right? But it, but the Greek translation, showing how some people understood these words, they have the word, sort of, let me get into more details, akatakaluptos here. 
So on the seventh day, the priest shall look at the scale, and if this, am I in the right spot? Leviticus 13, 45. Ha ha. 45. I'm smart. Um, I, I can do numbers. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. So the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he'll cover his mustache. So they'll say, um, the Septuagint has the word akatakaluptos here, and it's referring to his hair hanging loose, which I'm, I'm increasingly suspicious of this for a number of reasons. One of them is this. The Septuagint generally does not have the word katakaluptos here. What Philip Payne and others don't tell you sometimes is that it's only one, one variant in one manuscript of one copy of Leviticus that has the word akatakaluptos here. It's not the Septuagint generally. That's a problem because now it's not the Septuagint. It's just one variant, which is not likely to have been the original. So now it's just one guy did that one time. Okay, that's not strong precedence. It's only one correction to the Alexandrinus text, text, uh, not the other early Septuagint texts where this is a catacalyptos. But there's other problems too. Um, the Greek word a catacalyptos, according to lexicons, not according to one random usage in one variant in one text in the, in the Septuagint, but according to Greek lexicons like BDAG or LSJ, it means uncovered, not hanging loose. Like we should take the lexicons, which pool numbers of uses and look at them all, not just one anomalous use. But I want to also add this, that the passage itself, it's entirely possible the Alexander guy just thought that the leper wasn't allowed to cover his head with cloth. Just like he had to cover his mustache, he didn't, he, he had to physically put a covering on his mustache. The mustache wasn't the covering, right? So his hair, it may be that the leper was being told he couldn't hide his hair or at least that the person who put a catacaluptos there in the Greek thought that about the, the, the leper. His head, his hair hangs down. The hair of his head shall be uncovered. Excuse me, not that it's just long and hanging down, but it's uncovered because you want to identify the leper. The theme of the passage is the leper is contagious and dangerous to society, which is a real danger. So he has to call out unclean so that others don't catch his contagion. It was a way of protecting others, okay? It might be seen as like an insult to lepers, like you're worthless. It was purely a safety issue. Anyway, I think you guys understand the point. So another word that they'll point to in the Greek, so that was really weak, and it was uh, counteracted by, um, it, it backfires. Okay, the, the word seems to refer to cloth coverings. Um, now let's look at another word that they point to. Um, a word related to a catacaluptos that never even appears in 1 Corinthians, but this is the case that's brought by like Philip Payne, and it occurs in the Septuagint of Numbers 5.18. Numbers 5.18. This is a word related to a catacaluptos. It's called a cognate word, um, which is found in, in Numbers 5.18 here, where a woman is suspected of adultery and she has to unbind her hair and wear it loosely. So the priest then shall, uh, shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head go loose. Actually, it's just go loose. And place the grain offering memorial in her hands. And so she's got to let the, the, her hair go loose in this scenario. They go, look, that's a, it's not even the same word as what you see in 1 Corinthians, but it's related. And that word's talking about hair hanging down. So maybe 1 Corinthians is talking about hair hanging down. This is like a big stretch. Okay, related words are important, but they're not always so useful as this, especially if they're only found in other authors. We don't see Paul using this related word. Akatakaluptos, excuse me, this word's apakakaluptos. Apocalyptos, Apocalyptos is not found in 1 Corinthians 11 anywhere. More importantly, the words that are found there, which we'll deal with right now, are more relevant and really strongly refer to a cloth covering, not just hair hanging loose. So let's look at some of those words now. For the cloth covering side, we have, I think, a real strong case. Um, there's a verb that Paul uses three times in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 6 and 7. I don't think that you're allowed to type it that way, Mike. Ah, there's, um, <clears throat> okay. The verb translated cover, and you can see this here, um, for a woman does not, if a woman does not cover her head, for da, 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 let her cover her head, then in verse seven, man ought to, not to have his head covered. Okay, th this is, this is what we're going to talk about here um, for the cloth covering side. This is a verb that Paul uses three times. 
the verb that we translate to cover is the word katakalupto. Sound familiar? Um, lexicons like BDAG, which is considered a very well-respected, like reliable lexicon, is say this word refers to cloth coverings, covering something with cloth. Let me give you guys a quote here. Preston Massey says, uh, katakalupto is never used in ancient Greek to describe the covering of either a man's or woman's head with hair. Now this is in his book, Veiling on uh, Veiling Among Men in Roman Corinth. Actually, it's not a book, it's an article. Um, at any rate, this is important because we have multiple examples of katakalupto, the word Paul uses three times in 1 Corinthians 11, verses six and seven, referring to cloth covering the head. And according to Preston Massey, literally not a single example in ancient Greek of the word referring to hair or hairstyles, not once. Okay, that, that's pretty significant. So we have that word used three times in verses six and seven, and here's relevant cognates or related words. We have related words used in verses five and 13. And let me show you those. Because Paul uses these words. So when they're cognate or related words used by the same author in the same context, they're more relevant than something found in numbers that Paul never used. Um, so verse five says, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered. She dishonors her head. So it's like the reverse of being covered is being uncovered. And then we have it in verse 13. Uncovered comes up again, a cognate of that same term in the same context. Okay. So here's where cognates start to be more important. The combination of these uses suggests a cloth covering, like part of a garment pulled over the head, not covering the face, um, or a separate piece of cloth, like a shawl. That's what it seems to suggest. This strikes against the view that it's just the woman's long hair done up for three reasons. There's three reasons why the Greek is pushing against the hair done up view. Um, the Septuagint uses this term to refer to cloth covering, right? The normal Septuagint, not one variant in one Alexandrian text. This is a problem for those who take a katakalupto as a hairstyle. Let's look at Genesis chapter 38, verse 15. Remember, they thought the Septuagint was relevant um, although they used it in some squirrely ways. But here it says, when Judah saw her, speaking of Tamar, he thought she was a harlot for she had covered her face and she didn't pull her hair over her face. She had actually put a cloth over her, not just her head, but over her face to hide her identity in this case. This is the only time this word that Paul uses is used um, in the Old Testament of a human in the Septuagint. And it's referring to an actual cloth covering. Number two, the consistent use of the word in the Septuagint, even not referring to, it'll refer to like an animal or other things, a tent. It'll refer to something that covers or hides. But the hair done up view doesn't seem to cover or hide the head any more than hair hanging down, right? When, when a woman piles her hair up, she's not more covered or hidden than when her hair was down. She's less hidden. I mean, I see more of her neck and ears and stuff like that. So it just doesn't seem to fit the logic of it either. Then we have the third reason, uh, whatever the women are to do, the men are not to do. This is again, the thing that I think um, egalitarians tend to disregard or at least de-emphasize in 1 Corinthians 11. Men don't wear head coverings. This is something Paul reinforces, says it multiple times in the passage, and he seems to care about it. So let's apply that to the logic of hair being done up. It doesn't seem that men are rebuked for wearing long hair in an upward fashion. They're being rebuked for wearing cloth over their heads. I mean, do you really think men have long hair and they were styling it up and that's what Paul's refuting in 1 Corinthians 11? Nobody thinks that. They just they just become inconsistent in their interpretations. We ignore the instruction, when we ignore the instructions to men, as some commentaries do, um, it can seem more plausible that women are instructed about hairstyles and not head coverings of a cloth. But the inclusion of men and the counterexamples between men and women and the parallels there implies it's gotta be a cloth covering that's in view here. It's got to be a cloth covering. There's more support for this. Plus, why would Paul say praying and prophesying, right? Why is it in, in the praying and prophesying? Because hairstyle and hair length is something that you don't just do and undo in a moment's notice. You do it in the morning. You used to carry it with you all day. But Paul's interested in praying and prophesying. Like it's something you can do in the moment and then undo like a cloth covering. So there's more support for this. Um, <clears throat> we're looking now at uh, here Philo's use of the same Greek term. Okay, so Philo is... A first century guy, okay, writing with the same kind of Greek as what we, we, read, we read about in the New Testament. And he uses a katakalupto 
coupled with kephale. Okay, that's not just the Greek word, that's the, 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 the phrase. A head covering. He uses a katakalupto cup coupled with kephale to refer to cloth coverings on the head. If your brain is still on, here's what Philo says. And when all these things are previously prepared, the woman with her head uncovered, bearing the barley flour in her hand, as has been already specified, shall come forward. Okay, he's, Philo's here writing, referring to like Jewish ritual, and he is clearly using head and uncovered, akata kalupto, to refer to a cloth covering. And if anybody doubts it, we just back up a little bit and we see the same woman is wearing a cloth covering that is removed from her. And the priest shall take the barley and offer it to the woman and shall take away from her the head dress on her head that she may be judged with her head bare. He doesn't take away her hair. <laughs> but rather, this is clearly in the context. This is just a sentence prior. She is someone who um, who has a cloth covering on her hair. That's how the term is used. A catacalupto coupled, coupled with head, kephale, just like Paul does. I have a link in my notes. You guys can read Philo for yourself and check it out. Philo writes this in the first century AD. It's directly relevant to the time of Paul, right? The, the type of Greek he's using. This is general. This is uh, th this is why there's general agreement that women, oh, excuse me, I'm misreading my own notes. Forgive me. There is general agreement uh, that women in Egypt, where Philo is referring to, did wear coverings, at least the Jewish ones. Okay, so, so it's all consistent. Philo's talking about a woman who's wearing a head covering here. Um, consider how Philip Payne interprets the same word. Here's another problem with, say, the hair up view, which I show why I think it's just, it's, it's DOA. You know, it's dead on arrival. This is how Philip Payne interprets the same word, katakalupto, right? This is not the uncovered, that's akatakalupto. This is covered, katakalupto. He interprets that same word in verses six and seven in mutually contradictory ways. So let me take us to the verse, then I'll tell, then I'll show you. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> and I'm going to read it to you with his interpretations in mind. Okay, so if a woman does not cover her head, then we have, let her cover her head here at the end of the verse. Okay, so that's about the woman. But in verse 7, it's about a man. For a man ought not to have his head covered. Same word. When it refers to a woman, and when it refers to a man, he interprets it in different ways. So with a man... Being covered is having long hair. A man with long hair is seen as covered. That's the hair up interpretation. But a woman, if she has the exact same hair the man had, long hair, just coming down, she's considered uncovered. With the same term in verse 6. She has to have her hair done up in order to be covered. This is literally the same Greek word. In verse 6, it means hair done up. right? Covered in verse 6, according to the hair up view, it means hair done up. Covered in verse 7, same word. It means long hair. And these, and these, it, it's just a problem. It's, it's literally the same Greek word. Good Greek evidence shows it doesn't mean any of those things. It means a cloth covering all three times. And that's how you interpret the same word consistently in the passage. The hair done up view is <clears throat> problematic. Um, the thing is, the passage is just so complicated and the debates are so complicated. You can lose the clarity of seeing these inconsistencies when you're reading a commentary and you go, well, yeah, that, that looks like a really solid view and you have to be real patient. You have to really slow down, zoom out and see if they're being consistent with themselves before you have clarity. Okay, there's a third uh, issue, a third support for the cloth covering view and why I very firmly hold that view now um, where I was uncertain before. The Septuagint uses katakephales, which is found in verse four. Here we go. So every man who has something on his head, okay, that's the word there in the Greek is kata kephales. Kata is like with, right? It's a, it's a preposition again. It has lots of different uses. And kephales are head. Okay, something on his head. Every man who has something on his head. There's like a little discussion. Like, what is that meaning? What is, what is, what is, this, what is going on in verse four there? Um, in the Septuagint of, Extras, of Esther 6.12, again, we do care about the Septuagint. It is showing us other uses of the Greek. We just don't want one random variant. We want the consistent, you know, example of the Septuagint here. So um, here, Mordecai returned to the king's, day, king's gate, but Haman returned home with his head covered. That's actually in the Greek, katakephales. It's the same thing, head covered, having his, with his head, something, you know, it's like a strange phrase in the Greek when you transliterate it or, or when you clumsily translate it to English, I should say. 
Um, but it's likely that what happened is Haman's on his way home and because he's in action, he got bad news, he's on his way home and he's ashamed. And so he just pulls his head, his cloth over his head, covers his head on his way home to speak of his shame. What he didn't do was get a new hairstyle on the way home. Do you catch it? Like verse, this is no way in Esther that Haman's like, I'm so ashamed. I'm going to grow my hair long <laughs> on my way home. <laughs> or there's no way Haman's like, I'm so ashamed. I'm going to do my hair up on my way home. And I'm going to have a pretty hairstyle to demonstrate my shame. Like that's, it's not the case. The force of this point is to say this. The man in 1 Corinthians 11 is being instructed about cloth coverings. Just like Haman's using a cloth covering here. 1 Corinthians 11, the man is being instructed here, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, about cloth coverings. If that's the case, that the man, it must be about cloth coverings, then it follows logically that with the woman, it's also about cloth coverings. And this is, I think, why some people, by force of their interpretation, they have to de-emphasize the instructions to the men. Let me share with you another little quote on this <clears throat> from Preston Massey again. He says, Neither is the expression katakephales, ekon, ever used in ancient Greek to describe hair coming down. That's that, that in verse 4. Every man who prays with his, uh, prophesies with his head covered, um, or katakephales, it's never used. Echoin is like, is like the personal, his own hair, like his own hair. It is never used in ancient Greek to describe hair coming down. On the contrary, these words describe the covering of the head with a material veil. That's just how the term is used. So the, the bottom line here is this, okay? We can answer the first debate over what the, what's going on in the culture by first examining 1 Corinthians 11 and saying the Greek words very, very strongly and consistently indicate Cloth coverings are in view here. Whatever else is going on in the wider culture, cloth coverings are what, what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11. He talks about it with the men. He talks about it towards the women. He uses many different Greek words that all reinforce this strong, strong indication. This means the hair up view is, is dead on arrival when you look at the Greek of 1 Corinthians 11. Now let's look at the second issue about the cultural backgrounds, which is the textual or literary evidence. Okay, this is not, we're no longer just focused on the Greek words found in 1 Corinthians 11 and how to interpret those. We're focused now on literary um, evidence that talks about like, what were the practices of head coverings? Did women wear head coverings back then? Where did they wear them? Um, and is there anybody who in ancient history wrote about it? Like just said, hey, women do this typically. And we're led to one of the, everybody ends up talking about Plutarch at this point. So Plutarch is like an ancient Roman biographer. He's like the father of biography, right? Like I wrote a bunch of biographies. And um, in one of his books where he talks about questions, it's about all these questions. He asks a question that answers it and then, or guesses at an answer. So here we go. And I have, uh, you know, notes and stuff like that for where you can find all this stuff in my notes down below. Um, he says, why do sons cover their heads when they escort their parents to the grave while daughters go with bare heads and hair unbound? This is the question. He's like, hey, we have a particular custom amongst us Romans where sons cover their heads when they're, you know, doing the funeral procession for their parents, but daughters go with their heads uncovered and they, and their hair unbound. Two things, not one thing, right? Uncovered hair and hair unbound. So then he postulates possible answers. He goes, is it because fathers should be given honor as gods by their male children? Because as we'll find later, uh, you would cover when doing certain acts of worship as a Roman. So he's like, maybe they're honoring their fathers as, as gods, but be mourned for as dead by their daughters. And so the uncovering in the hair down is a shine of mourning. And custom in assigning the proper action to each sex has contrived what is fitting tribute from each, because maybe that's the reason. Or, and then he says the part that everybody debates. Is it that what is proper to mourning is whatever is not customary? And it is more customary for women to go in public covered, veiled, for but for men to go uncovered. So his theory is, oh, maybe they're reversing custom. Hey, during funerals, you have men covered, women uncovered. That's because normally in daily life, it's the other way around. Is Plutarch here revealing that normal Roman practice in the Roman world in general was that women would cover their hair and men would not? And only during certain religious things would the men start to cover their heads? Let's talk about that. Um, then he talks about the Greeks, uh, which is not super relevant for the moment, but I'll leave it on your screen because it's interesting. 
Um, so Elaine Fantham translated that. That's her translation there. Um, so Roman practice, what we can learn from this quote is, it was, I believe this is accurate, but we'll we'll see the pushback. There'll be pushback from the people who have the, the hair done up view who go, uh, women didn't cover their hair. They just did their hair up. We'll talk about that later. That Not talking about First Corinthians anymore. We're talking about greater Roman culture. Okay, so Roman practice, what it seems we can learn from this Plutarch quote is that it was normal Roman practice for in public for women to cover their heads and for men to go around without covering their heads. Maybe when it was raining or maybe when they met certain other people, they would cover their heads, maybe in worship, but not normally. It was normal practice in some service to gods for people to cover their heads. We'll talk more about that later, a neglected truth. Um, and it was normal practice at a funeral for parents to be different than the typical public practice. Now, Plutarch's like, maybe that's what explains why they do it so different as they're trying to break trend to show the shame or the embarrassment or the or the grief or the sorrow overall. Um, so, push back from the hair up view on this Plutarch quote. First off, we have to recognize this is just one quote from one guy. Okay, you know, it, you could say it probably speaks about typical culture at the time, but you know, we should be open to lots of evidence. And there will be evidence on the other side in a little bit. So pushback from the hair up view, though, is this. Uh, Plutarch isn't actually saying what you think he's saying here, Mike, or those who hold that view. He's not saying that it was normal practice for women to go covered and men not to. Rather, Plutarch is just offering speculation. So you can't rely on it because he's just speculating. Let me share with you a quote. This is from Cynthia Thompson. Her and Philip Payne are in the same camp here. They both affirm that you can't rely on the Plutarch quote. Like you have to set it aside. It's just not reliable. It's speculation. And because it's speculation, you can't take it as his statement about what things were like. So let's work through this because this Plutarch quote's a big deal. At least I think it is. Um, <clears throat> so Cynthia Thompson says, likewise, Plutarch speculates that the Romans too may be reversing normal custom and that women usually appear in public with head coverings. This speculative explanation concerning the customs of Roman women, however, is frequently quoted out of context as evidence that the Corinthian women regularly wore veils. Um, there needs to be clarity on this. Um, so this is what Philip Payne also agrees with, but so they both will say the same thing. Philip Payne, I believe, appeals to Cynthia Thompson on this, I think. I think that he's the one who refers to her here. But Plutarch isn't speculating. Let's be clear on what he's speculating. He's not speculating that women might normally go out covered. He's using that knowledge, that known fact, to s speculate something else. Let's look at the Plutarch quote again. I'm not going to read it, but you can read it as I discuss it if you'd like. Plutarch's suggestion is that a reversal of norms, his speculation, might be the reason why funeral practices are in place of women uncovered and men covered. But he's not speculating about the norms. His speculation only works if its basis is true. If women do normally go around covered, it, uh, you could say Plutarch's wrong. Women don't normally go that way. But don't say he's speculating that because that's the known fact that he assumes is true. It's the foundation of why he can speculate about how that relates to funeral practices. So Payne and Thompson make the mistake of um, mistaking the speculation about funeral practices right, for speculation about what women typically did in public going around covered and men going around uncovered. Plutarch also said that there's more pushback on Plutarch. Everything gets complicated here. <laughs> but hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm simplifying it in the long run. Plutarch also said um, that in older times, women were not allowed to cover their heads at all. Now, this is interesting that he said this, but I just want to put it in perspective. I know this, that if you're reading all the debates, this is probably going to come up for you, and I'd like to bring some insight into it if I can. Here's a second quote from Plutarch. He says, but in olden days, women were not allowed to cover their heads at all. For the story is told, and here's his reason why he thinks this, that Spurius Carvilius was first to repudiate his wife for childless, childlessness, Next, Sulpicius Gallus, when he saw she had pulled her cloak over her head. And then someone else, because she watched funeral games. Um, he's saying, hey, a woman got in trouble and divorced because she had pulled a cloak over her head. But here, sadly gets complicated. This is where um, Gallus, his time is about 150 years prior to Plutarch. Okay, so Plutarch's writing about some 150 years prior to him. Plutarch seems to have misunderstood the quote he offers from from Gallus. Let's, about Gallus. Let's look at that now. Um, feel free to skip ahead if you decide you don't care about this part. 
<laughs> I understand. Uh, so Plutarch obviously misunderstood, Elaine Fenton points out, the behavior of Sulpicius Gallus, consul of 166 BC. Valerius Maximus, our other source for Gallus's divorce, makes it clear that he repudiated his wife when he found out she had been walking around in public with her head uncovered, and she gives the Latin there, um, giving as his reason that the law restricts you to winning approval for your beauty from my eyes alone, further reinforcing it was her uncovered quality that was a problem. So all I'm saying is this, when Plutarch talks about time before his time, 150 years prior, he misunderstood the quote, uh, misunderstands the quote, and he just makes a basic blunder about history before his time. Does that mean you cannot trust Plutarch about history during his time? Um, I think the answer is going to be no here. And the reason is this. It was not uncommon, and, and still can be the case, for historians to get details wrong about time before their contemporary time. Like Josephus does this. Josephus is known for being fairly reliable for his own time and less reliable when he goes back further in time. Because when he's in his own time, he's often talking about things that took place during his literal lifetime, like he witnessed this stuff. But when he goes back previously, he's relying upon scattered records he has and his own impressions as he reads those. And so it can be harder for uh, them to be accurate at that time. It's understandable if a commenter misunderstood practices from before their own time, just like it's known to happen. But we have good reason to think Plutarch knew what was going on during his time, right? Plutarch, first century guy, he lived from 46 to 119, right? so died in the second century. He was well-traveled around the Mediterranean, the same area Paul did his missionary journeys and a lot of the early churches were. So he traveled during that same time, right? Approximately the same time um, after. So he also traveled the same areas. He was personally aware of these things. He was born near, nearby, um, time-wise, when 1 Corinthians was written, and he traveled in the same areas as Paul's missionary journey. So what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, here's a Plutarch, a guy who seems like he would know, saying that commonly Roman women would wear their head coverings in public. That's a really strong piece of evidence. On the other hand, and this is why this debate's not as simple as I'd like it to be, I just quote Plutarch and run away. <laughs> I wish. There's actually just very little written records. Like, this is a super rare quote from Plutarch to have anybody talking about what women typically wore on their heads. Like, it's a very, it's a little gem that you even found it. It's just, you're not going to find it because people just didn't talk about that stuff. Just like people don't talk about like, you know, historians aren't writing about like the way people have lane changing practices in modern America. Like they're just not thinking about that stuff because it's so normal part of life that it just doesn't occur to them to write it down. And I think that that's the case with head covering issues. So we have very little to go on. There are several other quotes that are less helpful for us and people think they're helpful, but let me mention them. Um, there's a guy named Juvenal who in the late first century and early second century, he describes these crazy elaborate women's hairstyles and he describes them very sarcastically. Some take this to mean women were not wearing head coverings because look at the hairstyles he describes. Um, but other historians will acknowledge the stuff Juvenal talks about was an anomaly that occurred after the time of first Corinthians. It was late first century, not mid first century, late. And it occurred for a short season of time, like a fad. Um, so you can't really read Juvenal's crazy statements about hairstyles into the first century culture of the Bible. Okay, it's just, uh, you're, you're just making a mistake there. Another one is Ovid. Um, now he died around 1780. So he's like predates 1 Corinthians. And he describes women's hairstyles in detail. So he says, hey, if you have a round face, wear this hairstyle. If you have a long face, try this hairstyle. And he gives literally hairstyle advice based upon the shape of your head and face. Now, some people say, if these writers, are, they don't talk about head coverings at all, but if they reveal that women cared about hairstyles, then it stands to reason that they weren't wearing head coverings because you don't you don't worry about hairstyle when your head is covered. Um, I think that that is mistaken for a couple reasons, um, but let me explain. So women can have nicely done hair and still have it covered. Partly, and a big part of it is this, is you'll see pictures in it real soon here. We'll show you pictures of actual hair coverings. They didn't cover most of the head. They covered just the back portion, like the ears and back, right behind the ears and kind of. And so you have like a lot of hair that's out there. You're going to style it. You're going to want to make that look nice. So even with the covering, you don't negate hairstyle. So that's not a logical reasoning. But also, <clears throat> um, and here's a, I'm going to go to Quora uh, website, a question website about um, just, just for anecdotal evidence here. Okay. So somebody went on to Quora and they asked, 
about how religious Muslim women who have much stricter head covering protocols than what we're reading about in the the wide wider area of the Mediterranean. Um, and he asked them, hey, do Muslim women with these really strict like burqa and stuff like that, do they do their hair? Do they like get their hair styled? Like how do they handle this? Interesting to hear a Muslim woman respond to it. So let me share it with you now. Her response was, um, we get our hair cut, dyed, braided, twisted, and professionally shampooed. All of the hours in the day when we are not out and about at work, school or both, all of the hours when we are at home, our heads are uncovered unless we're praying or a foreign male over the age of seven is present. Now, Muslim culture is varied, right? Their head covering practices are also very different and more strict uh, than they were in Paul's time or than what the New Testament discusses. But it shows that there can be reason to have elaborate hairstyles alongside a head covering culture. Like I'm just saying, <clears throat> We don't want to use quotes about hairstyles as a refutation of head coverings for those reasons. It's just stretching that information too far. I'd also mention this, that these hairstyles, women were wearing elaborate hairstyles. This was primarily amongst the wealthy. And there's an element here that I think most of us intuitively understand, and that is that rich women, not insulting rich women here, but you do not represent normal women, okay? Rich people do not represent normal people. Rich lifestyles do not represent normal lifestyles. Rich clothing and hairstyles does not represent. The majority of the people in the New Testament who were, we would consider them living at like poverty level. Okay, not just like middle class, right? There's no middle class. Like they're just living down there. They're, they're, they're all just struggling to get by. And so we, we shouldn't say that these rich women's hairstyles tell us about common women's hair coverings. That's another reason against that view. So I think Plutarch's comments seem like we don't have a lot of evidence, but it's very strong evidence. What we do have, he speaks of women in general, not just the rich. He traveled widely in the region around the same time. Um, and he talks about actual hair covering practices with nobody else seems to be doing. So that seems pretty significant. Um, <clears throat> there's other stuff we could talk about there, but I'll move forward to the artwork evidence. Okay. So the artwork evidence swings the other way entirely. Like, well, not entirely, but widely, strongly, it swings the other way. And if all you have was the stuff I'd given you, you'd be like, yeah, clearly there was a regular head covering practice. Plenty of commentaries will say that. Plenty of articles will say that. Plenty of other articles will say the opposite. Hence the confusion why this is particularly one of the most difficult things to, to, to figure out. What were women doing back then? Um, in Corinth, outside of Corinth. So let's talk about the artwork evidence. Artwork evidence refers to like, coins or like a bust or like so like a little statue something called a grotesque i have a very interesting grotesque to show you in a moment um, this is where a good deal of evidence seems to suggest at least many people believe that women did not wear head coverings because all the women in all these pictures and artwork they're not really wearing head coverings for the most part so we're talking about mosaics right coin statues busts all that kind of thing and here i'm going to lean on cynthia thompson's work a bit um she wrote it rather recently, wrote an article where she brought, brought forth a lot of images and a lot of <clears throat> information specifically from First Corinthians, or from Corinth, excuse me, as it relates to First Corinthians. But the article is called Hairstyles, Head Coverings, and St. Paul, Portraits from Rome and Corinth. And what she did was she examined like the evidence of archaeological digs in Corinth that are close to the time of Paul, not necessarily at, but at least close to the time of Paul, and looked at the art that came out images. So let's look at that stuff now. Here's one of them. This is Livia. Livia is, you can see she has no head covering there. She has her, her she has braids that are drawn back, multiple braids drawn back into a bun behind her. Um, this is the wife of Caesar Augustus. Now he ruled until 14 AD. So this is before the time of Paul. This is before Christianity had risen. Um, but Cynthia Thompson says, other portraits of Livia suggest that she wore this hairstyle in the latter part of her life. <clears throat> this was found in Corinth. Okay, so here's a coin in Corinth of an uncovered woman. What do we do with that? Then we have a, uh, a clay lady. I know this one is not clear, but her hair is parted down the middle and drawn towards the ears in waves. And it appears that she is not wearing some sort of covering. Although I admit this one is a little bit thin on uh, clarity. Then we have the next one, who I affectionately call Marble Face. I had to give them names for my the sake of all my clips, all my images here. All right, so Marble Face. Thompson says this was a common hairstyle at the time. 
this sort of, um, I don't know what to call that. It's super cool though. Um, again, there's no covering in this picture. That's the thing to notice. There's no covering on this woman. Then we have another one. This is who I call noseless. Um, noseless. Who, um, sorry, I, I think it's funny because I'm, I'm overly tired. Still getting over COVID. Can't think straight. I'm hoping that my teaching is not more confusing than it seems like it is to me. Um, also from the time of Augustus. So this is this is predates Paul. But again, it shows an anonymous woman, but she has no veil. There's no veil. All that is hair. Everything you're looking at is hair styled in different ways. She's kind of like Princess Leia with no nose. And then we've got um, um, Agrippina. This is Agrippina, who is the daughter, the granddaughter of Augustus. She lived from like 14 BC to 33 AD. So we're getting, we're pretty close to that time of Paul. Um, her hair is a bit bigger and more elaborate than Livia. It's not crazy though. Just a little bit bigger and more elaborate. There's no head covering though in this artwork. So you, you get the, you get the vibe. The artwork is pretty consistent. Like there's like not a lot of head coverings going on. And what do we make of that? Is the going to be the question? This is another Agrippina, a different one. Younger Agrippinas, historians call her. Um, this one was married to Claudius Caesar from 15 to 59 AD was her life. So she's actually alive towards the end of her life when Paul's writing 1 Corinthians. And here's a coin of her from near that time found in Corinth and she's got no covering. Isn't that interesting? This is Nero's mom, by the way. So she gets Mother of the Year Award for raising a psychopath who put people on sticks and set them on fire. Um, and then you have the... Uh, big head. And this is a hair, believe it or not, this is a hairstyle. Okay. Th this is what I mean with a sudden shift after the time of the new Testament. This is what, um, was it, was it Ovid or Juvenal? Oh, Juvenal talks about these, these women who had these crazy hairstyles where it was like, if you turn sideways, you know, she's just, it's all right here. And there's like nothing behind because all her hair has been brought forward and put up. And so she's basically, it's just like the peacock hairstyle thing. Um, she doesn't have a head covering far as far as we know. And, um, this doesn't relate to the first century time. This this is an anomaly that happened after, and so we probably shouldn't shouldn't weigh in. But they like you know I thought you'd be interested in seeing it. People are. <clears throat> All right, let's look at another one. This is Livia again, but you'll notice this time she has a covering. Isn't that interesting? So she has a veil covering the back half of her head. Again, I'll sh I'll sh I'm showing you coverings were not did not mean you couldn't have a hairstyle. She's obviously going to do everything to make her hair look nice up front. If she had gold woven in her hair, you would see it even with the covering on, in this case, if it's that kind of covering, which we have here historical evidence for. Um, now she has a veil covering the back half of her head. And this is probably in the, in, maybe in the context of sacrifice. We'll talk more about that later. And it will be relevant. So, okay, now the last one is this. This is the art of a commoner. This is the only one um, of all the artwork that is presented in uh, Cynthia Thompson's work here, at least in this article, that is said to be from a commoner. And it's called a grotesque. So it's a small like statue type thing. And it's called a grotesque, not because it's icky. Well, let me just show you what she says about it. Oh no, that's not right. Well, I guess I just have to read it for you here. She says, this figure from a second century AD is of the type often called grotesques, which depict people without the customary idealizing meaning it was normal, pause the quote here, it was normal in artwork for there to be a type of idealizing so that they did not represent normalcy, they represented some sort of other thing in art. But not with grotesques, grotesques were very normal. I think that's very relevant. She says, and I continue, consequently, these figures are often realistic and may represent people of the lower classes. Now this strikes me as super interesting because Cynthia Thompson doesn't comment on this but if the, if the question is, what were Roman hairstyles typically like in Corinth? And we have a bunch of artwork that suggests that women weren't wearing head coverings, but it's almost all rich people or an anonymous person, right? Like it's a lot of rich people. And then we have one grotesque of a normal girl. And guess what? She's got a covering there, I guess, over there for you. She has a covering on her head. Like that. Now, Cynthia Thompson doesn't really explain that in, in the one article. Maybe she does somewhere else. I don't know. I didn't read everything everybody ever wrote, um, and I don't want to. <laughs> but she does say this. The cap on the present figurine associates her with a conventional type of female household servant or nurse. Now, it's interesting to suggest um, women didn't normally wear head coverings, but a servant or nurse normally wore a head covering that was a cap. 
But notice she has more than a cap. She has not only a cap on her head, she also has a cloth that's covering her head and a cap. What I'm suggesting here is there's a lot of artwork that pushes against the idea that women were wearing coverings if you apply that artwork as representing normal women. But we have one thing that clearly represented a more normal girl, and she's got a covering. So I can't try to give my full explanation of all the evidence because there's way more than what I showed you, and it's way too complicated. This is just the tip of the iceberg for it. There's other art outside of Corinth, right? There's a mountain of evidence there, and coverings appear sometimes in artwork, but frequently coverings do not appear in the artwork. Like it just doesn't show up. Like you have women, but not covered. Or there's one woman who's covered and there's three in the background who aren't. And you're like, what does that mean? Does that mean they normally weren't? Um, so what do all sides usually agree on? Okay, where there's agreement is rich women didn't seem to wear coverings as much, at least. Okay, maybe poor women did, maybe they didn't. But rich women, a minority, a small minority women, at least them did not seem to wear coverings. The deep question is, can you extrapolate that out to all women. So it seems like we have conflict. Um, at least on some level, there's conflict between the art evidence and the textual evidence, right? Like we have Plutarch seem to indicating, it seems to indicate coverings. We have a definitely a strong tradition of coverings before that time as well. We have Paul who says in 1 Corinthians 11 that everybody's wearing coverings. Like there's, that's textual evidence too. 1 Corinthians 11 can be evidence of history too. <laughs> and, um, and then we have artwork evidence that suggests Maybe the opposite. So how do you reconcile that? I like what Ramsey McMillan says, and I want to weigh this in on our conclusion here. He says, and yet, to return to our starting point, we have the many testimonies to women in the eastern provinces going about veiled, and the implication therein that they were to avoid notice by all means possible. I don't know if that's the implication, but what is to be done with this picture? Against it must be set in mosaics, without others in mosaics, so artwork, without exception, showing women with their faces and generally with their heads too, quite uncovered. Perhaps generally, not always, but generally, perhaps the better to display the modish arrangement of hair on their head. Here may be the clue that resolves the conflict in evidence. Women who imitated the changes in style that went on at the imperial court, changes depicted in the provinces by portraits of the ladies of the imperial house were the richer ones, the more open to new ways and the more likely to belong to families on the rise. Women of a humbler class went veiled, but these others behaved exactly like their other counterparts observed in, in Italy, fully visible, indeed making their existence felt very fully in public. I think that this could this is a really good way to harmonize the data with 1 Corinthians 11. A general practice amongst the normal plebes, right? The normal people, women wear head coverings. Not their faces, but their hair. In some locations, they probably covered other things too, but in general, widespread. But the rich women in the imperial court were more and more casting off this, this procedure, this hair covering thing. And so we have a minority of a few women in 1 Corinthians, in, verse, in chapter 11, that Paul is dealing with. Some of the women are casting off head coverings. Most of them are still doing it. 1 Corinthians 11, the first section, it seems like it's just a few that are, are causing the problem. Paul reinforces the rule that is still in present, still present throughout the culture, that women of the humbler class go veiled. And these richer women are given to extravagances that speak of pride and speak of vanity and speak of rebellion even potentially. And Paul is pushing against that. I think a culture clash explains really well why a few women, not the majority, were going uncovered in the Corinthian church gatherings. And Paul writes to reinforce the known custom that a few people are rejecting. Now, uh, side note, before I go to the next part, because um, there is more, there is more, even on this issue of religious, really the religious stuff, uh, why Roman religious practices, during religious practices, Romans, well, I gotta take a break, my brain is dying. Um, it's this long COVID garbage. Um, God help me. So why in religious practices, Roman men and women would cover their hair, which is why Paul speaks against men covering their heads to the Corinthians. So we'll get there in a minute, but I think, uh, side note, Jewish head coverings, if you're thinking of those as explaining anything, like the yar yarmulke, yarmulke, that came much later in history that has nothing to do with anything in the New Testament. So don't try to think of that as giving you your interpretation. All right, I'm gonna take a little break, and I'll be back either, either later today or tomorrow to try to finish um, this, this video. We're about 
almost halfway through. <laughs> All right, since that last clip, I have taken uh, a day to rest, sleep, wake up, get ready, and here we go. But cleverly, I saved the shirt so nobody would know. All right, here we go into the subject of the religious context of head coverings in first century culture. And let me just remind us of the roadmap we're at here when it comes to like cultural backgrounds, 1 Corinthians 11. It seems to me that there's a decent case that women generally wore head coverings. Probably the more rich didn't, but that's the, a very much a minority. Um, that would be not only in other places, but it seems likely in Corinth. The artwork evidence pushes against that to some extent, depending on how you interpret it. But here's the thing. You don't need to know the answer to that question to apply it to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because of this issue, the religious background of head coverings. There isn't really big debate on this, not really at all, as far as I know. Um, religiously, when Romans were in worship settings, doing sacrifice, um, uh, prayer or prophecy, those types of things, they would wear head coverings, men and women. And so knowing that, that that's still in place. That gives us an explanation of the cultural background of 1 Corinthians 11. Let me walk us through this because this is an often neglected, forgot to take these out, a neglected piece of evidence from the first century culture. And I mean, really neglected, even among some sort of like top, high-end, uh, well-respected commentaries on 1 Corinthians. Okay, but that's because up until with the last 20 years, nobody was paying attention to this data. So if you have a scholar who's not, you know, watching the most recent stuff, they're just not going to talk about it. So here we go. Paul's concern, and, and let's let's look at the passage again. Paul's concern, and we'll look at verses 4, 5, and 13, is um, praying and prophesying, right? A, a man or woman, this is something people neglect, when they're praying or prophesying, when they're praying or prophesying, again in verse 5, and then in verse 13, he says it again. It, you know, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered, right? It's that... It's that moment of specific religious activity. That's the time when the head covering comes into play in 1 Corinthians 11. This is a key element of the passage. And so strictly speaking, I don't need to prove that women um, in, in Corinth were wearing head coverings on a regular basis, although I, I'm, I'm leaning that way myself. Personally, you, you have your own thoughts on that, and there's plenty who would disagree with me. So my case doesn't depend on that, <laughs> really, for understanding 1 Corinthians 11. It just depends on seeing the religious context during prayer worship type settings. Okay, so Paul is, um, uh, on, on top of this, he's concerned about not just women's head coverings, but men's. This is also a neglected issue. Let me give you an example of how this is a neglected issue. Um, how some commentaries will take Paul's instructions like three times. He says like about guys, like don't cover your hair, don't cover your hair, don't cover your hair in 1 Corinthians 11. But some either ig ignore this in their commentaries or they'll, they'll swipe it aside like Gordon Fee, a highly respected a uh, brother who recently went to be with the Lord and rightly highly respected. But in this particular case, I think he made a mistake, um, as we all do. So this is what he says about this. Um, there is almost no evidence about men and head coverings, paintings, relief, statu statuary, etc., that men in any of the first century cultures covered their heads. Now, we're actually going to see evidence that says that they did. In just a moment, I'll, I'll present the evidence to you. So this was just a mistake in a popular commentary. In the final analysis, however, we simply have to admit that we do not know, he says, in any case, whatever it was, Paul's usage is hypothetical. And whatever it meant, he would expect the Corinthians to agree that such a covering for men would bring shame to Christ. So Gordon Fee understands that this whole idea of the head covering, as it applies to men, was, was not actually, there was no relevant real-world application for it. It was something that Paul was saying hypothetically, like to reinforce the idea of covering for women. Now, I can understand how uh, you would come to this if you believe what he says in the first quote, that there's no evidence of any kind of head covering issues going on at the time for men, but there is actually a lot of evidence. So here's someone who came and helped us out. Like he actually changed scholarship on this topic. Richard Oster in 1988, a very, for those who are in this area, study this area, it's a very well-known and well-respected paper. And there's been followed up by other research as well. In 1988, he wrote a paper Richard Oster called, When Men Wore Veils to Worship, The Historical Context of 1 Corinthians 11.4. I have a link to this paper. You could check it out yourself. Um, I think you'd have to purchase it, though. Of course, that's just how this paper stuff works. They want, they want their money, um, the publishers. So he was the first, though, to uh, focus on head coverings in Roman religious ritual, not just in public practice, but in religious rituals in particular as a key to understanding 1 Corinthians 11. And I think that was very smart. So. 
Corinth was, uh, and, and here he has like two sort of main points that we need to know to sort of wrap our heads around this idea. One, Corinth was primarily a Roman colony at this time, not a Greek city. And that's actually relevant for a lot of um, sort of side issues when it comes to people talking about Corinth. They'll try to explain 1 Corinthians 11 even or other things in Corinth, even, even introductions to the book of 1 Corinthians. You'll get people saying things like, um, oh, well, there were these 500 specific prostitutes of the specific cult going on in Corinth. And it's like, no, not at the time. That was Corinth before it became a Roman colony. So we, we don't want to muddy hundreds of years of history and smash them all together into one first century context. That's just confusing. So he just wants to point out it's a Roman colony at the time. Okay, that's his first point, and, and not therefore not primarily a Greek city. Not that there wasn't some mingling, but it was mostly Roman. And the second point is that Romans, since it was Roman, Romans had particular practices to do with head coverings for men and women during worship. And when you factor those in as the historical background, 1 Corinthians 11 makes a lot of sense. So they all wore coverings specifically, and I've mentioned this before, but now I'm going to show you the, the evidence for it, uh, specifically when doing sacrifices, when doing prophecy, or when doing prayer. That is like a type of you're leading the prayer. You're not just participating by sort of agreeing. And so those were the times when they would pull these things over their heads temporarily just during those moments. Let me give you some, some evidence for this. And here's where um, artwork evidence is going to come in and be in agreement, uh, <laughs> more obvious agreement with what I'm trying to say here, because I'm sort of combating it in a sense, or I should say interpreting it differently than some do uh, earlier on. Okay, so this is a whole new side of evidence um, that comes to light now. We want to look at artwork where a religious context is in view. Specifically, they're like, hey, here's a picture of someone doing a sacrifice. Here's a picture of someone leading a, a prayer thing or someone doing some kind of Roman cult behavior. And what do you know? They happen to be covered in their heads. So here we go. This is Augustus. He's a, a Gordon Fee said there's no evidence of this, but he wasn't looking at the religious context, right? So here's Augustus. This is like one of the Caesars, okay? And you can see he's got a head covering. I'll zoom in for you. And the head covering, like I mentioned before, it's just part of the toga and it's pulled over the back of the head. It's not even a separate piece of clothing. It's just part of the toga pulled over and you can still see his hair. It's just a ceremonial thing that he's pulled it over. Here's another picture of Augustus, different statue. And he's also, like the previous one, he's in a kind of religious context. So he's doing something like a sacrifice. He's Augustus, the, the, the emperor was seen as a religious figure, not just as a emperor. He was seen as like a, the, 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 ultimately they were end up being called the Pontifex Maximus, right? Like the, the high, the ultimate high priest. Uh, many, many years later, the, uh, the popes would claim this title for themselves, but uh, in Roman pagan religions, they were claiming it for the emperor. So here, there he is, this Pontifex Maximus. And then you've got, um, first century, uh, Oh, excuse me. This one is just a, uh, oh, it's another offering. And you have a goat that's about to be sacrificed. And the one who's sort of leading in, the, you know, being the priest figure here has the head covering on, at least part of the toga that's pulled over the head. Then we have another one. And this is a first century structure that shows the Roman royal family. And what are they doing? They're going to sacrifice. And where do you see the head covering? Right there on sort of the person who's officiating. Then we have another one. This is a Roman coin, and this is a first century Roman coin, so it fits our New Testament context. Note that there's a staff on the coin you see under the chin of the guy, and the staff marks it as a religious ritual context. That's the coin. It's got that context on it. Um, perhaps that's the same reason why on one of the coins, Livia had, her, had a covering on her head because she was still wearing one, at least in that religious context. There's actually a lot of other examples I could give of this kind of thing, uh, men and women, both wearing head coverings when they pray, prophesy, or sacrifice. It's not the whole audience. That, that's what in the Romans they would call the profani. These are like, they're profane, not, not meaning in a derogatory sense. They're like, the, they just watch, okay? Like their job is just to watch everything and not, not participate in the rituals. Um, but those who were doing the rituals, they would be wearing the head coverings uh, at least. So even in the artwork where perhaps, you know, we have other, debates about how that represents common practice, at least in this ritual stuff, it definitely confirms head coverings. So this isn't just an art. There's also textual evidence that comes in and supports this as well. Let me go back to Plutarch again. So here we go from Plutarch, that first century biographer who says, uh, why do Romans cover their heads when they worship the gods? 
But if they happen to be wearing the toga over their head when they meet someone worthy of honor, they uncover. Now he goes on to theorize, oh, he doesn't want, the, the gods might feel like you're honoring, a man is honoring another man as a god. So they pulled, the, he, he's guessing why they would uncover when they meet someone worthy of honor. Maybe not to keep, not to make the gods jealous. That's where he'll go on with that. But the point is that Plutarch, once again, is telling us what typical Roman practice is. And again, Plutarch, first century, well-traveled. He knew what he was talking about, about his own culture. When they worship the god, they, they cover their heads. Then we have uh, Elaine Fantham. She adds more Roman practice details. And here I'll share a quote from her where she says, on the other hand, the Romans themselves called the ancient form of bareheaded sacrifice made to Hercules at the Ara Maxima Greek style. So this is where Elaine Fantham is like, hey, um, the Romans actually had a term they used for those weird Greeks who didn't cover their heads when they did these sacrifices. They called it Greek style because it was Roman style to cover your head. More evidence for that. So the explanatory of the explanatory power of Oster's idea, Richard Oster's idea, that he first was the one to talk about it to my knowledge in 1980. And it's very strong. It really explains a lot about this First Corinthians context. We don't have to do what Gordon Fee did and say, whatever Paul's talking about with men covering their heads, I don't know what he's talking about. Don't worry about it. Like, it's just hypothetical. Let's just move on and focus on the women, which is, a, I think, a big mistake most egalitarians make. Uh, not all, perhaps, but I see it consistently. Um, rather, <clears throat> what we should do is take this explanatory power and say, hey, this changes your perspective of Rome, of the uh, the passage by bringing back in the masculine issues and showing that it's there's both genders have a problem at least some of the people have a problem in the context of that first century culture both genders do so um this is not just oster though i want to make sure people know this i'm not just quoting one random paper people do this all the time even on youtube especially they quote one random paper um and try to say that oh see that proves it all but rather, Oster's idea has been very, very well received across scholarship and even just Roman his, historian scholars who aren't even focused on biblical texts at all will speak very highly of his work and be like, wow, he was 20 years ahead of the scholarship of his time. And it's very well supported by extra other papers and other writings. Okay, so here is a big point that you can get from this idea. There is pretty much no way, in my opinion here, and I'll explain why, that, that the hair up view stands. We've already talked about how the hair up view has problems when it comes to the Greek terminology that's being used, how it has problems in a number of other ways. Um, but it, we have to add to it this, that the historical background of men using cloth coverings to cover their heads gives more evidence that the hair up view doesn't make any sense. There's just no reasonable way to say that Paul's talking about cloth coverings for men and hair being done up for women. He's using the same terms in the same context, and it has that same Roman religious um, issues. And, and, and uh, what's the term I'm looking for here? But but the the meeting of the Roman religious world with the Christian religious community and the issues of head coverings and how they had a public symbol of, of, of a woman being sort of modest and understanding gender roles, and then a worship setting where men and women would wear head coverings. And this explains why Paul wants to deal with some women who won't wear the head coverings, and he wants to deal with some men who are trying to wear them, copying Romans. He doesn't like that. He wants to keep the gender meaning of the head coverings, but not bring in those religious Roman practices. Pardon me. Um, okay, so here is a big point then in defense of the cloth covering view. If the covering is cloth when it relates to men, it's natural that it's cloth when it relates to women. And scholars like James Hurley and Philip Payne, who support the hair up view, they say 1 Corinthians 11 is not supporting a cloth covering view. They have a major problem here. Uh, Dr. Keener puts it this way, and here's an egalitarian who puts it this way and supports this cloth covering view. Um, he says, Hurley's position is problematic. As Fee points out, if an uncovered head simply means having her hair down, how is the man's, the man's not covering his head the opposite of this? It is thus clear that head coverings, not merely long hair, are in view. And this is probably one of the reasons uh, why people who promote a hair done up view, they tend to minimize the instructions to the men. Right? E even though Gordon Fee does as, as well, even though he would 
agree with me here, but that's that's the nature of this complicated argument. We're all going to find layers of agreement and disagreement with each other. You will find that with me. You'll be agree agreeing with me here and not there. Um, quoting someone doesn't mean you're endorsing their all their views, although plenty of people on YouTube think that's what it means. Sorry, I can't help you. Um, okay, so let's move forward then. That's the religious context. Pretty simple and pretty solid scholarly, and it forces the cloth view and as, as well as makes us understand why were some of the dudes in Corinth covering their heads in worship. Paul's like, hey, I get that you do that in your Roman cults, but don't do it here because because he, I'm just talking about the gender meaning of the head coverings, and I want to preserve gender roles. All right, let's look at the fifth issue here, the final issue when it comes to this historical background stuff. I've given you all the data where it's going to sort of um, bring it together. Which view <clears throat> makes the most sense of 1 Corinthians 11 as a whole? Well, I would say first, we want to acknowledge that 1 Corinthians 11 itself is historical evidence. It's not as though, and people do this all the time. It's subtle. They'll do it all the time, though. They will approach Plutarch like he's talking about ancient history and giving us information about ancient history. They'll approach you know, you name it, Josephus, um, all, all these other writers will be approached as though they give us his, historical information and co context for us. But they'll approach the Bible sometimes as though it doesn't weigh in on the ancient culture at all. And I think 1 Corinthians 11 is historical evidence. And 1 Corinthians 11, it implies that there is a general rule in all the churches that women are wearing head coverings, at least in worship, and men are not. And this is related to their gender roles and not just Roman ritual practices. I think that we should put this up there with Plutarch as evidence of at least a general practice, minimally, in worship settings. Whether it applies beyond that is another question. It also seems to imply that many in Corinth were doing this, right? The problem in Corinth isn't that Corinth as a church has thrown off the head covering practices. It seems as though most are doing it and a few aren't. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 11, he starts by saying, hey, you keep the traditions. And then he just goes on to explain and defend this tradition. Then at the end of the section of head coverings, and then at the end of the section, he's like, hey, um, you know, if anyone's contentious, you know, that whatever, they're on their own. And this, this is almost like a, a reassurance to the Corinthians who were generally holding this practice. Now, after the section, in verse 17, he goes on to say things that Corinth as a whole, the church largely was not doing well. And so why, why would verse 17, I'll, I'll show you that verse now. Verse 17, after he finishes the head covering section, he goes, but in giving this instruction, that is the one that follows below, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Right? Then he goes, for in the first place, when you come together, dot, 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 and they have bad communion practices, they're getting drunk and stuff, and they have division. Um, that is, chapter 11 starts with, hey, I praise you because you're keeping the traditions, which they're generally keeping this one. Then verse 17, he's like, eh, well, but, but these other ones you're not keeping widely speaking. Why do I say that? Because to understand the 1 Corinthians 11 uh, passage and how it relates to the culture of the time, you only need a small number of women who are not doing the head covering thing and a small number of men who are doing it. And then the entire passage has a historical context. And that's not hard to do, okay? That's easy to do both from the passage itself as well as the stuff we've learned from the, from the history of the time. So 1 Corinthians 11 gives us some historical evidence about head coverings. At least it seems to say, in worship, minimally, it was a typical practice that a few people re were rejecting. Men don't wear it, women do wear it. Um, in my notes, before I go on to conclusions, though, I want to just mention, I've got a few side issues. I just want to mention, you might be like, why didn't you deal with this, Mike? Chances are I didn't deal with an issue you're thinking of, because I'm mean, just saying, being honest here, is because it's probably a really fringe thought, and it doesn't enter into the wider discussion. I've mentioned a few of those and just point out, guys, these aren't really worth your time. Do some more research. But here are some conclusions. <clears throat> the cloth covering view absolutely fits 1 Corinthians 11. It makes way more sense than the hair done up view. It fits the Greek terms. It fits the logical flow of 1 Corinthians 11. And it fits the historical background. So it's cloth coverings are in view 100%, I believe. There's no reasonable doubt. Roman religious head covering practices tell us why. This thanks to Richard Oster and those who followed his work. Uh, some women were not covering their heads. And it tells us why some men were covering their heads. Roman religious, well, mostly Oster explains why men were. Um, but the, the the artwork that shows rich and affluent women not wearing coverings, that may explain why some women were not. So Paul's concern about headship then, it tells us why he opts for a, his male headship. <clears throat> he opts for a rule in this sort of amalgam. 
of rich, more influential women pushing for not heavy coverings amongst a culture that seems like it has them more generally. Um, and add on top another layer of confusion. You have men who are bringing Roman pagan practices of wearing head coverings in worship. And you have this question about what what do you go with? Like the religious issue or the gender role issue? And what do you do? Paul, he opts for doing this. I'm going to push for the rule that preserves gender relationships in a visible way that the culture as a whole will understand. Men should be men. Women should be women. This includes authority differences connected to gender most clearly in marriage. It's complementarian is what I'm saying. That's that's the main concern there. And I think that us seeing that concern is that with a clash of cultural changes and all this stuff going on, that what Christians can do when they're looking at all the cultural shifts going on with gender and all these things is simply say, Lord, I want to do the thing that preserves proper biblical creations order between men and women and their relationships amongst a culture that is losing that to some degree. I think this applies to our day very easily. And there'll be some application of this verse later on that, that might actually challenge some people. All right, listen, we're going to go on to the next spot, which is number uh, five, question number five, which is somewhere, somewhere in the world. No, that's question number eight. All right, here we go. What does Paul want men to do? Super easy to answer this question now. We've done all our homework already. He wants men to not wear head coverings, specifically when praying and prophesying, unlike the Romans did with their pagan rituals. But why he wants them to do it is what's really important, which is to maintain outward displays of masculinity and male headship. Now, those are fighting words in our culture. <laughs> those are fighting words in our culture for sure. Um, our culture is just wrong. And I mean, you hear this from me all the time because I'm teaching scripture and trying to think biblically about everything. It forces me to continually confront our culture and be like, yeah, you're just wildly wrong on this. That's the case here where the idea of masculinity, um, you know, at first it was, uh, you know, masculinity in our culture was not divorced from arrogance and pride, ego, cruelty, abuse. That's all part of masculinity. That was bad. Then as our culture grew and evolved and over time, it seems to me that it shifted to where we, we started separating. We were like, well, there's toxic masculinity and there's masculinity. And then it just became the same thing. Like all there is, is toxic masculinity. Like if you're masculine, it's toxic. And that's where we're at now. A lot of guys don't know how to be guys. Don't know how to be guys. Don't know what it means to be a guy. And don't see it as a noble and good thing, part of their calling to be masculine. And yet it is. It's a, it's a positive thing. It's a wonderful thing. And it's something that God wants to preserve. What does Paul want men to do? He wants them to act and look like men. Understanding their role, not the toxicity, the, the old school version of, of what was, you know, cruelty and arrogance and pride. And those are just avoid the sin parts, but be masculine. That's a healthy and wonderful thing something we should be doing. And then we can look at um, the comparison of this would be, say, the, an egalitarian interpretation like um, that moves away from this topic. So um, Gordon Fee turns Paul's orders to men into a hypothetical that has no real world application. That's what Gordon Fee does with his, because he's egalitarian, you have to do something with it. Another egalitarian, Philip Payne, makes it all about sexual sin. And it's all about men sexually being men, meaning their sexual partner is a woman. And that's that's kind of the whole meaning that's there. But Paul, I think, wants to push a lot more than that because he wants headship and not just you knowing who your partner is. So then we have the next issue, number six, which is what does Paul want women to do? What does Paul want women to do? And you're gonna you already know the answer. I'm gonna walk us through it because it kind of plus someone might just click onto this one question. So Paul wants women to wear head coverings, at least in Corinth, at least in the first century culture. We'll talk about whether it applies today much later in the video towards the end. So Paul wants them to wear them, especially when praying and prophesying. Okay, he doesn't actually say they need to wear it all the time, but during prayer and prophecy. Um, this is probably during at least their active portions of prayer and prophecy, minimally. Now it could easily extend further than that, but I'm saying you can't make it less than that. But why? Why does he want them to do this? And again, it's just probably covering something over the head. It's not like a full covering. It's maybe just covering the back of the head. It was a ceremonial thing, and it was not meant to hide the woman. That's important to understand. Uh, not because I'm trying to not offend the culture. I want us to understand scripture here. It wasn't about hiding the woman. It was a ceremonial thing that was about modesty and gender roles. 
So the, the, the important issue then is why. Why is this important? Okay, it's, it's one thing to say Paul wants you to do it, but understanding why is, is going to help us to get to the, what God's heart is for men and women in our relationships with each other. So many commentators add their own reasons here, right? Craig Keener is like, well, it's distractions, which we talked about that and some issues with that view. You know, women can create distractions because they're the glory of man, which would imply that we're supposed to be staring at men's faces because they're the glory of God, which, again, I don't think Dr. Keener would support. But once you put men and women together in your interpretation, you realize where the imbalances can be. Another was lust. Oh, well, women have to cover their, their heads because it, you know, it would stir up the lust of the, of the congregation members in their worship. Now, lust is never mentioned in the text, even though Paul's open about the, word, the issue of lust anytime he wants to talk about it. He's completely open and straightforward. So I don't see why we would add it into the text when it's not there, when Paul's perfectly willing to just say lust when he wants to deal with that issue. But it also creates other problems where we're going to um, overly put on women men that are like hypersensitive to lust issues, right? Like I can't, even, I can't even see a strand of her hair. <laughs> like that's okay. That's not on. That's not on her, man. Like <laughs> there's plenty of guys who are just oversensitive, and that's on you, gentlemen. Like to deal with that. Modesty is one thing, um, but but telling a woman she has to, like she can't show her ears or something. <laughs> um, yeah. So you see, that's a problem. And and more importantly, Paul just doesn't mention those issues. Um, yeah, we should, we should limit our reasons to the reasons Paul gives. Why does Paul want women to wear head coverings? He gives his reasons in the text. Let's not add our own distractions, lust, none of that. Headship, number one, right? Verse three, headship. I want you to understand that the head of, he goes on and says much, but the head, uh, the man, a man is the head of a woman, right? So headship, then creation's order. That doesn't mean every man is the head of every woman, by the way. As we've, I think I've discussed this earlier in the video. don't remember anymore. But every man is not the head of every woman. It bears reiterating. In fact, it's in the singular. Did you notice in verse 3? Let's look at it. In verse 3, it says, um, Christ is the head of every man. Every man bows to Christ. The man is the head of a woman. And this, I think, implies marriage as its primary context. But it implies something true about gender roles in general. But it doesn't make every man the head of every woman. Like every woman, a woman, you have to go around submitting to every guy in the world. This is not true. Otherwise, submit to your husbands. It doesn't even make sense. It just you just be submit to guys in general. Uh, why limit it? Um, and God is the head of Christ. So this is uh, this is the issue Paul gets at. Male headship, creation's order. When he talks about Adam and Eve, and the purpose, not only the order in which Adam and Eve were made, but the purpose for which they were made. Woman made for man. That that implies something about roles. And then three. Universal church custom at the time. That was the three reasons Paul uses. Now, two of those are still the case. The third one we need to talk about later. So let's look at question number seven. Now we're moving fast, although we're going to slow down a lot <laughs> later on. <clears throat> okay, what is Paul's point about the order and purpose in the creation of man and woman in verses eight and nine? This is, again, a hot debate issue. Um, one of the most important questions you can ask about this passage is this question right here. The two key issues as it relates to women in ministry are what is headship in verse three and what is verse um, eight and nine about this question, question number seven. So this is a huge, huge issue and it's where I think um, you don't see a tie between the two different sort of polarized sides, the egalitarians, the complementarians. You don't see a tie on this issue. I think this key issue is where egalitarian interpretations will demonstrably fail. And we're going to talk about those. I'll share with you different egalitarians, how they interpret verses eight and nine and why those things don't work. In my opinion, um, which obviously I think I'm right. You think you're right. Everybody thinks they're right. It's not wrong to think you're right. It's wrong to be arrogant about it. Hopefully I'm not that too much. All right. So this is a big issue and um, let's look at the verses themselves. When you're arbitrating, as you are, a debate like this, it's super important, I think, to stay very close to the text of Scripture. Because the longer a scholar or commentator talks, and the, and the longer you go without looking at the actual verses themselves, the more inclined you are to be pulled away from the text and not realize that your interpretation doesn't fit the verse anymore. So let's stay close to the verse here. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. 
Now, here's what I think the correct view is, and then I'll show you pushbacks against that view. There are two different truths in verses 8 and 9. One of them, verse 8, is that man is made from, or woman is made from man. That's, and, and it's, and it's, Paul highlights it because he could just say woman's made from man, but he highlights man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. So he wants to say this is true of woman, but not true of man. So God, when he made Adam and Eve, Adam is formed, Eve is pulled from a piece of Adam, God forms Eve, right? So a woman originates from man. The second truth, verse nine, and this will be a pretty big deal here, is indeed that man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. It's about a purpose statement. Man was not made for woman. That's, I mean, this is expressly what the scripture is teaching here. We need to deal with this and understand it. Paul is not sensitive to our modern um, ease, ease of being offended, even sometimes by true things. Like there's true things I can say about women that, that could be very offensive to everybody out there right now. Like if I say that women are weak compared to men, physically weak. Like that's a demonstrable fact of reality, but this is a highly offensive thing in our modern culture. And you keep watching TV shows and movies and everything where you have, you know, 112 pound woman beating up like a 250 pound man. And it's just like, guys, that's not very realistic. Um, I mean, you you should know this, but it's, it's, it's offensive to people. It's as though reality itself can be harmful. Um, but no, it's the denial of reality. It's, it's when I'm allergic to reality that there's the harm has already been done to me. <laughs> okay. That being said, um, here it's a purpose statement. And this is important because verse nine, when it talks about the purpose, man wasn't made for woman's sake, but woman for man's sake. That's huge because the Galatians generally will ignore verse nine or they'll somehow absorb it into verse eight so that there aren't really two different ideas here. It's just one idea. We've talked a bit about this. We're going to go into it in more detail right now. The nature of the two statements um, is that they're about the order of creation, um, right? The, the, the And I, I don't mean, well, one is about the literal chronological order of creation. The other one's about something else, about the ordering of creation that God has created one for the other. That's an interesting reality. They're both in the image of God, but there is still different purposes in the creation of men and women, according to scripture. That's consistent with my own understanding of Genesis 2. Again, I'll remind you, if you haven't seen it, go watch video number two in this series. The playlist is down below. That's where we go through Genesis and we look at chapters one, two, and three in particular. Um, now, what we need to know to understand this even better, and finally, my last point before I push back against everything I'm saying with the egalitarian views, is that seven, eight, nine, and 10 form a unit. And this unit offers um, application on the bookends, and then it offers the reasons for that application in the middle, verses eight and nine. So in verse seven, it says that man should wear a head covering. In verse 10, it shows that the woman should wear one. We'll talk about verse 10 later because others will say that's wrong, the wrong interpretation. And that that head covering is a symbol of authority. And in verse nine, it just gives the reasons, right? At the end of verse seven and through verses eight and nine. So this would be the Holy Spirit inspired interpretation of Genesis two not just a post-fall reality. It would be very complementarian. You, you couldn't be egalitarian and, and have that interpretation of that passage. So what is the egalitarian view instead of what I have said? And I'll try to leave this stuff up as long as I can so you can just keep comparing what I say to the text in front of you here. The egalitarian view of verse eight, they got a lot more options with verse eight, I'll tell you that, <laughs> than they do with verse nine. Uh, man is woman's source and therefore you should honor your source. Um, right? But... If that's the case, man, you know, doesn't originate from, but one from man. But then they say, but it's balanced out because verse 11 says, guess what? In 12, it shows that, that man and woman both originate from each other in different ways. Moms give birth to their baby boys. So there's origination on both sides and therefore it's egalitarian. Like you should just honor equally in all ways. And that's not, if you just read the passage carefully, that's not Paul's point. That's your point. It's not his point. Those are his words, but it's not his point if you just look at it carefully. So it's possible in a sense, but why then, and here's the pushback, why then is Paul asking women to wear head coverings and men not to? Think about it. If men and women are both each other's source in some significant way, and it's meant to prove egalitarianism is true, that there's no imbalance of authority between us, then why is it that men can't wear head coverings and women must wear head coverings and the verses eight and nine are reasons for that. 
if verse 11 and 12 make us both the sources of each other, why can't everybody wear a head covering or nobody? Because Paul's not trying to say what the egalitarians are trying to say with this passage. It's just the, it just seems to be the case. The problem with the egalitarian view of verse eight is that it is not that it affirms that man is the source of woman, though he's not her creator. Nobody would say that. He doesn't create her. Source and creation are not the same thing. The problem is that they do two things. They ignore that source seems to imply some degree of authority. And they ignore, or they fail to see, maybe I should say, that this is a, a, a complemented and, qual and qualified by verse 9. Right? Verse 8 is not the whole story. If you take verse 9 out, in verse 10 out in particular, then you get more of an egalitarian view. But if you look at verse 9 and you see this, verse 9 is telling you that there's another factor in addition to just being the source or the origin, right? Woman has her origination through man, but she's also made for man and man is not made for woman. That's a much stronger statement. That's a much harder statement for Galatians to deal with. And when you, when you take verse eight and you read it without verse nine, then it's easier to find that egalitarian view. I would say egalitarians uh, across the ones I've read have re regularly mishandled verse nine and I would share quotes with you, but it's difficult to share quotes because they normally ignore it. Most egalitarian commentaries I've read don't deal with verse nine at all. I mean, I just went to author after author finding the sections where they would deal with this and just didn't find anything about verse nine. Uh, now, it doesn't mean they have no views, but they're not expressing them in ways that we can deal with for the most part. But there are some who do talk about it. So I found three egalitarians who talk about verse 9, and I want to walk through their interpretations of verse 9, and we'll see um, what you think of those. So Philip Payne is one who does talk about it, and he says that woman is made for man, not man for woman, right, in verse 9. And that is, so he affirms that, at least the basic translation there is the same, but it's taken as an affirmation that women are designed to be the, the sexual counterpart to men. Think about that for a second. You're going to, if you don't already see the problem, you will in a moment. Okay. So let's look at a quote from him on this issue. Philip Payne says, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man to be his sexual partner. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man to be his sexual partner. So this is his paraphrase. His, not just a paraphrase, it's more of an expanded translation, right? He, he's adding his interpretation into the text just to make it clear. Now he doesn't explain it in a lot of detail, but, but here you have it right there. Verse 8 and 9 mean the same thing. Again, verse 9 gets absorbed into verse 8. But does this make sense? Uh, no, it, it, it forms a contradiction in the passage. Because if woman being made for man means that woman is man's sexual partner, then man not being made for woman, verse 9, it means he is not her proper sexual partner. It's impossible for this view to be correct. It creates an instantaneous contradiction in the very verse itself. The passage says man was not made for a woman. So if the sexual fit view is what you're going to hold, then, then you have to say that men are not sexually fit for women, which is demonstrably false. <laughs> so Paul's concern, as we've already seen, is not sexual intercourse. It's headship how it, and how that relates to gender roles and authority. He's trying to change the meaning of the passage, the focus of the passage onto sexual issues. Not that it has no application there, but it's certainly not the primary. Let's talk about Gordon Fee's view. Gordon Fee interprets verse 9 um, that women are created for men or the woman is created for the man as meaning that man needs her to fulfill his calling, which again, that's a very appealing uh, interpretation. We just want to know if it fits. He says, she is thus man's glory because she came from man and was created for him. She is not thereby subordinate to him, but necessary for him. Again, he's egalitarian, so he's, he has a denial. It doesn't mean she's subordinate. That's the one thing it doesn't mean. It just means she's necessary for him. He needs her. So again, the problem is that, and this happens over and over again, once you realize that Paul's talking about men, not just women, these egalitarian views start to fall apart and contradictions will surface. If Paul meant that the woman was needed for the man to fulfill his calling, then Paul would also be saying that woman does not need man to fulfill her calling. Right, this is like the old 1970s feminism, like women need uh, men like fish need a bicycle. <laughs> it would turn Paul into that kind of feminist. 
where he's like, men, men need women, but women don't need men. I mean, that's how you'd have to interpret verse 9. Let's remember, go back to the text. And that's how you'd have to interpret that. It just doesn't work. So Gordon Fee's view fails. Let's talk about Craig Keener's view, a third one who's who I could actually find someone talking at all about how they interpret verse 9 in detail. And there's very little information he gives on this passage. Um, I will share with you a quote from him, though. He never clearly interprets um, or speaks about verse 9 in, in the course of his uh, work that I've read anyways on the topic. Maybe he does somewhere, and I just haven't read it, so I'm not, I'm not speaking about all his work, but the books I read. Uh, but he does seem to show that his view, uh, he seems to show his view in this paraphrase of the passage. So like Payne, he kind of offers a, a paraphrase, his own translation of the, of the section. And let's read it. His version of these verses, verses 8 and 9. For the man did not come from the woman, but the woman from the man. For the man was not created through the woman, but rather the woman through the man. Now, what did I say about egalitarians uh, absorbing verse 9 into verse 8? This is, again, what's happening here. It, it's, it's just turning verse 9 into a reiteration. It says nothing new. This is very revealing, though. Um, he changes the phrase that you have in, say, the NASB, for the man's sake. Woman was created for the man's sake. Let's look at that. Just want to point it out. Right? But a woman was made for the man's sake. The man was not made for the woman's sake. He changes that phrase. Uh, I say changes. He has a different interpretation of it. And he interprets it instead as through, not for the person's sake, but through them. I checked 37 different translations. Now, when you check 37 English translations, you are going beyond the good ones. <laughs> you're, going, you're checking all the major good ones made by like serious scholarship and great wisdom and a lot of you know committee work and all this stuff. And you're going off into even more fringe ones. And none of them translate it that way. None of them translate it. Not only do they not specifically, I'm not trying to trick you. They don't use the phrase through the, the, the woman or through the man. They don't do anything even similar to that. Anything with that connotation. Nobody seems to do that. Translations almost always pick one of two options. Um, either they say man was not created for the woman, but the woman for man. So it's a purpose statement. Or the second option, like we have in the NASB, man was not created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Every translation I checked always has it as a purpose statement, not a method through woman, through man, but as a purpose statement. Every translation stacks up against this, this translation you're seeing from Dr. Keener. I think that's a significant pushback. Um, if you're the only one who translates it that way, um, then maybe there's a reason. Um, but he needs to translate it that way or some other way because verse 9 just pushes against the egalitarian view. Keener seems to see it not as a purpose statement, but as a statement merely repeating verse nine, verse 8. Excuse me. There's only one point in verses 8 and 9 on Keener's paraphrase, but there's actually two points when you look at the scripture itself. Why is all that so important? My point here is what I've, I've said earlier, egalitarians, to my knowledge, never do justice to verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 11 because it's so um, problematic for their perspective and I don't see any decent way out. I, don't, I, I think it's kind of a weak spot for them that it reveals there's, their interpretation is not working. So the main issue is this. Man wasn't made for a woman, but woman's made for a man. Here's, let's overview the debate now. Zoom out. Complementarian view of that, of that verse is this. Woman has a purpose directed toward helping man in a way that man does not towards woman. This is not based upon how you interpret the word ezer, helper, in, in uh, Genesis 2. It is not about that. That has nothing to do with it, so don't get tricked by the word help here. But, but woman, verse 9, has a purpose directed toward helping man in a way that man does not towards woman. There's a sense in which he is then leading. Right? This relates to authority, not every other way in which men and women are mutually dependent. Because they are mutually dependent, and that's how Paul balances that out in verses 11 and 12. Oh yeah, they're totally mutually dependent, but they have different roles. This is why the husband is the head of the wife. It's the reason why authority differences between men and women should be observed and reflected in the way we act, and for the Corinthians, in head coverings. What are the egalitarian alternatives to verse 9, to that interpretation of verse 9? Is that man needs woman's strength. I've read that 
But that's implying woman doesn't need man strength, so that doesn't work. That man can't do his job without woman, but that implies woman can do her job without man, including procreation. And that is an interpretation I see among some egalitarians. Or that man is incomplete without woman. Oh, I was just saying that man's incomplete without woman. But then that implies woman is complete without man. And that obviously would be false and not something that Paul's teaching. So none of the egalitarian alternatives make any sense of verse 9, right? Why is it that this leads to different head covering practices and not just wear whatever you want? Why is the, what about the fact that man is not whatever the woman is in verse 9 and in verse 8, but especially verse 9? And the nevertheless of verse 11, we haven't talked about um, this, however, or nevertheless that you get in different, uh, any translation I think that is handling it well, it shows that the idea of a man being dependent on woman is meant to counteract a over application of verses, well, all the stuff that's come prior, basically. The, the idea is here, if you interpret verse 9, 7, 8, 9, 10 as egalitarian, then verse 11 and 12 aren't a nevertheless anymore. And it breaks the logical flow of the passage. So I have not found a remotely good interpretation of verse 9 from an egalitarian view. And that's that's issue number seven. Those are the central issues. We dealt with all the central issues for understanding at least how it relates to women in ministry. Okay, some um, say that unanswered questions about 1 Corinthians 11 mean that you should take the whole, and I've heard this, you should take the whole passage and set it aside. Well, you still have questions. I haven't dealt with questions 8 through 14 yet, but you know it's a, you know it's not egalitarian, at least if you're following my logic and my understanding here, if I'm not grossly wrong. So unanswered questions don't mean we should cast the passage out. We should try to get the answers we can and at least deal with those. You can already see that this passage, whatever else it teaches, whether you, you should wear head coverings or not, it's teaching that basic complementarian views are correct. Let's look at question number eight. <clears throat> All right, question number eight is going to be, what does nature mean in verse 14? And while I'm interested in this, the argument for um, women in ministry issues and gender role issues does not depend on this or any of these following questions. So what does nature mean in verse eight? Paul writes, it's not verse eight, it's question eight. Verse 14, here we go. I'm with you, I'm here, I'm paying attention, sort of. Does not even nature itself teach you, nature, that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. This is Paul's final argument, and it's about nature, right? It really starts in verse 13, where he asks them, hey, think it through. Come on, think it through. Like, judge for yourself. Is it proper for her to pray uncovered? What about this? What about this nature thing? Um, a lot can hang on this word nature. There's basically two major options for how we interpret it. One of them is that nature refers to cultural norms. The word nature here um, is where Paul is simply saying, don't your cultural norms teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? And it's true that in that culture, they, they would have thought that. But is that what Paul means by nature? Um, the other one is that by nature, Paul means like God's proper, God-ordained order of things, the way things are without human intervention. So let's talk about this word a little bit. Um, and I think the answer is going to be pretty clear and strong on this. And I think a lot of people are going to... Um, going to have some pushback from me on this topic. And I fully understand I have it in my own heart as well. I just think that my heart must be wrong because it seems like this is what scripture is teaching. So the Greek is the word phusis. Phusis, and you could think of like the word physics, right? Like the physical things, phusis, right? This word phusis was used really frequently by philosophers of the time. And they used it the same way Paul does. Notice how he says, doesn't nature itself teach you? He's using nature as like a, a, a teacher to educate you about the rightness or wrongness of a behavior. Is a behavior morally good or bad? That's how the philosophers of Paul's time would use it all the time. It doesn't make him a philosopher. It's just that people would understand that language, that, that lingo. Even in arguments to prove things, they would say nature teaches you and then they would dot, dot, dot. I'll give you an example here. Um, they would usually argue from nature, right? Some reality found in the way things are without human intervention or manipulation to some moral behavior that they wanted people to do. This was a typical way of arguing. Epictetus follows this pattern. That's an ancient old dead Roman Greek guy. Okay, he says, 
um, that nature has given us hands. Therefore, when we have a cold, we should not just sniff the mucus all day. We should use our hands to wipe it away. <laughs> That's the epic Titus quote. Um, yeah, do you, you get the idea? Now, am I saying the Bible's teaching Epictetus is point? No, not at all. Epictetus has a way of arguing, though. He's like, hey, nature's done this, and therefore it's, it's wrong for you to sniff all day long and never wipe your face. Um, I wonder if he used a handkerchief or just his hand. Epictetus also argued that nature gave men faces that grow hair. Therefore, we ought to let that hair grow to distinguish in our daily lives between male and female. And uh, maybe that would help a lot of the confusion we have nowadays. Um, so he does recommend that as well. Am I saying that? I, I haven't said that. But you get the idea that they argued from nature for moral behavior. doesn't mean those arguments were always right, but it means people understood that they were not arguing from custom. Plutarch taught that nature, Fusus, gave mothers breast milk to teach them to nurse their babies. That this was like showing you that it's natural and therefore proper and good. So the point here is that Paul's probably using the term to refer to how women's hair naturally grows longer. Back to the text. Doesn't nature teach you, right? If a woman has long hair, it's her glory. Isn't that something nature teaches you? Well, he may just be talking about women's hair growing longer. And I did look into this. Um, women's hair, as I mentioned earlier, grows longer um, because it, it's it's got a longer life cycle than men's hair. Plus we have male pattern baldness and men just have thinner hair typically. So yeah, women's hair does tend to grow naturally longer than men. That is a nature-related thing that without human intervention. F.F. Bruce supports this in his First Corinthians, uh, First and Second Corinthians commentary on pages 107 and 108. You can check this out. He talks about the biological stuff and about <clears throat> uh, how the, this argument Fusus is used. I found him to be a useful resource, so you might check him out. In biology, right, men's hair grows um, faster, but then it dies quicker as well, and so women's hair grows longer. Could it instead mean custom though? What if what if we're interpreting it wrong? And when Paul says nature, Fusus in verse 14, he means custom and culture. It's actually, okay, you could say maybe, um, but a lot of times, and you have to catch this, when you guys read scholars especially, and they say, it's possible that, it could be that. This is sometimes scholar speak for, it's a very, very unlikely possibility, <laughs> but I want to promote it for the sake of what I'm doing right now. And it doesn't, it's not always that way, but yeah, maybe they could use the term to refer to custom and not things the way things naturally are, but it's actually really hard to find any examples of that. Craig Keener offers one example that might, and I mean might be an example, and he says it's arguable. And, and you can see that it's in my notes. I'll put it there. You could go check it out for yourself. Um, but rather there's a bunch of examples of Fusus being used from, from, uh, philosophers and other speakers in the same way Paul seems to be using it to refer to something beyond custom. So he says, although Craig Keener says, although nature might occasionally mean custom, might meaning long shot in this case, the term is normally used to mean the exact opposite of custom, that which is innate in the order of things which cannot be acquired. That's how it's typically used. We should probably take the word that way. I think we just don't like what it says. And so we want to take it like it's custom and we have to recognize our own temptations. Mine too. I'd like it if Paul was talking about custom here, but who am I? What, what is, does that even matter? I just need to recognize that bias and I need to be aware of it so it doesn't pull me down into an interpretation that's unlikely and ultimately wrong. So in short, here's my view of nature. Paul is using the term in the typical way that <clears throat> uh, philosophers did and people did back then to refer to how things are without human intervention as a moral guide to how things should be in human behaviors. This fits the lexical meaning of the term and the examples of it being used in similar ways, not just of the word phusis, but it being used to argue for behaviors, nature equals behavior, um, by other contemporaries of Paul. And Paul does that, it seems here. Um, you can see it in Numbers 6 as well. I'll skip that one though. You can check it on your own. But I grant that it was a Greek custom. Here's the, here's the caveat. It was a Greek custom and a Roman custom across the cultures for men to have short hair and women to have longer hair. That was normal. That was custom. But just because it was custom doesn't mean it's only custom. If you want to argue that this hair argument is, is only custom, you need more than saying it was custom, right? Because it's also custom not to murder people, but you can't therefore conclude it's only custom and that murder is just 
a, a cultural law or something like that. You, you need to go bigger than that. You need to think more carefully than that. So it was a Greek custom, but it doesn't mean Paul's arguing from custom because he doesn't use terms that relate to custom, right? He's arguing from nature. This view seems consistent with the way Paul is using the analogy in his arguments for head coverings. The fact that they already agreed on the issue of hair length is why Paul's argument works. And he's actually not arguing for head coverings initially. He argues from nature for hair length issues, which we'll talk about in a second, <laughs> uh, whether you need to apply that or not. And then he applies that to head coverings. So yeah, let's talk about that in a moment. All right, let me jump to an application type question, um, which is, does, does Paul see exceptions to the hair length rule? Um, it's important to realize there's different kinds of rules, right? There's rules where it's like, this is the way it always is, always, always, no matter what the situation is. And then there's, oh, this is the general rule, and there may be some exceptions to that rule. Um, and Paul, it seems, would have probably seen, it would have had to have seen exceptions to this hair length policy that he's got. And we'll talk much later about what, how it applies today, and I do think it applies today, actually. But we'll talk about that. Um, Nazarite vows are a biblical thing. God institutes them in the scriptures, specifically for the Jewish people, but it's not like nobody else could do that. Um, but Nazarite, not like Nazareth, Nazirite, N-A-Z-I-R, um, they would have their hair long and they could usually for a temporary period of time, they wouldn't grow their, they wouldn't cut their hair, excuse me. Samson, though, is an example in the book of Judges of a guy that was a Nazarite from birth to never cut his hair. He actually gets in trouble for cutting his hair. Obviously, there's exceptions to the general rule, if we take this as a general rule, about having long hair. Uh, the Nazarite hair was not to look good. Let me point this out. He would have endorsed someone having a Nazarite vow, but would Paul or or the Bible um, be suggesting that Samson was wearing his hair long to look pretty? Was he was he making it really pretty? You know, like no, I doubt it. I don't think that that was the agenda. It was not to make him look like a woman. That's important. It wasn't hair growing long to look feminine. It was hair growing long to set him apart from normal behavior, which is what the Nazarites would do in a number of ways. They would be set apart from normal behavior. They were set apart for purposes of God. That was the purpose. It wasn't for beauty. It wasn't to cause gender confusion. Um, he also let his beard grow. Consider this. He didn't cut his hair, right? It wasn't like he just had long hair and a clean shaven face, which I think we've seen um, Samson's like that in movies and TV, but they, he would have had a ridiculous long beard and it would not have been, he would not have looked like a girl. So yeah, he couldn't drink alcohol or have any vine products. Uh, he couldn't touch a dead body. These were all rules that he ended up breaking in the long run. So in addition to the biblical example of a Nazarite, we also have examples from philosophers. Um, philosophers often had long hair at the time. It was kind of like a typical thing for philosophers, but this was probably not to reject gender rules. This had some other purpose. It was only as a sign of their simple extra societal lifestyle, according to Craig Keener. So it was, this was, again, them being separate from society. So you, you see oddness of hair representing separateness from society, and that could be for a good purpose or a bad purpose. Um, so philosophers did. And there's a quote from Epictetus. We'll talk about this guy again, the epic guy, who shows how at least one writer, he handled exceptions from the rule about men and women, you know, not looking like each other, or basically, um, in particular, well, I'll read, I'll just read you the quote, and then we'll talk about it. So here's Epictetus, and he says, are you a woman or a man? A man, very well then, adorn as a man, not a woman. Woman is born smooth and dainty by nature. Fisse, that's, that's the word fusis, just a different, it basically is the same word, right? Same root word there. Um, and if she is very hairy, she is a prodigy and is exhibited at Rome among the prodigies. <laughs> That's so weird, but don't miss the point here that we're getting at. But for a man, not to be hairy is the same thing. And if by nature, nature, not, not by cutting his hair, but by nature, the way he's born, he has no hair, he's a prodigy. But if he cuts it out and plucks it out himself, what shall we make of him? Where shall we exhibit him and what notice shall we post? I will show you, we say to the audience, a man who wishes to be a woman rather than a man. So Epictetus offers us at least an awareness of one person's sensibilities about these types of things. His view was that if you had longer hair, shorter hair by nature, then more hair, less hair by nature, then that was just the way it was and there was no shame in it. But if it was because you were doing it to avoid gender distinctions, 
then it was a problem. So I'm not projecting Epictetus onto scripture. Usually you hear me quoting scripture here. I'm just quoting it to get historical background and to understand how people would view a rule and then view that there's outliers where the principles then come in to evaluate the outliers. The, the rule, men should look like men. Okay, but what if you have no choice? What if you just are a man who just looks feminine and you under no control of your own? Oh, well, that's not your fault. That's, you're not trying to look like a woman, right? You see how they would evaluate those types of things. So Craig Keener says, the fact that Paul must have been aware of exceptions to this custom of long hair and short hair would indicate that he speaks in a general sense of what is acceptable for usual societal norms in his day. But I would... I would have to say that Paul's word, eusophusis, though, says it's not only societal norms. It does seem to extend beyond that. Um, one of the takeaways I've got from 1 Corinthians 11 is that I think this hair length thing is actually a big deal and does apply even today. And I could be wrong, but I've got to be honest about what I think Scripture is saying, and I'll share with you those details. So let me talk briefly about how Paul uses the word phusis, because we talked about scholars, or uh, I'm sorry, um, philosophers, they'd argue with phusis, but now we're going to say, what about Paul? He uses the term nine times in his writings, and it's actually pretty consistent on how he uses it. Here's what Tom Schreiner says about this. <clears throat> and I'll read the text to you because it's pretty small. Tom Schreiner says, the word phusis in Paul often refers to what something is by virtue of creation. Thus, Paul can speak of Jews by nature. Jews by birth, humans are children of wrath by nature because they are born in sin. Natural branches are those that are originally part of a tree, while branches contrary to nature are grafted in, Romans 11. Romans 2.14 refers to Gentiles who do the law instinctively by nature. Romans 2.27 refers to Gentiles who are uncircumcised by nature, i.e. physically. Galatians 4.8 speaks of those who are not gods by nature. They are not really gods at all, these idols. <clears throat> of course, all the uses of phusis do not have precisely the same meaning. For example, Romans 1, 26 and 27 and 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 indicate how people should act due to the order intended by God from the beginning, while in Ephesians 2, 3, the focus is on what man is by nature, not what he should be. So from what I can tell, and I've, I've looked up every use of Paul, and we haven't really referenced here, but every use of Paul, eight other times he uses phusis outside of this 1 Corinthians passage. And this is the takeaway. Paul never once uses it to mean custom. Never. He uses it many, many times, never once uses it to refer to custom. It seems as though the deck is stacked in a way that we have to say Paul's talking about some moral obligation relating to hair length that comes from the way that God has made male and female. Now, how long is too long and how long? It, well, that he doesn't even discuss. What is short? Well, that's going to be, in a sense, it's going to be subjective depending on what culture you're in. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, Dr. Keener says that we know one thing regardless of whether Paul was tying the practice to nature or custom. So whether you agree with me on that or not, that's fine. I don't care if you agree with me. But I do hope that you are more informed to be more biblical, biblical in your thinking. Um, he says, but in either case, whether it's nature or custom, Paul would seem to be making an argument that addresses symbolic gender distinctions and requiring men and women to recognize those differences between them. We would agree with that. Uh, I think that where I would disagree with Keener is what those distinctions, what those symbols symbolize. They don't just symbolize different genders. They symbolize differences in genders related to roles. And this is pretty countercultural for today. I'll reiterate this again. Christians, right? There's non, there's going to be some non-believer watching this video and you're, I don't know, I don't know how you're taking or thinking all this stuff. Just know that we, we, there's those of us who take the Bible seriously. Um, but Christians, Men, you should look like men. This doesn't mean you look like these overblown, exaggerated, obnoxious examples. No, it means you look like men as in not like women. Women, you should look like women and not like men. And the trend of, of, of androgyny is not a healthy one. Now, you may have just been born looking more like people will just naturally go, like, I can't tell if that's a guy or girl. But are you feeding into that by doing things that are outwardly, outward expressions that are feminine while you're actually a man or outward expressions that are masculine for no reason, while you're outwardly, you're actually a woman. And so what it, we're suggesting is let your, the Bible's saying here, I think, is let your outward expressions refer to your actual biological gender. That's a healthy thing that God actually delights in. Very counterculture, but that's because our culture is 
foolish and harmful to itself. <clears throat> so Paul's making an analogy then. In this ultimate passage, when he has the whole nature thing, he's making an analogy from natural gender distinctions, the way God designed men and women differently. You can see that visual gender distinctions are a good thing. It's not Paul's only reason for why he argues for head coverings. It's just one analogy that helps his point. He's he's um, not trying to convince the Corinthians, this is interesting, that their hair length matters. He's assuming they already believe that. He wants to use that fact to argue for head coverings for men and not, or for women and not for men. Another commenter, commenter uh, named Watson put it this way. I think he has a great little summary of Paul's nature argument. In seeking to impose this extra covering on women, but not on men, Paul is following the example of nature itself, which has similarly seen fit to provide women with an extra covering, right? More hair, longer hair. I almost put this issue in the central issues category because it's central to, say, Philip Payne's case, um, but it's only central to his case, and his case falls on other issues, I think. And so it's not central to anybody else's perspectives. Um, so I just put it where I did. Let's look at Nueve, number nine. Is this passage about men and women and men? Here we go. Uh, Oh, hold on, hold on. I hit a button. There we go. <laughs> is this passage about women and men or is it about husbands and wives? Not a central issue, but an issue we care about. Because if you say it's just about husbands and wives, does that mean then that say, however you apply this, is it irrelevant if you're single or divorced or a widow or widower, right? Is, is it just not apply in those situations? Now I'm slightly on the fence on this, although I do have a conclusion I'll, I'll share with you, but more importantly, I'll share with you how I got there. Uh, Greek uses the same word for woman and wife and the same word for man and husband. Um, they have other words that refer to male or female that don't refer to a wife or husband. But here in this passage, it's the word that could be used for either or. And so you have to look at the context to figure out which one is, is being indicated. The pro-woman view <clears throat> the view that this is about women and not wives, men and not husbands, is, um, you know, on that side is the example of man coming from woman in birth. That's in verse uh, 12. It shows that man comes from woman in birth. I mean, well, that would imply that more than marriage is in view here because man here, husbands don't come from their wives. Like my, my wife is not my mom. <laughs> okay. So that would imply that there's, this is not just between husbands and wives. Um, also pro woman is that man and woman are terms that are often used very broadly, unless context gives you a reason to think they're referring to husbands and wives. So a default position could be, Hey, when you have a man or woman discussed, you assume it's the broadest sense, unless context forces you a more narrow view of say husband or wife. Um, the pro wife view, right? The idea that it's about wives or about husbands and wives is one that a woman, a woman is the glory of man. That's one of the arguments in there. Woman is the glory of man. Um, and that's especially true in a marriage relationship. I mean, I can't go up to some random woman out there that I don't know and be like, hey, hey, Betty, you're my glory. <laughs> what does that mean? She's not my glory. Like, but you could, I could look at my wife and say, look, there's the glory. There's, there's my glory, right? One in whom I'm glorying. There, there's, there's an idea um, that at least some would suggest. And so, I mean, yeah, that, that implies something. Perhaps another point in favor of the wife view is <clears throat> the example of Adam and Eve is an example of the ultimate male female, but it's also the example of man and woman married. Adam and Eve are an example of a married couple as as as, as much as anything else, right? And and they're used um, in the discussion of marriage, right? When when Paul talks about marriage as well, and so yeah, that that seems to imply perhaps that it's a marriage relationship. So the the man and woman in First Corinthians eleven are husband and wife. In Ephesians, Paul specifically says that a husband is the head of his wife. This is to me is a really big point. It's a strong point towards the wife-husband view. When Paul says in verse three of 1 Corinthians 11, a man is the head of a woman, and he makes it singular, not plural. It's one man that's the head of one woman. In Ephesians, he makes it clear that this is a husband who's the head of his wife. That's a marriage relationship. It's very difficult to get past this one, in my opinion. Men who are listening now, let me ask you this. Are you the head of my wife? We would we would laugh at you. She would laugh at you. If you walked up to her and were like, hey, woman, I am your head. 
She would laugh at you, and rightly so. She's not violating scripture here. She just understands that there's only one. She, she doesn't have, you know, billions of heads, right? So there's just one. And um, yeah, so th th that's, that's a pretty big deal. It's a particular relationship of the husband and wife, this headship thing, and that's the foundation of the whole passage, is headship. So yeah, this looks like a husband-wife thing in that respect. Therefore, you could say Paul's other teaching on marriage in Ephesians 5, it implies that the headship issue in particular makes this a marriage passage. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, um, yeah, headship, I already said that. Okay, but there is a middle ground. Like you might be like, well, Mike, you know, I'm, 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 I like you feel like the pro-husband-wife thing feels like a strong case. But again, how do you get around the fact that man comes from woman? That's obviously not about, that's about motherhood. That's not about marriage. So what is, you know, how do you get past that? Well, I'm going to suggest there's a middle ground. And this is kind of where I sit. Um, these things are true of men and women in a broad and general sense. A man is the head of a woman in a broad and general sense. But who's the head of that particular woman? Only her husband, if she's married. If she's not married, she doesn't have a head in that sense. Now, maybe if she's in her in her father's household, she's underneath his authority there still, right? But what if she's on her own? She, or she's a widow. She's on her own. She has her. She, she doesn't have a head in that sense, right? She's the one making those uh, decisions without that person, without someone else in that role. Um, so these things are true of men and women in a broad and general sense, but it's most manifestly applicable in marriage. And this is the middle ground. If you see the passage as more fluid, as not clearly saying I only apply to ma married women and men, or I apply to everybody, it might be that it primarily applies to marriage and the headship issue that's there. But because marriage is a typical and normal thing for most humans and that they should pursue, therefore the rule applies as a general rule because it's a general rule to support the institution of marriage. Does that make sense? That's kind of the middle ground. Um, it's true in a broad, broadly general way, but it's manifestly true in a particular way in marriage. Um, this would mean that 1 Corinthians 11 can be speaking in both senses, husbands, wives, men and women, but the application is most present in marriage. Would that mean that Paul wouldn't care if a single woman had her hair covered or not in, first, in the first century? I don't know. Um, perhaps he would, because the broader sense of headship, while not thinking that this uh, makes every man her head, is still present. Maybe her wearing the covering is just observing the general rule of headship, even though she's not proclaiming any particular man as her head. That may, that may well be the case. I would, I would lean that way personally. All right, on to question number 10. And this one is about how is the woman the glory of man and man the glory of God? And what about the image language in verse 7? I talked about this briefly <clears throat> earlier on. Now we're going to get into it in a bit more detail. So 1 Corinthians 11 verses 7 through 9 get in, into this conundrum <laughs> where we're going to try to understand it. Um, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. This is meant to be some kind of a counterpoint between the two, some difference, right? So what, what are we to do with this? The first thing to notice is this is a creational difference between man and woman. It's not just a cultural thing. Um, <clears throat> this is clear. I mean, it's, it, God made man in his image. That's not cultural <laughs> by any stretch. And neither is it cultural, therefore, that woman is the glory of man. This is something that, that has part of God's design. We want to, we want to understand that. Um, it's a reason why Paul wants men to avoid head coverings and he wants women to use them, at least in the worship context, at least for the first century. And it's connected to verse 9 and the two statements that woman was made for man and from man in verses 8 and 9. So this is, <clears throat> again, I mean, if you're complementarian, <clears throat> this sits easily at home with your views, even if you still have some questions about how to understand it. If you're egalitarian, this, this whole thing becomes, I think, pretty problematic. But we're going to talk about some of the different perspectives people have on how to understand this idea. Here's the questions I want to answer about it, though. I don't need to know what covering is in, in view here. We've already got that, right? It's cloth coverings. Um, here's the questions I want to know about this glory issue. Put them on your screen. How is man the glory of God in a way different from woman? Like, what, what is that exactly? What's going on there? Uh, number two, how is woman the glory of man? That's an interesting concept. What does that mean? And three, how does that relate to the head covering issue? Right, Because verse 6 and verse 7, um, they, they talk about this as well as verse 10, which I don't have on your screen there. 
they're speaking of these, this is all related to the head covering issue. And then four, isn't woman in the image of God too? We'll talk about that as well. I briefly have mentioned this, so you may already feel like you have the answer and that's fine. You can skip ahead if you want. That's why we got timestamps. So let's do the last one first. Uh, isn't woman in the image of God too? <laughs> I'll start with question four because I feel like it. So this goes back to the previous explanation and examination of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I've done it already in, in video number two in this series, and I've briefly mentioned some of it earlier on, but there are two different ways of looking at the roles of humans. This is how I think we can fundamentally frame our understanding of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. There's two different ways of looking at the roles of humans in relationship to creation and in relationship to each other. In relationship to creation, we're all... Uh, we have dominion, we stand as God's image bearers, men and, men and women together, and we have full authority over all of creation. And nothing should diminish a woman's authority over all of creation. But all of creation here is not inclusive of other humans. And so we have to have a second perspective to look at our relationship with other people, like say husbands and wives. It's just like you have a, one relationship with your pets and you have a different relationship with your spouse, right? These are different relationships. So Genesis 1 gives us the relationship of um, creation and humans, and also our relationship with God, that we're all image bearers, but that's Genesis 1. Let's look at Genesis 1 briefly. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them, right, that's male and female, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Again, this is clearly women are told to subdue the earth as well, not just men. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky. This is something that he has told to men and women as he's made the male and female in his own image. And this is our relationship to creation. So man and woman are in God's image, and man and woman both have dominion over creation. Genesis 2 and 3, though, gives us a new perspective. Genesis 1, our relationship with creation. Genesis 2 and 3, our relationship with each other. That's a big primary difference between these two uh, creation-related, three re creation-related chapters. One, well, two creation, one the fall. So here, let me put something on your screen. This is my summary of what I went through when I went through Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in detail. And I'll just bring the summary here, and you can look at the video if you want. But it's relevant for understanding 1 Corinthians here. So I'm going to talk about it. Women, like men, are made in God's image. Genesis chapter 1. Women have authority to subdue creation, just as men do, and should not be kept from exercising dominion in relation to creation. You can't do this. You can't do that because you're a woman. Well, like, Is it related to her ruling creation? Because she can do that. Um, so many egalitarians see this as evidence that in male-female relationships, there isn't any role differences related to authority, but it's not talking about man and woman's relationships to each other. It's talking about man and woman's relationship to creation. So then we get to Genesis 2, where we have man and woman's relationship, particularly in marriage. Adam is formed first. These are reasons to see there's a difference in our roles, right? And the New Testament support for Adam being made first, implying difference in roles. Well, that's in 1 Timothy. We'll talk about that in two videos from now. Uh, Eve is made for Adam. <clears throat> There's New Testament support for this in the passage we're in today. Adam names Eve. He's the one who names her. Adam, not Eve, is given commands from God that he must relay to Eve. Adam is the first one approached after the fall to give account, even though Eve was actually the first one who sinned. But Adam's the more responsible party for the both of them. That implies something. And Adam's curse, the curse that God gives, you know, related to Adam in particular, is on all of mankind and all the earth Whereas the curse that God gives towards Eve is just in relation to women, implying there's a greater representation of all mankind amongst men than there is amongst women. There's New Testament support for this in those two verses uh, I, I have up there in the video. So Genesis 3, <clears throat> when you get to Genesis 3, we get the idea of the curse. And the thing about the curse is it does not initiate role distinctions. It doesn't create role distinctions like many egalitarians are going to suggest. It merely makes them more difficult and more harmful, right? It brings difficulty to them. Just like Adam was already a farmer, the thorns and thistles made it made it harder. So Adam and Eve already have role distinctions, and the fall is going to make that more difficult. So my conclusions from Genesis 1 through 3 are 
Well, I think they're right there. So Paul's not denying that women are in God's image because this is clearly taught in Genesis 1. Paul also affirms that men and women are both being conformed to the image of Christ and that we're all sons and heirs in Christ. So from beginning of creation, we're in God's image and we're being conformed into the image of Christ, both men and women. So therefore, like, yeah, this passage, 1 Corinthians 7 or 11 verses uh, 7 through 9, I think it was, or now the numbers are escaping me. These verses are not saying women are not in God's image. There's three lines of argument I've given to try to demonstrate that. And it doesn't expressly say that either. Um, so now let's tackle questions one and two on understanding this section. How is man in the glory of, of God in a way different than woman? And two, how is woman the glory of man? Because here, I, I, you know, this is where I get, I get super interested because I find this to be kind of like um, fun <laughs> to see how different people will interpret this word glory. And my big issue is going to be this, and I want you to be aware of it. As we've seen consistently with egalitarian interpretations, they will take the same term and interpret, interpret it in very different ways. One way when it applies to men, one way when it applies to women, because I think they're kind of breaking the meaning of the passage. So Craig Keener, when it says that man is in the glory of God, is the glory of God, he doesn't speak very much of this. So I don't have a lot of data on it, even though he has a whole big section where he talks about this passage. When it says woman is the glory of man, he interprets this to mean that woman is man's likeness. He interpre interprets glory as a euphemism for likeness or image. And so her behavior, his interpretation is her behavior reflects on the reputation of her husband. So woman being the glory of man is that her behavior reflects her husband. But this is, this is okay, part of, part of me says, I, I guess that kind of works. It seems like it's diminishing the term image and the idea of glory a little bit, but it could work. But how then is the man in the likeness of God in a way a woman is not? On Craig Keener's view, I, if you wanted to be consistent anyways, I think you'd have to say that man's behavior reflects on God in a way that woman's behavior does not. And I mean, that could only be true if you want to say that man is in a much higher authority or representation role of God than woman is. And I, I think that the egalitarians are not going to want to say either of those things. So that seems to be a problematic interpretation. Uh, Gordon Fee has a different view. And it's <clears throat> interesting. He says that man is in the image or man is the glory of God in the sense of his fatherliness, right? Women aren't fathers, but men are. And so here's a distinctive that relates men to God in a unique way. Right? God the Father, well, men can be fathers. Then does he does he play fair though? <laughs> when it comes to a woman being in the being the glory of man, he says that woman is man's glory in the sense that man is incomplete without her. Let me read a quote to you. He says, His concern is with the woman's being man's glory, the one without whom he is not complete. So Gordon Fee takes glory when it refers to man as re referencing fatherliness. But glory, when it refers to woman, showing that man is incomplete without woman. Now here's a, obviously there's are two different meanings of the same word in the same context, which is always a problem. Um, but there's another problem. If glory refers to the man being incomplete without the woman, then we should be able to interpret it with the same meaning when it's used in the same section, when it says that like these things are not equally true the other way around. So it would imply that woman is, is complete without man. Again, some feminists would be hooting and hollering, but that's not certainly a biblical idea. If woman's the glory of man, and that means he's incomplete without her, then man is the glory of God, would also mean that God is what without man? Incomplete without man. Yeah, because you can't interpret the, t the word that way and be fair with it. You have to have different meanings for the same word in the same context. Uh, Gordon Fee says the following. What, what was that? Did I have something to share with you there? I don't really know what that was for. I'll just move. Oh, no, that is it. Okay. So Gordon Fee says, uh, she is not thereby subordinate to him, but necessary for him. She exists to his honor as the one who, having come from the man, is the one companion suitable to him so that he might be complete and that together they might form humanity. Now, much of what he's saying there is true. The question is, is it, I mean, not, maybe not the subordinate part, but um, yes, woman is necessary for man. Um, yes, you, you, men are not complete without women, and together we can form humanity. That's all true. 
The question is, is that what the passage is saying in these, in these verses? Let's put it on your screen here and we'll talk a little bit about it. It's difficult to see how he concluded these two things in his quote, that she's not subordinate to him based upon these, these differences in these verses. He doesn't give any reason for that. He just says she's not. It's just kind of a proclamation. Number two, she's necessary for him. Where in this section does it actually say the woman is necessary for the man? That's what's meant by glory. Um, no, um, it's not there. There's nothing in the passage that says ne necessity, and it would imply that man is necessary for God, which doesn't make any sense. Man's not necessary for God because he says glory. Also, it breaks the nevertheless or the however of verse 11, because verse 11 talks about necessity. Man is not independent of the woman. We need each other, nor is woman independent of the man, right? We, we need each other. Necessity is, uh, is brought up in verse 11 as a new idea to counteract a misinterpretation of what he already said. So he's not going to be like, I'm saying women and men are necessary. However, they're both necessary. Like that, that wouldn't make sense. It would break the logic. So we can agree with Gordon Fee, right? That man needs woman, but we can't agree that this is what is meant by the phrase, woman is the glory of man. Okay. It might seem like I'm beating a bit of a dead horse here, but um, I need to point out the issues with Fee's use of the term glory. Um, we're seeing this consistently across Craig Keener, Philip Payne, Gordon Fee, uh, all guys who I would say I love and care for as my brothers in Christ, but we're all, we all disagree. We can't all be right. Like they're going to say I'm wrong as well. No offense to that, but let's talk about the reasons why I would think that, right? Um, <clears throat> all three of these guys will interpret this, the same terms in the same context with very different meanings. And he's doing this again with the term glory. Gordon Fee has two very different meanings of the word glory, depending on which sex he's talking about. If it's man, he's God's glory because he represents God's fatherhood. If it's woman, she's man's glory not because she represents masculinity or something, but because she because man needs woman. But if you took man being God's glory to refer to fatherhood, it would imply that woman is not man's glory because she's a mother, right? Not a father. It just doesn't follow logically. Also, his view of glory depends on substituting <clears throat> Paul's reasons for why a woman is man's glory, man from woman and, or excuse me, uh, woman is made from man and for man, those two reasons in verses eight and nine. He substitutes that for Paul's qualifiers in verses 11 and 12 after concluding that a woman is man's glory. That man needs woman later on, he says, because he's born from her. I think that there should not be two radically different meanings of the same word glory in our interpretation of verse 9. And that's going to break, um, from what I can tell, it's going to damage the egalitarian perspective, at least the ones that I've heard. So what... What is left if necessity is taken off the table? Because Gordon Fee says it's not about subordination, right? It's about necessity. In that quote I share with you, I'll put it back up in case I've lost anybody. Boom. What is left if you take necessity off the table as the meaning for glory? Subordination? Representation? If you take either of those ideas, then it's going to speak complementarian things that do have something to do with what he calls subordination. Um, uh, but I would use different terms because I think people people get confused about what you're saying, which is why complementarianism is careful so that we don't create those confusions. Okay, now we're going to talk about Philip Payne's view of gl this word glory. And again, we're going to see it doesn't fit. When glory refers to man, glory refers to woman is like two radically different meanings. And that is, of course, an Achilles heel amongst many egalitarian views. So Philip Payne's view can be a little bit fuzzy. He says two kind of different things. Here's the first one. Men wearing effeminate hair were deliberately making their hair look like a woman's hair, thus making themselves into the image or likeness of a woman. Paul reminds these men that bearing the image of God obliges them to accept themselves as the men that God made them to be. This brings glory to God, whereas effeminate hair brings disgrace. So man here is the glory of God primarily in that he's not in the likeness of woman. I'm not sure how else to put that. It, the, the, logics, the whole logic of it seems a little fuzzy to me. But for this reason, he shouldn't have a woman's hair. He shouldn't look like a woman. The problem here is paralleling that with women being the glory of man. Paul uses the same terminology, seems to be implying similar things. By that logic, a woman should try to look like a man because she is the man's glory right, by the logic that you see in front of you. So that's going to be a problem. Again, we have unfair standards for these two different genders. 
Um, pain also treats man as the glory of God. Um, instead of it being about how man is the glory of God, it's it really just means man is not like woman, right? It relates to man and woman, not man and God in that sense. So that's a little fuzzy. But the next quote from Payne, I think, is very revealing. Here's another way he takes glory. And I'm not sure if these are consistent ways or not. It's, I'm genuinely a little confused by it. But he says, Paul adds that man is the glory of God, for man is the reflection of God. Consequently, man should reflect the desire of the creator. Effeminate hair, however, repudiates the purpose of the creator and so brings disgrace on man and on God, his head, his source. So he changes glory to desire. Man is the glory of God and therefore he should reflect he should reflect the desire of God. But if that's true, then why doesn't Philip Payne think that woman being the glory of man means that she should reflect the desire of man? Because he just won't. <laughs> and so I don't think that's the right interpretation. What I'm saying is if that is your view of, of man and, and the, being the glory of God, you would become complementarian or patriarchalist by that logic. But he's just breaking the rules of interpretation because we're going to just interpret two things, total, the same things different ways. So, and isn't woman supposed to reflect God's desire too? Like it, Anyway, it just gets confusing. So Philip Payne's view on women being the glory of man, he spends a little more time on and it's a little more clear, I think. Here it is. The glory of someone is the person in whom he glories. As the man glories over the woman in Genesis 2.23... Right? Behold, this is woman. Um, woman is depicted as the crowning glory of creation made specifically to be man's partner. Most men would agree that of all creation, woman is the most beautiful. And I would I would agree with that. Last part, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a man, of course. I would agree with that. Uh, does that mean that man is the one God glories over more than woman? You see where it breaks is that Paul, he he doesn't give you the out of these egalitarian interpretations because he keeps making everything uh, you know, equal between men and women. If woman being the glory of man means that woman is the one man delights in the most, then man being the glory of God, males in particular, what does that mean? That would mean that God delights in men more than women and finds them more beautiful than women. By this logic, that's what it would mean. But instead we have just completely different interpretations for the same term in the same context because if you interpret it the same way, it's going to push these complementarian views that are not going to work, at least for some people. Payne also sees uh, an element in this passage about intercourse, about sexuality, because again, he sees a lot of sex-related content issues in this passage. Uh, Paul's appeal to woman as the glory of man, he says, affirms woman as the proper sexual partner for man. <clears throat> now you see the problem, right? You can't apply this to man being the glory of God. Like it's, it's, it's blasphemous to even speak these things. If glory means proper sexual partner, then it breaks the passage. Like it doesn't work anymore. You cannot say that man is the glory of God with that interpretation of glory. Um, no. So what are, what's a complementarian view? I think Tom Schreiner interprets glory the same both times. And that's what we need to do. We need an interpretation that sees glory consistently and not wildly different meanings of the same thing in the same context. So Tom Schreiner interprets glory the same way both times. And I've really appreciated Tom Schreiner's work on this on this whole subject in general. He's a great resource for you. And he backs up its meaning by Paul's only other use of glory in 1 Corinthians 11. Catch that? He connects this to how Paul uses glory other in another place in the same chapter so that it means the same thing three times in a row, which is what we call good interpretation, you know, for the, for the most part. It doesn't always have to be that way, but it's a good good way to start. Okay, so what is Paul's point here? Tom Schreiner says, Since woman came from man, she was meant to be his glory, i.e. she should honor him. That honor is the meaning of the glory that, excuse me, let me, let me start that again. That honor is the meaning of the glory is suggested also by verse 14 and 15. Paul says that long hair is a woman's glory in verse 15. Conversely, he says that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. It is clear that these two verses function as a contrast. It is glorious for a woman to have long hair, but dishonorable for a man. You see how glory and honor are connected. 
and Tom Schreiner goes on, from the contrast between the words dishonor and glory, we can conclude that another way of translating glory in verse 15 would be with the word honor. Paul's point is that one should always honor and respect the source from which one came. And woman honors man by wearing a head covering, thereby showing that man is the head, i.e. the authority. I think that's a consistent view. It takes it, the word um, glory and interprets it the same way in both of its uses in verse 9, as well as the same way in verse 15. And so we have great consistency in interpretation. It's consistent with the meaning of head or kephale in verse 3. It's also consistent, I don't know how many fingers I'm putting up here, and I don't know why, but it's consistent with the two reasons Paul gives to explain why a woman is man's glory, because she was made from him and for him. Those fingers actually had a reason. So, good consistency there. Glory in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9. Remember, stay close to the text. There we are. Glory. I guess it's seven and eight. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, numbers. Um, it refers to the honor you bring your metaphorical head. That's what the glory refers to. It's connected to headship and it makes the passage very consistent. God is the head of Christ. Christ glorified the Father, read the Gospel of John, through behaving in ways that followed the Father's lead. That's consistent in the Gospel, that's how he brought him glory. Because God the Father is the head of Christ. Right? Back to verse 3. Remember, these are all connected. It's one idea. Paul's got a consistent thing he's teaching here. It's not all these wild, like, running all over the place things. Christ, and um, who is also called God later in the passage, is a deity of Christ thing going on there. He is the head of every man. And man glorifies Christ through what? Behaving in ways that follow Christ's leadership. That's how you bring him glory and honor. And man is the head of woman. And it's particularly a wife glorifies her husband or brings him honor in a, in a pro positive way, not like an idolatrous way, by behaving in ways that follow his leadership. That seems to be the teaching of scripture here. And um, I realize how uncomfortable it is to our culture and our society, even maybe to me in some ways. And I just recognize, like I'm hum humble enough, forgive me, it sounds arrogant to say this, but I'm being humble enough, not that I'm uniquely humble here, but to recognize that when I don't vibe with scripture, it's my vibes that are wrong. I need to change my attitude and I need to be able to not only accept these gender things that the Bible is telling me, but celebrate them as wonderful. And that's what head coverings do. They, at the time, they were celebrating these things as good and proper and endorsed, not just grudgingly accepted because I guess I have to because I'm a Christian, but something wonderful that God has given us that we should celebrate. Until we celebrate gender differences the way that the world celebrates gender transitions, we are not actually doing justice to what God has given us in the order of man and woman. So our culture largely hates and absolutely despises this, um, but maybe that's why it's written here. Christians have to go follow the lead of scripture and support it <clears throat> and even celebrate it, I believe. So egalitarians can try to get away from the authority implications of the word glory, but I think only if they... Um, have to have to reject the headship issues in verse three, and they all have to then come up with different meanings for the same word in the same context. That's a problem. I hope you can see why I don't include this though as a central issue, even though this clearly seems to be teaching like complementarian things, and it, it it weighs in on central topics, but it's not central because our view of this idea of headship and and um, glory and all that in verses seven through nine or uh, six through seven, rather, <laughs> those verses, that's going to come back to what we already believe about what verse three means when it says kephale or head. Man is the head of a woman. And how we interpret the phrase neither in verse nine, neither it was man created for a woman, but woman for man. Once you have your answer to those two questions, it'll guide your interpretation of verses uh, seven and, and stuff. All right, note, uh, side note here. This is not like the view of past cultures where men domineer over women while treating them as lesser. While some, even egalitarians, will push the idea that complementarianism is a smokescreen for abusive patriarchal leadership and ab abuse of women. That is simply a, a, a straw man. That is simply a, a personal attack against the view. That's all it really is in those who hold that view. So term Paul uses to describe women, glory, which speaks of dignity, honor, concern, and lofty treatment of a woman. A head-body relationship, not a master-slave relationship, but a head-body, 
relationship, like Ephesians 5, where there's a nourishing and cherishing and protecting and caring for. Christ is the head of every man. Does that diminish me in some way? No, of course not. A man being the head of his of a wife, of his wife, is not a diminishment of her. That is one of the biggest challenges um, that I've got in this whole series and, and that, that I will never overcome for a large number of people. It simply will never matter. I, I, won't, I won't be able to overcome it. Is helping egalitarians though to come with to terms with the biblical teaching of different authority roles between men and women, because you'd have to break their belief that is sometimes really deeply ingrained that any role difference related to authority between men and women is automatically abusive, cruel, oppressive, evil, immoral, and dishonoring. The Bible does this; it suggests that there are role differences, but it's still honoring and good. Questions: Will you will you hear that out loud? So go back to video number one in the series. That was probably the most important video I've done because for so many people, I think the underlying driver is this belief that it's egalitarianism or it's abuse. And once you believe that, no amount of Bible study will break it. You have to be willing to put that on the table and examine if it's actually true. All right. So finally, uh, before we go to question number eleven, uh, how does verses eight and nine relate to the head covering issue? Um, I say eight and nine, but I'm referring to. Six, seven, eight, nine, I guess. Um, the complementary explanation is the head covering communicates something of the higher authority role that a man or husband has. He can't wear it because it denies that role. It says that he's under some other person as opposed to just being under God. She should wear it because it represents that role, at least in the first century culture. This is an incredibly complementary and gender based issue. Let's look at the next question, number 11. Man, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going to finish. It's going to be this year. Does the woman have a symbol? Oh, here it is on your screen. <clears throat> does the woman have a symbol of authority on her head or does she have authority over her own head? Every egalitarian I've ever seen will say that verse 10, maybe there's exceptions, there's always exceptions, but widely this will be the egalitarian view. The verse 10, when it talks about a woman having authority, she's the one possessing the authority. And more often than not, but not always, complementarians will go the other route. So whose authority is this? Let's talk about that debate now. So it says, therefore, the one ought to have a, and we have in italics, a symbol of, because translators added that for what they believe was clarity, authority on her head because of the angels. Is it that she ought to have authority over her own head, like she possesses the authority, or she ought to have a symbol of authority on her head that represents somebody else's authority? What's going on? So, like I said, complementarians can be open to both views, so it's not make or break for the complementarian side, but for the egalitarian side, you, you need this to be, like, th this is a big deal, this is a central issue for the egalitarians. Verse 10 cannot be referring to some authority placed on the woman. Um, um, or maybe there's a way to, to, to respond to that and, and work it into your view, but it's not obvious that it's there, I'll put it that way. It, it's going to create a problem you have to resolve. If a head covering is a symbol of authority, then the complementary complementarian idea seems supported. And if it's not, then the complementarians, like myself, would just find that evidence elsewhere in the passage, verse 3, verse 7, verse 9. We'd find it in several other places. All right, let's understand the stakes. The stakes. Uh, there's different ways, three different ways <clears throat> to interpret it if the woman is the one who has the authority. If the woman has the authority, you have these sort of three options that are generally promoted, right? One, she ought to have the authority to use, a, to use a covering or not. It's her decision. The authority represents her controlling her own clothing. No one can force her. Um, egalitarians and complementarians can both hold that view and their views would, would still stand. This is her own authority over her own head, leading, to her, leading her to have liberty and capacity to choose what to wear. But throughout the passage, Paul is encouraging, sacrificing that liberty for the sake of others. And there's other times where Paul talks about this in chapters 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians sacrificing liberty for the sake of others. And this is Craig Keener's view. He's like, that's what they're, he's doing. He's like, hey, woman, you have authority. I'm fully acknowledging your authority, but I'm encouraging you to make a self-sacrificial step of wearing the head covering for the sake of others. Uh, another view, a second view, if it's her with the authority, is that she ought to have authority to pray and prophesy in public. This would be an affirmation that she, she can participate in openly praying and prophesying. Maybe this is because in the passage, there's so many sort of like uh, gender differences acknowledged. And so he just wants to really make sure people recognize she can pray and prophesy. I'm not ruling that out. Like that's something she has the right to do. Um, <clears throat> surprisingly to some, egalitarians and complementarians can both hold this view. It won't threaten either view. Um, 
this was not generally allowed in Jewish culture and in many um, other Roman things like that, not generally, like just general female freedom to pray and prophesy publicly like that. Not typically. So you could say that that was it. A third view is that she has authority over the angels. Over the angels. So this is only because later in the verse it says because of the angels. The problem with this phrase because of the angels is it's so vague. We're going to deal with it real soon here. We'll get into all the debates about that. So I'll come to that as long as my brain allows me to. <clears throat> Now, if that's the case, um, egalitarians and complementarians can hold that too. They could say, hey, she has authority over the angels or she ought to have authority over the angels. Um, one scholar named Hurley in his uh, article, Veils, um, I have notes for this. So you guys can check it out. But in, he says in 1 Corinthians does teach that in the future, we will judge the angels. That's in 1 Corinthians. It says, we will judge the angels. Don't you know that you'll judge angels? How much more matters of this life? But the Bible never says we currently have authority over them. So the ought already seems weird. This is probably the weakest view, right? A woman ought to have a, a authority over the angels. Like ought? Well, does she have it or she should have it? Like what? It's just confusing. That's probably the weakest view. But egalitarians and complementarians can both hold that view. However, if it's a symbol of authority, then it all of a sudden means that this head covering, without a doubt, represents male authority that the woman is under. And only complementarians can hold that view. So you see the stakes are this. The stakes are the following. Several options that anybody can hold if it's the woman with the authority. But one option that only a complementarian or a patriarchalist could hold if it is in fact authority that is on her head. Yeah, a symbol of authority that she's under. So it would mean the whole time that Paul has been concerned with the authority relationships between men and women throughout the whole passage. And that relationship is imbalanced by God's design, right? They don't have the exact equal authority over each other as husband and wife, but there is a difference. Let's talk about the Greek word for authority here, okay? So now you understand the stakes um, and why I'm perfect, perfectly fine saying when's the one with the authority there, if that's where the text leads, it's not going to threaten some view that I've got. But there is a threat to... Uh, one view on one interpretation. So the word here, authority, is the word exousia. Exousia, it, it's properly translated as authority. There's no debate about that. Okay, everybody believes, okay, that's definitely talking about authority. We're not going to try and get around that. Um, a very literal translation of this, of this verse, where you take out the italics that are trying to help people with their understanding of it, would be the woman ought to have authority on her head. So it's interesting, it's authority on her head. The woman ought to have authority on her head. But that is a difficult phrase to understand. Morna Hooker, she's an egalitarian scholar who's really championed her, you know, the egalitarian position, that it's not symbolic and exousia never has a passive sense where it's someone else who has the authority and she over over this person. So it's wrong to give it one in verse 10. And so she has. Uh, a whole paper she's written on the topic and it's called authority on her head an examination of first corinthians and uh 10 10 or 11 10 excuse me uh, new testament studies i got notes for it in my notes down below you can get my notes for free um so let's look at morna hooker's case but we'll just shortcut to the end of it okay we're going to look at the <laughs> and it's going to sound weird to some you're welcome to do all the research you want on your own please come back to this after you do that research because this is the parts that i think are the, the parts that matter so in Morna Hooker's case, she offers a number of points to support her view, and Tom Schreiner offers great responses to these points. So um, here I'm quoting Tom Schreiner, who an analyzed Morna Hooker's case. Who has the authority here? The man or somebody else, or is it the woman? Uh, this, according to Hooker, the verse is not saying that a woman must wear a head covering to show her, her submission to a man's authority. Instead, wearing a head covering indicates that a woman has the right to prophesy. If Hooker is correct, Paul here is trumpeting the authority of women not requiring their submission to men. So Schreiner gives seven reasons to reject Hooker's view. And in these, in these reasons, he shortcuts, explains her case and what's against it. I think this is the simplest way to analyze it. And here we go. Um, the first is the connection between verses 7 through 10, 7 and 10 rather, it showed that verse 10 is about a woman wearing a head covering, not possessing authority. Let me read this to you, and then we'll look at those verses. This is a strong point. I think this point alone is pretty powerful um, for showing that it's 
the authority is, is not her own. As we pointed out above, Schreiner says, um, do I have the right one on your screen? Okay, I got that fixed. Uh, Schreiner says, as we pointed out above, the structure of the text is such that verses 7 and 10 are parallel. A man should not wear a head covering, verse 7, but a woman should, verse 10. The therefore in verse 10 refers back to verses 8 and 9, which explain why a woman should have a sign of authority, because woman came from man and was created for man. The reasons given in verses 8 and 9 for wearing a head covering, which is required in verse 10, clearly show that the issue is a woman's proper role relationship to a man. So let's look at those verses to see what he's saying. This, I think, is a very strong point. When you look at passages, uh, verses, and phrases isolated, it's easier to come up with a number of interpretations and argue about them. When you look at them in context, a lot of those interpretations fall away. So verse 7 is, as I mentioned earlier, is a sandwich with verse 10. It's like the two pieces of bread. The man ought not to have his head covered. And then he gives reasons, multiple reasons related to men and women. Therefore, the woman ought to have a, what? What, what is, he talked about the man. Now he talks about the woman. It's speaking of a symbol of authority, it seems. Something is, is, is going on here that relates to a woman wearing a head covering. And that's why it's okay to add those italics that are in there. That would be the idea here of the first quote from uh, Schreiner. Then we have um, another problem, I think, with uh, Hooker's analysis that Tom Schreiner points out. And here it is. Hooker's view focuses on exousia, which she takes as freedom. But the focus of the verse is not on freedom. Instead, the text says the woman ought, ought to have authority on her head. The word ought shows that a command is being given here to women as to how they ought to adorn themselves when they prophesy. It communicates an obligation, not a freedom. Now, this is actually super interesting because when you look at the verse, yeah, wait, if it's saying the woman has authority to do what she wants with her own hair or, her, or has authority to prophesy and pray, why is it that she ought to? Where else does, does Paul just say, hey, you should have that right, but you don't, but you should, you don't now, but you should have that. Like that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, the word ought is interesting. It doesn't state how things are, but how things should be. If we were to take exousia as a right or a freedom, then a woman doesn't already have that right. Paul is just trying to give them one. This isn't how egalitarians use the passage though, but it's what their interpretation would seem to imply. They don't see it as some something a woman is supposed to be given, whether it's authority over angels to pray and prophesy or to, or to control what she wears on her head. They see it as something she already has. It seems that egalitarians have neglected the word ought and focused on the word authority. And by interpreting authority outside of its context in the phrase, I think they've misunderstood it. <clears throat> so ought implies obligation, not freedom. That's the second point against um, the woman being the one who has the authority. Let's, um, hold on, that one's not yet. Spoilers. All right, verses three through nine, verses three through nine, here's the third reason to push against the woman having the authority. Um, they make it abundantly clear that Paul wants women to wear head coverings in relation to male headship. That is so abundantly clear in verses three through nine. The head coverings are to support headship. I can't see anyone reasonably debating that. It makes more sense that the authority in verse 10 is the is is that the headship that he was talking about the whole time? It was the thing he's been focused on, the principle he's trying to reinforce continually. It's represented by the covering on her head. To see it suddenly shifting to a brand new concept of a woman's rights, and and those rights are hotly debated. Like, what are the rights? She has the right to wear what she wants. She has the right to pray and prophesy. She has the right to like. It you you feel like you're pulling this from somewhere outside the passage because it's just not indicated. The authority that has been discussed throughout seems to be the, the, the husband, it seems to be. Uh, the fourth reason to support um, this other view is verse 11, verse 11, oh, let me put this back up. Verse 11 um, supports that the authority in verse 10 is not a woman's own authority because again, and I've, third time I think I've talked about this word, however, or nevertheless, that you get in verse 11. This is like, hey, in contrast, or to keep you from overdoing that idea, Here's an alternate idea, and this is all like about exalting the woman's value, necessity, worth, and goodness, right? This, this is what verse 11 and 12 are about. But if verse 10 is affirming this high authority of a woman, why is verse 11 a contrast to that? 
there's no contrast if verse 10 is the, the way the egalitarians take it. So there's another reason in the text, the ought, right? The however, um, and a number of other things we've, we've already discussed. Let's go to point number five to support that view that um, it's actually not the woman who has the authority in this passage, although it could be, it wouldn't threaten an egalitarian or a complementarian view. I just think that uh, it's it's incorrect. So fifth reason, it is um, it is okay to see exousia as a sign of authority. That, that is not a violation of some Greek policy. You could see exousia here, the word authority in verse 10, as a symbol or sign of authority. That is appropriate. Now, Craig, Craig Keener says it's not. So we need to get into this little debate here. Can you see this word as representing something symbolic? <clears throat> he says, see, especially uh, William Ramsey, the cities of St. Paul, their influence on his life and thought page 203, who notes that the former idea, the idea that the authority is symbolic, or it represents, it's a metaphor for authority in some sense, um, is such unnatural Greek, and there's a big claim, no one would have thought of it but for their presuppositions on how to read the passage. That's a very bold claim. It's like, hey guys, this is, I mean, you take it from a guy who knows Greek really well, like Ramsey and Keener do, far, 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 far better than I ever will. Um, yeah, that that's a powerful statement. Here's another quote for us to consider. Craig Keener says, the only normal way to read the Greek phrase is to read it that the woman has authority over her own head. Right? The one possessing the authority is the woman. On the other hand, now let's push back on those claims. Um, Anthony Thistleton, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, which is actually pretty well respected and pretty helpful, he says, we should note in passing that most patristic commentators saw no problem in understanding exousia in an active sense as a metonymy for a sign of power over, right? It's kind of like a metaphor. Chrysostom observes, being covered is a mark of subjection and authority, and Theophylact explicitly understands the metonymic sign of power. Irenaeus understands kaluma here. Irenaeus has that word kaluma there. Irenaeus uh, literally... Um, uh, substituted the word authority with covering, like kaluma is covering. So here's a thought. If ancient Greek speakers, right, who were closer to the New Testament time than us, actually using Greek, if they took it to be a metonymy or a metaphor, a symbol of power, a symbol of authority, then it stands to reason that that's not unnatural Greek, right? Like, it's not like it's just modern non-Greek speakers who are like, I'm going to translate it this way. We're, we're like, Greek fathers are translating it that way, understanding it that way. Also, to support this, uh, BDAG supports it as a viable, not not 100%, right? It supports it as a viable meaning. Um, also, BDAG, this Greek lexicon, it represents, it recognizes that it's debated. Um, so I found it in entry number seven in the current edition of BDAG, or at least the edition I have, under the word exousia, that yes, it can represent a symbolic thing. And so can, not necessarily does. Okay, so BDAG's not like weighing in like, Mike's right here. I'm just suggesting that it leaves the door open for this. And when you see Greek fathers doing it, and then you see more evidence as well. Let me offer some examples. Uh, Tom Schreiner gives these examples of where we can see um, that, quote, it is not at all unusual for something on the head to be a symbol of something else. So this isn't about the word exousia. It's about where exousia is on her head. And Seeing something on the head as a symbol for something else, that is not an unusual thing. It is something that would have been understandable to the people at the time. Let's look at some examples. One of them is Revelation 12.3. Revelation 12.3, then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great and red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his heads, were, uh, and on his heads were seven diadems. Now, these are all representing authority and individuals and, and uh, political leaders and stuff like that. These are totally symbolic, and they're on the head in particular. But this is just one example. Um, we have <clears throat> another example that Schreiner mentions. He says, when Jesus returns on a white horse in Revelation 19, verses 11 and 12. Let's leave those on your screen for you. On his head are many crowns symbolizing his kingly authority. Right? Those are symbolic and they're on the head and they represent a, an authority. There's one more example that goes to support the idea of like something on the head being a metaphor for something else. And that is actually also in BDAG, uh, which is again that lexicon 
who uses this as the reason why, hey, maybe authority can have a symbolic meaning. So let's look at that one right now. In an example very similar to 1 Corinthians 11.10, Diodorus of Sicily refers to a stone statue that has three kingdoms on its head. And you got the Greek right there. But it clearly means in the context that the statue has three crowns, which are symbols of governing kingdoms. We can conclude then that it is not at all unusual for something on the head to be a symbol of something else. And I, mean, I think that this is <clears throat> this is fairly sound. It doesn't prove that that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 11. It shows that it's a possibility, like it's it's in the range of potential uses of the term. So here, a kingdom on the head in this Diodorus of Sicily quote is taken as a metaphor for something else. BDAG and, say, Tom Schreiner, for instance, see this as a relevant parallel to 1 Corinthians 11. Even though it's basileas, kingdoms, kingdoms, right, instead of exousia, authority, it still does have this thing that is like, a, you don't actually have a kingdom on your head, just like you don't have authority on your head, you have something that those things represent on your head. So the symbolic concept of something metaphorically being on the head seems like the original readers could have picked up on it. And that, may I add, is probably why the Greek fathers picked up on that as well. It may not be as unnatural as Dr. Keener has said. So Hooker claims also <clears throat> that exousia always refers to a person's own authority, not the authority of someone else. Now to me, just normal English stuff, like, you know, in English, it's weird to think, um, Power always refers to the person's power, not someone else's power over them. You just feel like this feels like a rule you're forcing on language that doesn't need to be there. So Hooker's examples are generally not symbolic uses of the term. So she has a bunch of examples of the term exousia being used, and it's like consistently. Exousia is your own authority and not someone else's authority over you. But these are not symbolic uses of the term. If exousia is, is symbolic here, if it's metaphorical in some sense, then you don't want to govern the metaphorical meaning of a term with the literal usages of the term. Let me give you a simple example you'll understand in English. The phrase, don't have a cow, uses the term cow metaphorically. You should not make a rule about the normal usage of the word cow and apply it to the phrase, don't have a cow. Like, we, we, we get this. This is simple, right? Um, Schreiner says, to say there are no other examples of exousia being used this way is not decisive. He doesn't disagree, he just says it's not decisive, since there are not many other parallel examples of authority even being used symbolically. We just don't have a lot to go on here. So on the positive side, this seems important. Only symbolic uses of the word would be truly parallel. But on the negative side, you could say Morna Hooker has a point here, right? Because, like, we don't know. I mean, I, how many symbolic uses are there? I, Tom Schreiner didn't say, I didn't go and dig them all up. What is the nature of the symbolic uses? But um, Schreiner does offer more support for his view in this. So I would say initially, oh yeah, okay, well, it seems kind of weak on one side. Maybe there's a point here on the other. It seems a little indecisive. But here's a little more details for you. Moreover, Tom Schreiner points this out. The example from Diodorus is also helpful here. The text describes the statue of the mother of King Ozymandias. Do you guys remember the story of Ozymandias? You know, behold my uh, my kingdom in despair, something like that. What an interesting poem that story uh, is. Um, at any rate, there's more to it that we probably haven't read, and that is here in Diodorus. So here's how it reads and how it relates to this question of authority. There is also another statue of his mother standing alone, a monolith 20 cubits high, and it has three kingdoms on its head, signifying that she was both daughter and wife and mother of a king. This is the example we talked about before. Now you're just actually seeing the text. Here, the three crowns, Schreiner says, which Diodorus calls kingdoms, all represent someone else's authority. The authority of the woman's father, who was a king, husband, who was a king, or son, who was a king. In no case is the woman's own authority symbolized by the crown she wears. Similarly, the head coverings of the woman in 1 Corinthians 11 may well represent the authority of the man to whom she is subject in authority. In my opinion, her, her husband primarily. So um, that actually does seem like a good example, a good parallel case. It's, it's not the word authority. It's not exousia. It's, it's kingdoms. But the parallels are pretty close there, and it seems like a very relevant thing to apply it because it's a symbol on the head representing the authority that someone else had not hers, exactly. 
So, um, I already talked about the, uh, oh, I haven't, I guess I haven't mentioned this. There's a variant, an early variant um, of First Corinthians 11 where, in First Corinthians 11, where that word authority in verse 10 is actually changed and the person making the copy, they put kaluma there, which is covering. So rather than saying having authority on her head, they changed it to covering on her head. Now, there's no way that that was the original. Like Paul wrote authority, he didn't write covering. So I'm not suggesting he did. Why do I bring this up? Because the point is that some early Greek, natural Greek, native Greek reader looked at 1 Corinthians 11, recognized that people might, might struggle to understand the word authority. And at least that Greek guy thought authority clearly means covering. I will add the word kaluma here for clarity. So th what they did was they offered a paraphrase rather than just copying it. They added a paraphrastic type, uh, interpretive type, you know, copy. So my only point there is to say, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's that unnatural Greek. It seems like a lot of Greek people did that kind of understood it that way. Yeah, I think that's relevant. Now this one, it seems super important and relevant. <clears throat> Number seven, I think this is the final one. Hooker and other egalitarians will rely on the active sense of the term exousia because it's, it's, it's an active term there, meaning that the woman is the one who actively has the authority. Let me read to you um, a quote from, uh, who is this quote from? I think this is also from Tom Schreiner. Even, yeah, it is. Okay. Even if authority has an active meaning here, he, he responds to this idea. It refers to the man's authority, not the woman's in this context. You catch that? The, the response here is that the egalitarians make a really big deal about exousia being in the active sense. And he goes, well, yeah, it can be in the active sense. It just refers to the man's authority. He goes on and says, if we see that she ought to have authority on her head, then, quote, the most sensible explanation is that she ought to wear a head covering as a symbol of man's authority over her. Not every single man over every woman, of course, as I've said multiple times now. So simply showing that the term is active, not passive, it just doesn't decide the issue. I think that's really important because of how strongly the egalitarians will say, it's active, so it has to be the woman. I don't, I don't understand the weight of that particular one. Maybe I'm missing out, but I'm not the only one who's missing out. Other scholars need to be missing out on it too. Maybe there's a reason for that. Let's move on to the next question since I think that answers that. This is question number 12. What does because of the angels mean? in verse 10. Okay. Some of you have just clicked to this part of the video and you skipped everything else. And I don't blame you. You're, you're, you're interested in this issue. So let's dig into it. First, I just want to acknowledge this has really very little bearing for the most part, for the most part, it has very little bearing on my interpretation of First Corinthians 11 as a whole. Um, but there's a lot of interest on this particular issue. So what are the different views? Let me put them in front of you. Different views. There is the human messenger's view. That's the idea that these are just humans. Angelos can mean messenger, and so maybe these are just humans visiting other churches. And he says, hey, when other people visit you, you want them to see proper order in your church. Do it for the sake of the visitors. Um, another view is, number two, the lustful angels view, the idea that angels are lusting after women and the head coverings will protect them somehow from that or stop the angels from lusting. Uh, the third view is the holy angels offended view, which is that there's these are angels on God's side and they will be somehow offended if the Corinthians aren't having proper order in their church service, uh, including with head coverings. And then the fourth one is the angels, women will judge of you. And this is the idea that um, uh, women should have, a. this only works with the woman being the one with the authority in verse 10. Women should have the authority. And this is because they are going to be judging angels one day. And let me take us back to the passage itself, verse 10. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So yeah, she's, she's important. She should have authority. Okay, <clears throat> let's evaluate these views. And here's the view I used to hold. I, and I held it tentatively. Like I never, I don't think I ever taught it. Uh, I just held it in my own head for a long time as I kind of just was not really sure what to think. And I kind of liked this view. <laughs> Dangerous when you like views. <laughs> Sometimes you hold them too long. But the human messenger's view, let's do with that first. The idea here is that visitors from other churches will be disturbed by seeing the women not dressing themselves in the culturally appropriate ways. So Paul is saying, for the sake of others, what you know, an additional reason to wear head coverings for the sake of others who will be bothered by seeing you violate that policy. Now, for this view, it's not there's nothing for this view. Okay, for this view, there is the idea that angelos can mean human messenger or angelic being. 
but it literally is used. Like Epaphroditus is, Paul says, your messenger, your angelos to me. And he is, he's not metaphorically calling him an angel. He was like an angel. Like, no, that, that's not the case. He's literally just saying he's a messenger. The word angelos means messenger, okay? So it, it can refer to a human, and sometimes it does. So this isn't a metaphorical meaning. It's, it's literally, the word can just mean messenger. Since Paul says in verse 16, let me take us there. There we go. I don't know if I had that on your screen earlier, like I should have. But when Paul says in verse 16 that all the other churches practice head coverings, right? That all the churches are doing it. When he says this, he could be saying that they should be covered as part of a way of not offending the messengers and visitors from these other churches. Okay, so that, that's, that's, that's the pro for that view. Angelos could mean that. And he does mention concern for other churches in verse 16. Against this view, and sadly it will fall to this, I believe, is more often than not, the word does refer to angelic beings. It can refer to messengers, and we, we have to be open to that because there's sometimes where it clearly does. More often than not, it refers to angelic beings. So I wouldn't default to humans if you hear the word just by itself in the New Testament. Paul uses the term three other times in 1 Corinthians, and he always uses it to refer to angelic beings and not humans. So it's 1 Corinthians 4.9. Um, do, 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 do. we become a spectacle, spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Clearly that's talking about actual angelic beings. Another time he uses it is in 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do you not know that we will judge angels? He's not talking about humans there or messengers of some kind. He's talking about angelic beings. Another time is in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and because angels is again, contrasted with human men, you know, it's angelic beings. <clears throat> so in every case, it's clearly about, you know, angelic beings, not humans. And he never qualifies it in 1 Corinthians eleven ten. 10. He just says, because of the angels. What that means is that he probably means the same thing here as he meant every other time in, the, in this book, when in this letter to the Corinth, uh, he meant angelic beings. So there's also nothing to identify it. Um, angels without a qualifier of some kind, it just has to be taken in the most in the most immediately apparent sense, right? The, the, your, you know, if you were the Corinthians, your gut would have told you he's talking about angelic beings here, just like he did earlier. There's no qualifier, like, because the angels from the other churches, like that would be different if he said that. So I think this view fails. I think it's easy because if you, <clears throat> if you say it's human messengers in verse 10, because of human messengers, then a lot of like debates, you don't have to deal with those debates, which is probably why I found that view appealing. Um, but I, but I think that it's wrong um, for those reasons. So let's go to view number two. Could it be lustful angels? Could these be lustful angels? Um, this view, I won't get into hmm. crazy amounts of detail on this view because um, there is a large amount of scripture that we would be covering and dealing with this issue. So I'll just summarize. Okay, the idea here is that angels, either holy or otherwise, angels are lusting after women who reveal their hair. So covering the hair somehow protects women from these lustful angels from their lust or from maybe they still are desiring them, but they can't, they can't access them. Like it's some kind of spiritual protection for them, something like that. Those are the options. Um, for this view, there is something, some stuff for this view has got more in its favor than perhaps the other view did. Genesis 6-2, it does refer to angels, it seems, marrying women, right? We, you guys know what I'm talking about, the, um, the Nephilim passage, right? Although this isn't about the Nephilim, right? It's about... These sons of God, they saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Now, then we, verse four, the Nephilim and all that stuff, I'm not going to get into all those debates, but I'm inclined to think that these were angelic beings in this passage. That is my understanding of it. First Peter reinforces this as well. Um, we won't get into the details there, but first Peter, it says that these uh, there were these angels that have been kept in chains and it seems so that they cannot repeat the issues that were going on in Genesis 6-2. They wouldn't be able to lust after women and all that kind of thing. Others say, well, hey, if they're kept in chains in 1 Peter, then they're not available now to lust after women today in the church. Like that doesn't make any sense. They're, they're kept in chains. Others go, well, some of them are still around or maybe more of them could fall, which would be an easy way to explain. Yeah, those ones were punished, but more could fall still potentially. There's also several other extra biblical works that talk about angels possibly lusting after or even trying to sleep with women. Though many of them may come from after the time of the New Testament, it just shows you that this kind of idea would have been something others would, people would have understood at the time, right? Um, so 
We need to be careful though. Um, here's where I want to exhibit a ton of caution. When reading extra biblical texts, be careful that when you find out about the views of people of the time, you're not just teleporting those views into scripture. You're just using them as a background for understanding the type of setting in which scripture was entering into the world, but you're not pushing, because at some point scholars even do this, where sometimes there's ultimately no difference between what scripture teaches and whatever the culture happened to believe. If they find out the culture believed something at the time, they just sort of like teleport it into scripture as though it's a proclamation in scripture. So I, I just want to be careful with that. Okay, but those are those are the things for this view. Um, they're being tempted to lust by women's hair based on the view of Genesis 6 and 1 Peter and stuff like that. So Paul is, is, is when he says, because of the angels in verse 10, he's like, I'm trying to prevent another Genesis 6 event. Okay, I don't want this angels taking women and, and doing intimate things with them, producing offspring and that kind of stuff. So let me talk about why I don't hold this view and why um, I would suggest you reconsider it if it's your view. There's literally nothing in the passage that mentions lust. Go back to 1 Corinthians and remember that often commentators, what we can do is we can talk to you and talk to you and wander you away from the passage, but you have to, at the end of the day, come back and reread just those verses and ask, is that interpretation indicated in the text itself, not just in extra biblical or even biblical other references? There's nothing in the passage that mentions lust. Not once. It says because of the angels. It doesn't say because of angels lust. It never mentions lust. Not a single time. This is a really big deal. What ideas does Paul bring up? Honor, dishonor, headship, coverings in relationship to honor and dishonor and headship, but not in relationship to lust. We change the focus of the passage when we turn this into a lust issue. This view artificially adds lust as an overriding issue in, in 1 Corinthians 11. It also adds a new idea, a new idea, brand new to the text of scripture entirely, as far as I can tell, that head coverings can prevent angelic lust. That's a new idea that I, I don't see in the text of scripture, but you need that. Or, or it protects women somehow. Like I, I'm not inclined to add new concepts into a passage so late in the passage. Like we're at verse 10 here, not verse two in this section of scripture. We're at verse 10, he's almost done, you know, and it's new ideas are being added into the passage really late in the process of interpretation. We should stick to what's there if possible before adding new ideas not present in the text. Okay, that's one major issue against this interpretation. Um, also, nothing else in the New Testament says that angels going after women is a current concern. <clears throat> There's nowhere in the New Testament. Because let me just, let's just be real. If women in the church today have to be seriously concerned about angels lusting after them, and that was the, and that was a present and real pervasive concern across the churches, why is it only mentioned with four words in one verse of one passage in scripture? You know, sexual immorality is something that the church was very much focused on as teaching against. But why is the angelic issue, which is obviously a present problem and threat, only mentioned with four words because of the angels in a very vague phrase in a passage that doesn't otherwise mention lust? It doesn't look like it fits is what I'm suggesting. Also, we have to ask this question on a more practical, pragmatic thing is like, are, are head coverings that powerful? Like literally just a woman covering her head protect, protects from angelic lust? Genesis 6-2 does not say that angels saw women's hair it says they saw women were beautiful. Are you unable to see a woman as beautiful when she covers her hair, which is not even a full covering, right? Like maybe a full on burka, like with everything and all you see is like, like a slit for the eyes, right? Okay, maybe then. But even then we have another problem, which is that Paul is only telling them to wear it when praying and prophesying, not even all the time. So what, it, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't seem to fit. Um, also, if this is your view, you're going to have an incredibly hard time. Be serious about it. You will have a really hard time saying that head coverings are cultural. Angels have their own culture that is independent of, of our culture, right? And it's probably, they're probably the same today as they were back then, I'd imagine. Yet people will claim this is about angelic lust. The woman has to wear head covering because of angelic lust. And then they will say it doesn't apply today. If you're going to say it applies to angelic lust, you've got to say it applies today. I think that that question is is answered for you. And if you're going to be consistent, you need to do that. Um, here's some additional issues. Why is Paul only focused on prayer and prophecy and not head covering practices in every context? Why does he not want them to wear head, head coverings all the time? 
or why why does he want men to not wear head coverings? Why why is that important? It, now it's just to leave out part of what he's talking about. When you walk out of church, do angels go blind? Angles, <laughs> angels don't go blind. Angels, do angels go blind? All right, this would be a problem. Like a, a, a Christian woman just walking around a marketplace, wouldn't she be exposed to the same issues? So wouldn't it be beyond a prayer and prophecy? So now it applies to all times and in all places. Even in the privacy of my own home, I'd want to wear a head covering if that was the issue. So this view also is guilty um, of adding and taking away. I guess I kind of mentioned this, but I'll just briefly mention it as a summary here. It adds lust as an issue when there's nothing about lust in 1 Corinthians 11. It adds a new teaching telling women everywhere that angels can lust after them if they don't cover their hair. It adds a new idea that that hair coverings are a preventative against people lusting or things lusting after you, um, which is something that now is going to make it difficult not to apply that everywhere all the time. And it takes away prophecy and prayer as the context for the head covering. So this is where cultural background and parallel passages, we can be oh, look at this in this other verse and this other verse and we're tying it all together like this, like like we're the conspiracy theorists with all like the, the, the threads. Okay, there, the scripture does tie together in some beautiful ways sometimes, but there's so much in the Bible that it's not hard to pull um, irrelevant things together and have a wrong interpretation. And that's what I think is happening here. Don't fall for the it's shiny interpretation. Maybe you think, um, or you like excuse me, thinking that you get the deeper meaning behind the text. I understand that. I've seen people who are kind of high on the idea that they found the deeper meaning and they're sort of looking for weird interpretations because it feeds some sense of discovery that that makes them excited about, I'm understanding the word better. Maybe you like feeling that you have the obscure knowledge about scripture, or maybe you like that it's weird. Some people just like that it's weird. They just get a kick out of it. Ah, here's a weird interpretation. It didn't edify anybody. But it was weird and I'm happy about it. You know, I mean, maybe that's you. Maybe you're just, you're just like throwing out weird things. Maybe you like thinking that you have deeper insights than other people. That's possible too. Like, I'm just being honest. These are temptations we can fall into when it comes to these deep studies. This can motivate you to take on interpretations because of how they shine rather than how they will fit directly into the context of the passage. So yeah, the lustful angels interpretation seems like it has major problems. So I do not hold it. I would not encourage others to hold it. Number three. The holy angelic observer's view. Okay, so not visitors, not lusting angels. What about holy angelic observers? What is that view even saying? The idea here is that good angels, right? Angels on God's side, on God's side, they're present during worship. That's what this idea depends on. That they are present in some sense during worship. And they should see that God is honored with proper displays of his order and his will in his people during worship. That the, the way the church conducts its service is saying something to angels and we should care that we're displaying God's glory to angelic beings. That's the idea there. On this view, that the church should display God's glory to angelic beings. For this view, the positives of this view, uh, some early Jewish texts have this view of angels. There's early Jewish texts that say that angels were involved, especially in services where God was worshipped. We also have things like in the Old Testament, uh, indications that angels are involved in this sort of thing. So scripture shows that they were observers. We note that angels are observers throughout the Old Testament, I mean, and the New Testament, but um, only at one pre-flood time were angels dealing with lust towards women. So here's a consistent truth about angels. They're observing creation and observing God's people. Here's a one-time truth. One time there was a lust thing that happened a really long time ago, and we don't really see it as a repeated concern in the scriptures, even if others talked about it outside the scriptures. Scripture shows that they're observers. <clears throat> uh, some New Testament examples can be here. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.21. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels. To maintain these principles without bias, do nothing in a spirit of partiality. This is him being charged, Timothy being charged, to run the church well because there's angelic observers of the way he's conducting himself towards the body of Christ. Ephesians 3.10 talks about this as well. So that the manifold wisdom of God, this is about how God saved us, right? So that the manifold wisdom of God now might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The church is meant to display God's glory and his manifold wisdom and his grace and his kindness. 
the church is meant to display. So there's angelic observers of the church. So this fits that well, you could also say like in the Old Testament, like the tabernacle literally had angelic beings uh, woven into the, 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 the tapestry and stuff like that to demonstrate that they are observers and participants in some sense in the worship of God. In Isaiah, when God is worshiped, the angels that are worshiping. In Revelation, when God is being worshiped, the angels that are worshiping. So yeah, this seems to be a pretty consistent thing, not just in you know one time in one location like the lust issue. So it fits the fact that Paul is particularly concerned about head coverings at church during worship, during prayer and prophecy, right? So it's good angels that are gathered to attend the worship and, he, and the church should display God's glory by proper order during that time. It also fits explicit things Paul gives as reasons for 1 Corinthians 11 for the, for the head coverings. Honor and shame and headship and God's created order. These are things the angels will want to look on and see actually happening in the body of Christ. It also has this to its benefit. It taps into what's present in 1 Corinthians 11. And it also does not add new ideas that are not brought up in the passage, like lust. Lust is not brought up. You have to cram it in there for the lust view. Paul's concerns would apply easily to good angels who delight in seeing God's order displayed in the church. Hey, church, it's not just about you. Hey, woman. Hey, man. It's not just about your personal experience as you worship God. It's about you displaying God's glory towards all of creation, including the angelic beings. This is not just about you. So you should fall into the order that God has given so that you might better display that thing. Um, so I think it has a lot going for it, really. Now, what about against this view? Um, against this view, there's really only one major thing against this view that I can think of. It is not explicitly stated because the phrase, because of the angels, is super vague. Because of the angels. It doesn't say because of the angels who are watching you worship. Totally agree. The reason why this doesn't dissuade me from this view is because this is true of every view. Every view has this, this, this flaw in that because of the angels, it's a super vague phrase and you have to read into it. But I'm using the text of the scripture and the context that's there and consistent teaching about angels throughout scripture as my way of interpreting the phrase. I think that that's the better way to do it. So there's nothing really against this view. Um, and that's why this is my current view that it says godly angels who are observing worship and delight in seeing God's order. This doesn't mean that angels believe that head coverings are uh, are required for worshiping God. It means that angels want to see proper order. And at least for their culture, we'll ask if it applies to us today. They wanted to see it represented in head coverings because that's how it was. Um, let's talk about the angels women will judge view. Number four, I don't hold this view, but I want to discuss it. The idea is that... Um, <clears throat> The authority is, belongs to the woman, and it says because of the angels, she ought to have authority because she's one day going to judge angels. So a woman should be invested with a certain amount of authority over maybe her hair or, or the authority to pray and prophesy or to what to wear because she's going to be a judger of angels one day. Um, that's the basic idea. Now, for this view, <clears throat> um, earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul actually did mention judging angels. Let's just look at that. I put it up earlier for a different reason, but here we go. Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? He uses the fact that we're going to judge angels one day as a reason for why we should be doing some authoritative things in this life. I should say some responsible things in this life. Um, so that, that's the only thing. Uh, against this view, against so it's possible, right, in a sense. But against this view, it, it only works with one interpretation of authority in verse 10. She has the authority to control herself. Um, control what she wears in particular in this case. But that seems wrong because verse 10 again, got to take us back there. First Corinthians 11, 10, the woman ought, even if you don't think it's a symbol, is she ought to have authority on her head? Not that she does, she ought to. This is something she should have, not that she does have. And that's why the idea that she ought to have authority for her clothing and stuff, it just doesn't seem like it works with the verse. So that's one issue with the view. Another issue with the view is it's not connected easily to head coverings. Um, because of the angels, it, it just doesn't easily connect to head coverings. The logic seems a bit of a stretch. Craig Keener summarizes it like this. You will judge angels someday. Surely you can make responsible choices about your head apparel now. And um, that doesn't make it impossible, it, but I'm, we should acknowledge that's a big stretch for understanding the text. You have to go back five chapters. There's another problem. You have to go back five full chapters in 1 Corinthians before you get to anything about angels um, judging angels. So it's pretty far removed from the direct context, 
But the holy angelic observer's view, which get, it gets its meaning from Paul's opening sentence about prayer and prophecy being the context. Hey, when you're praying and prophesying, and then he says, because of the angels. Why? Because they relate specially to moments of prayer and prophecy as observers. So Craig Keener prefers this view, the angels, women will judge view. That's that's his his preferred view. And um, uh, I guess last I'll say against it is uh, the phrase because of the angels doesn't sound like because you will judge angels. There's a significant difference here. If it's because you will judge angels, I'll just put it up again for you. Then that means that it's not on be it's not for the benefit of the angels. It's just in something that's thought wise connected to the topic of angels, right? The phrase because of the angels in verse 10 sounds different than that though. It sounds like it's because of some impact it has on the angels. You should have this authority related thing because it impacts the angels in some way. Not just that it's a relevant thought connection to the topic of angels or future human angel relationships. So I think that that again pushes against that view and makes the holy angelic observers view more attractive to me. So there's other views I don't think are worth the time. Like legitimately, they're not worth the time. You're why did you deal with that, Mike? It's like, I just think it's that bad. I'm not even going to talk about it. Let's go on to, though, the annoying one. All right, the annoying one. I'll explain why I think it's annoying. I'm not, I'm not like being in the flesh about it, but I'll, I'll explain. The question is, is this whole thing really based on the ancient medical idea that women's hair functioned as a testicle? We're going to spend a lot of time on this because it's complicated and it's very hard to get anybody who's actually trying to arbitrate this debate that's going on. But the basic idea here um, is a guy named Troy Martin came in recently and said that Paul's argument from nature in verses 13 to 15, when he's like, doesn't nature itself teach you? It's a real problem. He thinks it's a very serious problem for, for all of our modern traditional interpretations of this passage. If you translate it as a covering, in verse 15. In fact, verse 15 he sees as a major problem. Let me just share it with you right here. All right. If a woman has a da 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 for her hair is given to her for a covering. And he goes, oh, that does not work if her hair is given instead of a covering. He ultimately solves this problem by saying that Paul was not saying a woman's hair is instead of a covering. Remember that word. Paul was actually saying that a woman was given hair instead of a testicle, right? Adult stuff. This, he says, unravels the true meaning of 1 Corinthians 11, which so far throughout church history has eluded us. If you just understand that Paul was calling a woman's hair a testicle. I find this annoying because it feels inherently irreverent towards scripture um, and because it's not really strongly grounded, but there are many, many, many who are quickly jumping on this interpretation. Allow me, you guys, to explain and evaluate this interpretation, at least offer my two cents, um, because I think that it's, it's really problematic and it, and it offers no benefit to understanding first Corinthians, tons of problems, and it's not sufficiently grounded. I, I, I'm making bold statements because, um, I want you to understand at least broad picture where I'm at on this. Let me walk you through the debate. So to explain and evaluate this new interpretation, we need to look at the scholarly battle that has taken place between Troy Martin and Mark Goodacre. So Troy Martin is the one who promoted this. Right, there's three scholarly articles ultimately that were written. The first, Troy Martin, he says uh, in his article called uh, Paul's Argument from Nature for the Veil in 1 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, a testicle instead of a head covering. And in modern scholarship, you'd be surprised how many people are like, I'm going to read that. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, but yep, they will. And so it, it quickly got a lot of attention. So this is in 2004. He puts up this article in 2004 in the Journal of Biblical Literature. His paper said that the secret to understanding 1 Corinthians 11 was to recognize that Paul and others at the time thought that a woman's hair functioned as a sperm receptacle. And that was what Paul was talking about in verse 15. This was not just Troy Martin, okay? this Most papers just kind of sit in obscurity. A lot of them don't really get read much. It's kind of sad. This is the reality of things. Um, but this paper was popularized by Michael Heiser recently in his podcast, now, Michael Heiser, who I, I, I love, even though I, we often, I would disagree with him. Um, and many of you would be like, well, you're wrong. Mike. <laughs> that's fine. I don't care. Um, you, you know, that, that's the whole point of this thing is for, to give you both sides unless you decide for yourself. But I'm not going to hide my views. And so Dr. Michael Heiser talked about this in his Naked Bible podcast. Nothing gross about the term Naked Bible. He just means sort of like 
you're just going to examine the Bible for what it is and not dress it up in any different way. Um, but number 86, podcast 86, he looks into this. And in various videos online, you see this podcast has really spread. A lot of people have heard about it. I have been personally asked, you guys have sent me messages. What do you think about Mark Goodacre's testicle thing, right? What do you think about that, Mike? We're going to get into that in detail right now. So Mark Goodacre published his paper in 2004. It's been popularized by Mike Heiser. Um, as uh, Mike Heiser acknowledges, seven years later, a response came from Mark Goodacre. And he wrote the paper, Does Parabolion Mean Testicle in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen? And two, so he argues a whole bunch of points against Mark uh, Troy Martin's paper. Then two years later, in 2013, Troy Martin responded to Mark Goodacre. And according to Michael Heiser, Troy Martin ate Mark Goodacre's lunch. His words, not mine. And I'm going to say I disagree that I think there's there's people's just be patient and work through the data with me here, y'all. Let's see how it goes. So his response was called a parable ion as testicle in first Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15, a response to Mark Goodacre. Now let's talk about the key issues that we need to deal with. <clears throat> it, the, the, this thing is overly complicated, uh, but I'm, I did my best as a teacher, hopefully a good teacher to simplify it as much as I could. Three main issues. You can separate the whole debate into one did people at the time think that hair functioned like a testicle? Okay, is that even in the historical background of the time? Number two, did they specifically use the word parabolion? That's the, the word in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15. God's given her hair for a covering, for a parabolion. Did they use that word to refer to a testicle? Okay, that's going to be a big issue. We're going to get into detail on that. Um, the first two questions would go to show two key things. One, it, this weird concept about hair was a real thing at the time. And two, that you could at least potentially use the word parabolion to communicate that weird biological view of hair. So it would, it would send out a signal. Hey, that's what I'm talking about when I, when I say that word. There's going to be problems with step two. Uh, number three, the third step and the third key issue here is, does it make sense to see that meaning in 1 Corinthians 11 specifically? Step three is where the least energy has been spent and where most of it should be spent because that's where this whole hair is a testicle view falls apart. So here we go. Let's look at the first question. Did people at the time think hair functioned as a testicle? And the answer is going to be to many surprisingly yes-ish. <laughs> sort of. I just want to clear up. Yes, but I want to clear up one thing that I think Troy Martin has obscured a bit in the way he's talked about it, um, in my opinion. <clears throat> did people at the time think hair function as a testicle? Okay, Hippocrates, and Troy Martin did a bunch of work on this, has tons of resources and, and quotes and stuff like that. I'm just going to offer a quick summary. Hippocrates did teach, and he's the father of modern medicine, although it doesn't mean he was modern in his medicine. Hippocrates uh, taught that a woman's body was more porous than a man's body and acted like a sponge. Okay, that's what he taught. He also taught that... Um, a uh, woman's glands and her hair had that sponge-like function. And they would also, not only, what are they sponging up? Well, it's specifically to sponge up reproductive fluids during intercourse. So the woman's body pulls the reproductive, the male reproductive fluids up and stores them, pulls them up so they can be stored ultimately in the abdomen. But the, um, the, the glands and the hair of a woman provide a suction that enables reproduction to take place. That was his belief at the time, right? And he's not alone in that. Aristotle taught that hair length in men and women impacted their fertility. For men, it was viewed differently, right? Because they have different functions in sex. So reproductive fluid is made in the brain, according to Aristotle, right? Actually, a lot of people would believe all the fluids were made in the brain back then. Um, reproductive fluid is made in the brain and it has to travel through the body before it can be given to the woman. So it has to make a journey from the here to there, right? Um, Every hair follicle kind of impedes this. So if you're a man and you have really long hair, your hair is kind of like a sponge too. Men and women's hair is like spongy kind of. And the problem with men with long hair is as their sperm has to travel downward through the body, it has to fill up all the hair first. And this would create a problem where men could be infertile if their hair is too long, at least potentially. Every hair follicle that passes on the way will soak up some of it, so there will be less to use. So a man should have short hair, lest he soak up all the fluid and be unable to provide it for the woman. 
Now, the function of hair in women is similar but opposite, right? Hair serves as a sponge, and it pulls the fluid upward after she receives it from the man. So if she has long hair on her head, it just provides like pulling force. Um, so a woman having long hair is good. She's more fertile that way. The hair aids the suction power of her uterus and other body parts. Her whole body is seen as just more spongy and providing more suction than a man's in general. So yeah, hair had a function like that, at least in medical thought amongst, I don't know if the average everyday person had any awareness of this. Um, I don't know if Paul did or not. M maybe, maybe he did. Did you believe it? I don't see any indication that he did. We're going to talk about whether he's using that idea in 1 Corinthians 11. So is that like a testicle? Um, well, sort of. Um, it's in the sense of storing or attracting reproductive fluid, sort of. But it wasn't unique. And this is where I think Troy Martin may have just slightly, you might get the wrong impression as you're reading um, his work, his first article, because hair functioned not in a unique way as a testicle. Like you look at a woman and you go, her hair is like his testicle. Like you wouldn't do that. You would think her entire body and her hair have a function that aids in suction and that helps in reproduction. And the man's hair has the same function, but it will harm him, which is why we keep his hair short. So it's not exactly hair is like testicle. No, it's not. It really, men and women's hair both had similar functions. That's why they had to be cut differently. So it wasn't um, make or break either because the entire woman's body was seen to be spongious. Spongious? Is that a word? That's probably not a word. But anyway, it was seen to be spongical-like. And this means that a woman who had her hair cut off could still also, uh, possibly become pregnant. It was just that they considered that more challenging, more difficult. So we should grant that medical thought of the time did he, did hold that hair helped in reproduction. We shouldn't grant that it functioned as a testicle exactly. That's that's a little bit of a of a spin off of I think that what the data gives. But that's what Troy Martin goes on to say. So yes, ish. Uh, number two, question number two. Did they specifically use the word parabolion that way? Because the only thing in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen, 15, at least in Martin's first article, that pushes for this view is literally one word, parabolion, covering. Her hair is given to her for a covering. And he goes, well, parabolion means testicle here. Let's look at his case for that. Um, so initially, he has to prove that uh, parabolion can mean testicle at all before suggesting that Paul is using it that way. So initially, Martin offers two ancient quotes, which he'll change his tune a lot later on, but he offers two ancient quotes that show to show that it was in fact used that way, to show parabolion being used to refer to a male testicle. Um, one is from Achilles Tatius, and Achilles Tatius uses it to refer to sex organs of a man and the pubic hair of a woman, according to Troy Martin. Here's a quote that you can look at. <clears throat> Um, I'll just read the highlighted portion for now. Their branches, which were in full foliage, intertwined with one another, and their neighboring flowers mingled with each other, their leaves, paraboli, overlapped, their fruits joined. Now, Martin takes this, this is called garden poetry in Achilles Tatius, and uh, he takes this as an example of, well, let me just read to you his quote, how he interprets this term. The term paraplochi, flowers, alludes to female hair. The term paraboli, leaves, to the testicles in males. The term sumplochi, fruits, to the mixing of male and female reproductive fluid in the female. Interestingly, um, the two related words are taken very differently. Paraplochi is taken to refer to female hair. That doesn't seem clear to me in the passage. Th there's nothing there that suggests that that's female hair. I, I, don't, I mean, not on face value anyways. Um, paraboli is taken to refer to testicles, also not clear in the passage. As you can see, the translation refers to these things as other things, right? Leaves. So where, why, why are we saying these are testicles? So it's not clear in the passage either. The only place I notice where Tatius's book, because I just was pulled, I got Achilles Tatius's book, it's reading through a large portion of this section to try to understand it better. The only place I notice where he refers to a woman's hair specifically as something similar to this garden was a statement that her hair was like more beautiful, not even like a vine, but more beautiful than the vines. So the vines have some comparison to hair, but not the flowers. That's interesting. It just seems on the surface already we've got problems. And Goodacre's response to this first evidence of parable I being used to refer to testicle 
Goodacre's response shows some of these problems. So let's look at that. Um, Mark Goodacre <clears throat> says, it is while it is quite possible that Achilles Tatius is intending to evoke sexual intercourse in the choice of imagery in his description of the garden, but the sentence in question does not provide a one-to-one -one correspondence between items in the garden and items in the human anatomy. This is just a very sober analysis in my opinion. You can read, a I'm going to read more of the Tatius quote in a moment and recognize it is not it is not reasonable to look for specific human body parts in every element of the garden. It just seems as though this was grabbed out of nowhere and used by Troy Martin to make his case. So let's read the Tatius quote with more content and we'll show why this is probably not giving a one-to-one -one correspondence. You shouldn't look for hair or testicles or something else. Um, where's the Tatius quote? Boom. There it be. Okay, so let's read a larger section of it now. When the entombment was over, I hurried to my sweetheart who was in the garden of our house. This garden was a meadow, a very object of beauty to the eyes. Round it ran a wall of sufficient height, and each of the four sides of the wall formed a portico standing on pillars. Within each was a closed plantation of trees. Their branches, which were in full foliage, intertwined with one another. Their neighboring flowers mingled with each other. Their leaves overlapped. Their fruits joined. Such was the way in which the trees grew together. To some of the larger of them... Uh, to some of the larger of them were ivy and similax, smilax attached. How do you say that word? The smilax? <laughs> Hang, hanging from planes and filling all the, and he goes on and on and describes a bunch of other elements in the garden. When you read this quote, even in its larger context, you will find in chapter 15 of book one of this, of this, of this work, there are over 20 different elements. Let me just read to you the elements. A meadow, a wall, a portico, pillars, a plantation of trees, branches, flowers, leaves, fruits, ivy, smilax, trunks, a garland, more vines, reed supports for the vines, the rays of the sun, the wind that moves the leaves, the shadow of it all on the ground, specific flowers like the narcissus and the rose and violets, a spring of water reflecting the flowers so that it looked like there were two groves, some tamed birds, some untamed birds, the birds are singing songs, the grasshoppers, swallows, peacocks, swans, parrots, Cages for the parrots. These are all the elements that you're seeing in this one section, the same section, not out of context. Martin, Troy Martin only sees um, correspondence for two elements and they conveniently, too conveniently work for his case. His case does not depend on it being romantic garden poetry. It's definitely romantic garden poetry, right? It depends on seeing human body parts represented in specific parts of the garden. Now, some people make this mistake with the Song of Solomon, which is also romantic and has garden poetry in it, is they look for human body parts in every element of the Song of Solomon and they just get weirder and weirder and more and more inappropriate as they do so. I think this goes way too far. Um, it's meant to be vague. It's meant to be an illusion. It's not meant to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, it seems. Garden poetry could do that, right, if they wanted, but they can also just be giving romantic gardens you know, symbolizing love between animals and plants as a way of stirring up those ideas in humans. Martin also seems to have used his own translation. Um, you, you wouldn't know this in either of his articles where he provides his own translation of things and doesn't tell the reader, hey, that's my translation. So here's a, here's a thought. I want to provide for you proof that paraboli can mean testicle. Here's my translation of an ancient use of paraboli, and I'm telling you it meant testicle there. This seems a little bit um, this, like the sound of one hand clapping. So Martin wrote in uh, wrote a response to Goodacre, but in the response to Goodacre, I just want to mention this Achilles Tatius thing, he just seems to have abandoned it. Like he never said he was wrong, right? But he offered no significant response to these major problems that Mark Goodacre points out in the Achilles Tatius quote. So if you read the first paper of Martin, you should recognize that he seems to have just backed off of that, and I think rightly so. So we get to our second ancient source for why parable I can be translated as testicle or why it can refer to a testicle. And it's Euripides. Um, so the full analysis of this is way too complicated for today's video. This is already going to be an, a very long section. But Martin says uh, in this quote, parable ion is used to refer to testicles. Let me put the quote up. I have it somewhere. I know I do. Here it is. Okay. This is the Euripides quote. He says that Euripides uses parable ion in reference to a body part. 
he casts Hercules as complaining, and here's this translation, after I received my bags of flesh, which are the outward signs of puberty, I received labors about which I shall undertake to say what is necessary. Troy Martin goes on and says, a dynamic translation of the first clause would be, after I received my testicles, parabolia, which are the outward signs of puberty. In this text from Euripides, the term parabolion refers to a testicle. Um, there's so much we could talk about here, but let me just get to probably the nitty gritty, the most interesting bits, which is uh, Goodacre, Mark Goodacre had five responses to this. And one of them seems flawed, but four of them seem pretty solid. So one is Greek lexicons never offer testicle as a meaning of parabolion. This is significant. They do offer covering, which is a good meaning for Martin's statement. After I received my coverings, which are the outward signs of puberty, there could be some sort of covering there, but never do the Greek lexicons, like, you know, if Martin had a good case for parabolion, if, if I should say, if it was a natural reading of parabolion that it could mean testicle, you'd expect it to be in the Greek lexicons. It's not there. So he's trying to find it somewhere else and find a new meaning for an old word, right? That's what we're looking at here. A newly discovered meaning, I should say, for an old word. Um, so covering could work in this passage. That's his first point. And that's a known meaning. So why search for a new meaning when a known meaning can explain it? Uh, his second thing to say in response was, this is Martin's own translation. Again, Martin has not told the reader of his articles that he's providing his own translation in both cases. Where he says, you know, he goes, a dynamic translation could be, but he offered his own translation in both cases before and after. He doesn't tell the reader that. That's an odd way to establish a new meaning for a word when you're providing your own translation of a passage and not telling anybody. Number three, the more likely meaning of parabolion in this passage is that it refers to clothing, the clothing that a young man wears when he has moved from childhood to manhood. Now, this is where his point is, and hear me out, <clears throat> I think this is pretty powerful and you never would have known this reading Martin's work. The clothing metaphor is picked up in all published translation of the, translations of the passage, none of which is referenced by Martin. Martin provided his own unique translation that was in disagreement with all published translations of Euripides here. Didn't tell the reader. Didn't engage with all those who disagree with his translation. Let's look at those translations. This is the note provided for, um, provided by uh, Mark Goodacre on this. So he says thus, Theodore Alois Buckley translates, but when I obtained the youthful vestures of flesh, vestures meaning like clothing, um, likewise Robert Browning translates it, but when I gained the youthful garb of flesh, he's talking about clothing, E.P. Coleridge translates it, after I took a cloak of youthful flesh, cloak of youthful flesh, there's a clothing metaphor that's going on there. Arthur Sanders says, as soon as I gathered vestures of brawny flesh, clothing metaphor, the most recent English translation uh, from 2002 paraphrases a little, but still retains the sense common to all the others. Once the sturdy flesh of youth had clothed my limbs, uh, need I tell of the labors I endured? The phrase is never translated the way Martin translates it. Isn't that interesting? So Mark Goodacre notes several others who also see this as a clothing metaphor. Let me just put those up on screen for footnote purposes. I won't read this to you. There's just a bunch of other guys who are like, yeah, they see this as a clothing metaphor. Martin doesn't see it that way. He's going against all the scholarship, basically, on this issue, on this issue, at least those who've translated it and several others who seem to pick up on the same metaphor. He should at least have offered a case for that and not just said it like it was matter of fact. Um, fourth pushback against Troy Martin here is Martin requires the phrase as a whole to establish the meaning testicle. Let me put this, let me put Martin's thing back up so you can see it. In order for Martin to find the term testicle here, he's going to need all of the stuff that's in the phrase. After I received my testicles, which are outward signs of puberty, he he interprets it as testicle because he relates it to puberty and he doesn't see the clothing metaphor and all that. But he takes the whole phrase. The whole phrase is needed to establish Euripides, if Martin is right, to establish that Euripides is referring to a testicle with parabolia on here. Parable. It's actually uh, plural here, parabolia. The problem here is that 1 Corinthians 11 does not give any such context. It just says her hair is given to her for a covering. There's nothing in here about testicles and about puberty. and about. So even if he was right about one, it's difficult to suggest that it applies to the other. We'll come back to that later when we do the analysis of 1 Corinthians 11 in light of uh, Martin's interpretation. 
And the fifth pushback that he offered, and this is probably the one that uh, Martin seemed to me, seems like he successfully pushed against. Uh, in Paul, parabolion is singular, whereas it is plural in Euripides, parabolia, right? The idea is that she's given hair instead of a testicle, if you interpret it the way Martin does, because the covering is singular, not plural. It's not like men are given a testicle. That would be quite odd. Um, so what are Martin's responses to the criticisms that in his third paper, he wrote a response to Goodacre, right? So he says, um, first, <clears throat> he doesn't seem to interact with the slew of scholars and translations that Goodacre said disagreed with him. For the most part, he just does not interact with those guys. That This, again, seems pretty significant to me, other than to say the following. One, many of them make a mistake by translating the plural parabolae into a singular English word like garb or vesture. So they maybe should have said garbs or vestures, okay? But that wouldn't really change too much to me anyway. Uh, two, he also says that Euripides wouldn't use a plural word to talk about one's personal clothing. It would use a singular word. Therefore, it's not about clothes. Uh, this is interesting because now we're getting debates about whether par whether you would use the plural to refer to clothing, uh, clothes, and he has a whole lot he talks about there. Okay, so maybe, maybe that's right. Like, I'm not saying he has no point there. I'm not saying he's 100% wrong. I think the weight of the argument is against him at this point, but let's keep moving forward. The context of Euripides, also his response is, in his third, or his second paper, the third in our series, the context of Eur the Euripides quote proves Martin right because the word many translate as youthful is not merely speaking of youthfulness, but of puberty specifically. And he offers his case for this. He's like, this isn't about just being young. This is about puberty, about that life change of puberty. And <clears throat> he says that ancients saw the signs of puberty not as clothes, but as increased hair growth and in boys, more pronounced testicles. That's why Martin translates it as outward signs of puberty in that Euripides quote. I'll put it back on your screen in case anybody's like, wait, what was that again he said? Yeah, there you go. My outward signs of puberty. So, because, you know, others translate as youthful, that was a pretty common thing. And he's going, no, no, they're wrong about that. It should be translated as puberty, not just youthful. Um, it seems to me uh, that this argument, if successful, it makes it just as possible, and this is my own pushback here, that the term parabolion in Euripides is referring to hair. Because hair covers the flesh. And boys have, obviously, they grow more hair in all these places, not just in one spot, but in other places where others are more likely to see it, they grow more hair. Then it would make sense. Um, and so I don't know why it would be a testicle particularly when hair could be what's being referred to as a covering, which is actually how Paul uses it in verse 15. I haven't heard anybody discuss or debate that. What I'm suggesting is that it, even if he was right in this point, it would seem to not be enough to establish his view. So, but let's grant it for the sake of argument that maybe he's right. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that that's just one example in all of literature that he's found where parable ion is used to refer to a testicle. If Martin is right, it was established through numerous indications in the text that ruled out other interpretations first. First Corinthians is not like that. We will, when we examine it, you will see there's no indication in the text that that's what's being meant. And there's plenty of reason to think that more obvious meanings of the word are there. And um, Martin's final paper on the topic shifts his argument quite a bit. Um, he His original paper is like, hey, medical thought, and then ancient examples, two of them, where parable lions used this way. Therefore, it explains 1 Corinthians because the traditional view is an utter contradiction because you can't have hair instead of a covering because now the verse contradicts itself. Okay, that's not even the traditional view. That's one of the biggest problems with Martin's case. We'll get there in a minute. Martin's final paper on this topic, though, shifts his argument. He changes it from those issues. He no longer relies on ancient examples. He still defends one of them. He abandons the Tatius example. He defends the Euripides example. But he says very plainly, he can establish that Paul meant to refer to a testicle on the 1 Corinthians 11 evidence alone, with no ancient examples of the term meaning that at all. That is, if nobody before Paul ever used parable ion to refer to a testicle, Paul did in verse 15. Those are big, big claims. And it, and it depends on what's more in my ballpark and your ballpark, which is just reading 1 Corinthians 11 carefully. So here's a quick side note before we get into that part. Um, Martin seems to misunderstand, and I got to say this because um, in defense of Mark Goodacre, who I don't know and don't have a personal relationship with, and I don't, I said, I'm not really defending him as much as I want to offer a thought on this. Okay. 
um, Michael Heiser, who many of you were exposed to this argument through Michael Heiser or someone who pointed you to him. He says that Troy Martin, in his response to Goodacre, he ate Goodacre's lunch. I understand, I think, why he said that, but but I don't think it was true for a number of reasons. But the primary reason is this. Much of Troy Martin's article responding to Goodacre, that third article, which I have links to in my notes, you're welcome to have, that article deals with a straw man that Mark Goodacre was never saying. And it tears apart and eats the lunch of the straw man of Mark Goodacre. It doesn't actually deal with his arguments. Um, Troy Martin seems to misunderstand Mark Goodacre's argument in a couple of ways, and he spends a lot of the paper dealing with things that Mark Goodacre's not saying. If Goodacre, it's as if Goodacre had to prove that the word parabolion can never possibly mean testicle, like you have to prove that that's impossible, rather than just saying Martin's case for it meaning that is not sufficient. You see how these are two very different things? You have to prove it's impossible versus just saying your case is insufficient. Because of this, Martin wrongly accuses Goodacre of making basic linguistic blunders that he's really not making in his paper. Read his paper carefully. I read both of them several times. So yeah. Okay, let's go to the, 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 the nitty gritty of it all, where it all comes down, and, and it should get a lot easier now. Does it make sense to see the meaning, that meaning, testicle, in 1 Corinthians 11? Um, to me, this is the biggest issue, and it's where Mark, Martin's theory fails the most. How does he connect the testicle translation with 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen? 15? He has six points that I found in his paper and pulled out to prove his point. Six points. Let's analyze them one at a time. First, Martin suggests that we need a new solution to 1 Corinthians 11 because of how we've wrongly translated the word anti. And here he utterly misrepresents the issues. Okay, let me just read to you what he wrote. And that probably wasn't it. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> from his paper, he says, especially problematic is the statement that a woman's long hair is given to her instead of a covering in verse 15. As traditionally understood, false, this statement nullifies the previous argument that a woman should wear a covering since her long hair apparently serves that purpose. A satisfactory explanation of this argument from, the na from nature should resolve the apparent contradiction and enable this argument to support Paul's contention that women should wear the veil in public worship. He claims the traditional understanding is that a woman is wearing, it has her hair instead of a covering. That is not true. He manufactures a problem that is not really the traditional view. And then, then this sandwich is in his view. Oh, you have room for my view because your guy's normal view doesn't work, but the normal view isn't that. This is a misrepresentation. Instead of is a wrong translation of the word anti. Who translates it that way? Well, Goodacre points out in his paper that practically all major contemporary translations have for a covering, not instead of a covering. Like nobody translates it that way. Almost, almost nobody out there says instead of a covering. You, now you can see earlier, I dealt with this earlier uh, in my section on verse 15. But in that case, um, Martin's whole, like the wedge that makes his view necessary doesn't exist. There's no problem with the traditional view. Her hair is given as or for a covering in the sense that it's like a covering and therefore how much more does it make sense to have this extra one that represents the same kind of thing. That's Paul's argument. It's an analogy. We've dealt with that extensively already, so I won't get into it. So Martin has misrepresented everybody <laughs> on that. Um, okay, his second reason for why he thinks it works for 1 Corinthians 11. So first is a contradiction that doesn't exist. Second thing, Paul's singular use of parabolion, according to Martin, can refer to plural testicles. Okay, there's some real issues with parts parts of his case. Real issues, but it's just too much nitty-gritty to get into. So he seems to make at least a decent case for this as possible. And here, what is possible? A singular noun referring to a plural body part. Parabolion, singular, referring to parabolia. Testicles, plural. He seems to make a good case, a decent case for that as a possibility. But let's not get confused. He does not make a case that parabolion refers to testicles. He's only making a case that a singular term can refer to plural body parts. That's the case he made. It doesn't prove that it means testicle. It just shows that one of Mark Goodacre's complaints, his challenges, may have been answered. And that was his fifth challenge that I think that, I think it removes one obstacle to his view, but it doesn't prove his view by any stretch. Okay, so that's the, the good, right? The rest of it's not. Number three, his third reason to see testicle in verse, verse 15. 
He says, and I'll put this on your screen, since parabolion is contrasted with hair, which is part of the body, the physiological semantic domain of parabolion in 1 Corinthians 11, 15b becomes particularly relevant. So he's basically saying, look, a body part is on one side of the equation, hair. Therefore, maybe a body part is on the other side of the equation too. And I think that this is just assuming your conclusion. The lexicons don't agree, right? <clears throat> The body part is on one side. The, the fact that a body part is on one side doesn't mean a body part has to be on the other side. And again, we, we don't see parabolion, meaning testicle, in lexicons. There's maybe one case in Euripides which seems very far-fetched. It seems more likely if it doesn't refer to clothes, it probably refers to physical body hair. That seems more likely. And it seems like it fits because it's actually a covering that more closely relates to cloth. Um, so parabolion can simply mean cloth covering. Like that. that's a normal use of the word, right? Look, go back to verse 15. The word covering typically, normally, almost all the time refers to cloth covering in a context like this. Paul earlier has dealt with cloth coverings throughout the entire passage. Why is he suddenly talking about a testicle? This is such a waste of time. <laughs> when translating, it is best not to add new meanings that are not needed to explain a word and a concept that is already present in the text. Number four. Martin says that this explains why Paul wants them to cover their hair. Um, <clears throat> if you see hair as a testicle, a sexual reproductive body part, it explains why Paul wants them to cover it up. He says because women's hair is genitalia and Jews don't want genitalia exposed. So the covering is meant to expose genitalia. Now I feel like we're just moving off into La La Land at this point with this weird interpretation that many have grabbed onto through the through the endorsement of Michael Heiser mostly, who I love, by the way. I disagree with him on a bunch of things. I still love him. He's a brother in Christ. And I think he's done a lot of good and he actually has a lot of cool insights. I just can't like say I consistently agree with him on things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, th this is just so weird. Um, the covering, as we've seen from the artwork, the covering didn't even fully cover a woman's hair. So it's not like the covering was actually meant to hide a thing. It was a symbolic covering that just went over part of the head. The hair was still exposed. Are we meant to think that Jews are okay if you only partly expose your genitalia during worship? Hey, you need to halfway cover up that genitalia. All right, now let's worship the Lord together. Like this is, this interpretation confuses two cultures as well. Okay, let me add another thought on here. I'm trying not to, Turn this into a cartoon over here. Uh, the Greeks thought hair had a function that helped in reproduction, but the Greeks who thought that did not treat hair like genitalia. Did you catch that? They did not treat hair like genitalia. The Jews, whole different culture, their thought to adopt this view and make it way more extreme than the Greeks did and require head coverings because the Greeks over there think that it's genitalia, but that's not even part of Jewish culture. The Greeks didn't wear coverings in their worship and the Jews did like it just this is just chaos I don't know what else to say um, it makes it strange also that Paul didn't want men to cover their heads because hair does the same thing in men it just doesn't do it as effectively when the hair is short so why are men allowed to have their genitalia uncovered in <sighs> annoying Paul explains his reasons explicitly we do not need to in just import into the text of scripture testicles on your head nonsense in order to explain what this means. Headship, honor, shame, God's created order, and nature itself. These are the reasons Paul gives for why he has this whole thing about head coverings. He, he never gives a reason related to something like testicle, unless you read brand new, totally foreign ideas, cram them into verse 15 uh, without good, good reasons in lexicons or context to do so. All right, let's look at the fifth reason that Martin gives for why this view he thinks should be promoted, why we should look at Paul and say, yeah, he's talking about hair as a testicle. It's because of the phrase, because of the angels in verse 10. <clears throat> this is again, um, a difficult phrase, a vague phrase. And sometimes people, sometimes people will take a difficult, vague phrase in scripture and cram a bunch of weird theology into it, right? Mormonism does this in 1 Corinthians, or is it second, where Paul says, um, otherwise, why do you baptize the dead? Or why are you baptized for the dead? Now, we struggle to go, what does he mean baptized for the dead? What is he talking about baptized for the dead? There's very little context to understand this. Mormonism goes and says, oh, 
We have an entire ritual structure and, and a whole theology of the afterlife based on baptizing people for the dead, and we're going to cram it into those few vague words. This is a normal thing that people do uh, to, incorpor to bring in their unbiblical theology and stick it into scriptures, find a vague phrase, shove a bunch of extra meaning into it, and then there you go. Well, that's what happens here. He says, because of the angels, um, implies that this is uh, an issue of lust after women's hair because it looks like it functions to the angels. It's like a testicle. So it depends on the view that women by head coverings are protected from angelic lust, a view which I definitely reject and I gave the reasons why earlier on up in this video. Um, <clears throat> also, the angels part, a problem with this view, not only is it problematic because I reject that view for a number of reasons that I think are solid and prefer the holy angelic observer's view. But in addition to that, this, this idea of the angels is not connected to verse 15, right? Women should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. It's not connected to verse 15, which is saying something different. Her hair is given to her for a covering. Like it, these, are, these are two separate ideas. They're handled separately. The logic flow is different. The that is why of verse 10 derives from the created order, not from the nature of hair. Man's made first and woman's made for man and all that. And then the immediate context explains, should explain that, not some later context. Um, and if the immediate context does explain something that angels observing the proper worship order explains is explained in the immediate context, don't go to a later explanation in a later context if you can help it. That's just a good interpretive rule. All right, number six, his sixth reason why he supports his view, final one, uh, where he says he can find it in 1 Corinthians 11, even if nobody in the Greek world ever used the term to mean that. It's because of tradition. Let's look at that quote here. Powie. All right. The traditional translation of covering does not satisfy the context since hair provides a covering for both men and women. Martin sees here, let me explain this one. He sees that the covering view would make sense if hair could provide the same function in a man as it does in a woman. This is where his view is like backfiring on him. According to 1 Corinthians 11, hair does provide the same function in men and women. And that's why you have to have different hairstyles between men and women. Because a man with long hair has the same kind of thing going on as the woman with long hair. The woman with short hair, it's like a man. So if that's the case, then hair has the same function. See, on his view, you, you, you need... You know, the woman has a unique function with her hair. It's pulling, you know, things up so that you can reproduce. Whereas with man, it, it's it's resisting. It has like an opposite type deal. Um, okay. This view exasperates me. All right. Um, the problem in 1 Corinthians 11, it, from my reading of the text, is it does provide the same implication. He, uh, it implies that the man is under someone else's headship right? The, the, this, this hair and covering issue other than Christ, or perhaps that Christ is under a lower headship. Perhaps that's implied. Paul's concern is headship, not pre reproductive functions. Since Martin acknowledges this parallel is part of the traditional view of parable ion as covering, it makes sense that when we see that same parallel in the very passage itself, that the traditional view is actually supported, not refuted. I hope that makes sense. I, I mean, this is the kind of thing where he says it and you're like, I don't really know if I understood it or followed it. But I think this, this point of his actually backfires. My bottom line is this. None of his points prove his case. And I have not, I have not even gotten into the problems, like the challenges I would present to 1 Corinthians 11 being interpreted that way. I've only examined his positive you know, case. Let's look at the reasons why you shouldn't view it that way, in addition to defeating the positive protestical view. Oh, man. Some people... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm O Manning here because not because of Troy Martin, but because of people who literally get excited because it's a view talking about testicles. That's like their excitement and about it. And it's just because they're like still 13 year olds. All right. Here's how it does not fit 1 Corinthians 11. One, the connection with headship. Man is the head of woman. This seems to be Paul's primary concern and it has nothing to do with hair as genitalia. Right? So you're not connecting it to his primary concern. Everything else he says in the passage connects to his primary concern. Hera's genitalia has nothing to do with that. Number two, the worship context. If head covering is a genitalia exposure issue, 
then it stands that heads should be covered at all times, not just in worship. But it's just in worship that Paul's interested, and that doesn't work with Martin's view. Uh, third reason, Martin's view does not fit Paul's first analogy in verse 5. Let's look at verse 5, because that's the first time Paul brings up a relevant analogy, <clears throat> and it doesn't work with Martin's view. It says, Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaved. Wait, exposed hair genitalia is the same as having none at all? Exposed genitalia is the same as having none at all. That's definitely not true. I mean, you can say the connection is shamefulness, but that's what seems obvious without adding the genitalia view. If you add the view of genital hair as genitalia, then you have a problem. If lacking a covering is like exposing your genitals on his view, then how is it that, how is that like not having any at all? Uh, having your hair cut. It doesn't work. Paul is not, it would be inconsistent. Number five, why does Paul need to go on and on with other arguments? He argues from headship. He argues from the similarity of hairstyles. Uh, head coverings are like hairstyles in some way. He argues from glory. He argues from creation's order. This isn't a, a slam dunk, but it means that the main concern can't be the genital issue, genitals issue, right? It can't be or as a testicle. It's got to be some other main concern because he goes on and on and on about other things. And it's literally not until one word in verse 15 that you're like, ah, testicles all of a sudden. So yeah, that's not a slam dunk, but I think it's an important point that we should be aware of. The rescue for Martin's view on that point alone would be um, potentially that Paul is just adding an additional argument here at the end to a list of other reasons for head coverings. Hey, here's one more reason to do it. But then we have to admit that the whole passage, catch this, is literally fully explained without Martin's contribution. And it's only helpful when you come to verse 15, where it would be more, nat more naturally read as just a cloth covering. In that case, you've got one word that this whole thing's hanging on, and that word is way more likely explained by the common usage of the term to refer to a cloth covering the head, which is what Paul's been talking about the whole time. So many of you out there, um, you were persuaded by Troy Martin and by probably more so by Michael Heiser and the way he characterized the issues. I think you've been misled. I agree with Preston Macy on this one, where he says, Martin's article cannot be taken seriously. It is better to take Parabolion in the same sense as employed by Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who, where it says, about to depart, he pulled his cloak over his head. Parabolion, right? That's that's the idea, his Parabolion, his, his covering, his head covering over his head. Certainly didn't pull something else over his head, which would have led to serious medical problems. Okay, I think I'm done with the um, annoying thing. Let's look at our final question. Well, we have two questions left, really, because one is about conclusion. But big question, how does it apply today? Should we apply this head covering principle today? Um, I took this very seriously. Um, and everything I'm going to say now is going to come from my prior interpretations. If you disagree with me on my interpretations, you may not follow me on my application either. That's fine. I'm not the Pope. I'm not the, the, the Bible guru here. Um, my goal is to walk you through, walk with you through the thinking process of working through these things so that you can come to conclusions. Um, so are head coverings for today? That is the question. And <clears throat> I think that the first initial answer is it's obvious that Paul wanted women in the first Corinthian church and women in all Christian churches in the first century to wear head coverings, at least when praying or prophesying. Like that's for sure. That was something that was, he wanted to have going on there. He also wanted men to go uncovered in the same context. There's like no real debate on that. But first let's talk about some of the implications. Okay. If coverings are cultural, um, how would we apply this today? Cause you have to recognize there's lots of churches, Christians who do wear head coverings. Would you be telling them not to? No, actually you wouldn't. Um, if coverings are cultural, if you conclude that the whole passage is culturally bound, then churches where head covering practices exist, they should continue those head covering practices. They should not just set them aside as cultural, right? So Russia, Ethiopia, Romania, India, Arab countries, to name a few, but other churches where they don't already practice head coverings, they would just, they would just not be compelled to take up the practice. So cultural doesn't mean set it aside. Cultural means look at your culture and follow that practice. If, however, coverings are transcultural, then it means all those other churches that don't already do head coverings, most of the churches in America, for instance, it means they should start doing them. 
at least in prayer and worship, right? Not not everywhere you go all the time, but at least in prayer and worship. So let me offer you two sides. First, I'm going to bring the argument for head coverings. Then I'm going to bring the argument against head coverings. So I'm going to do both sides and you'll see where I stand. And I'm, I'm a little bit uncertain, but I, I'm, I'm bringing my best case for both sides here. Okay. Which I, I hate to do, but I have to do this because I'm a little bit uncertain. So the argument for head coverings right now in all cultures for transcultural head coverings that the Bible is teaching that goes like this. And there's, I'm going to have, I think, seven points to offer. First point is the Bible says to do it. Okay. It's, it seems like the most straightforward reading. Like if you just look at the text and just read it straightforward and you weren't, if you were just casually reading it, right? It just looks like it's telling women to wear head coverings. Like that seems on face value. Yes. Okay. Now is the, is the casual reading of every passage, right? But it, no, but it does matter. If you're even unsure, you might say, maybe you're not sure about head coverings. Well, then maybe you should just wear it because you're not sure. So you just go ahead and do it. That could be a follow-up to that as well. Um, a second argument for head coverings being transcultural is that all the churches did it. All the first century New Testament churches were doing it. Paul says so in verse 16. I think that's the most reasonable interpretation of that verse. That does seem like a heavy thought to have. Okay. All the churches did it. Number three, Paul argues from headship for head coverings. Headship's not cultural. I agree. Headship's not cultural. So if you are used from a non-cultural thing to head coverings, shouldn't you say that head coverings themselves are non-cultural? Number four, Paul argues from the created order for head coverings. Is the created order a cultural argument? No, it's certainly not. So therefore, it's not cultural. It's transcultural. Number five, Paul argues from nature, how God made us, made man and woman. He argues from nature for head coverings. Nature's not cultural. This all seems pretty transcultural. Also church history. <clears throat> so not just the first century church, but if you go forward in the church in time, you will see that this was a pretty standard practice even later on. In T Tertullian, for instance, in the third century, sort of like 200 years later, he shows us that there was a debate among some as to whether unmarried women should wear coverings or not. Now, what does this imply? Well, if the debate is, can unmarried women go without coverings, then that's because there was no debate about the married women. And there was just some churches where they didn't and some churches where they did for the unmarried women. Because they were wrestling with the same question of whether the passage deals with husbands and wives or just men and women in general. This was pretty standard practice in the church for a lot, for a long, 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 long time. How did it get out of the church? Well, that's argument number seven, seven for head coverings today. And that is the sketchy way that head coverings stopped being used, particularly in the United States. And the answer there is basically feminism. Feminism seems to have been like a big driver of the ceasing of head coverings in the American churches. And I'm just going to give you what information I do have on this. It seems accurate. Um, feminists targeted head coverings. They didn't like head coverings. They saw it. Catch this. They saw head coverings as a symbol of the role differences between men and women that they wanted to reject. So they wanted to get rid of head coverings. One feminism, feminism? One feminist in particular, Elizabeth Farians, who uh, was a director of the NOW organization. Um, she organized protests such as one targeting the wearing of head coverings at Easter. In 1969, there was a news release that called it the Easter Bonnet Rebellion. Let me put that on your screen. To all news media for immediate release, the outmoded and discriminatory practice of women wearing head coverings at lit the liturgical services was the target of a protest by the National Organization for Women on Easter morning at St. John de Nepomuk Catholic Church. So they targeted, you know, Easter, where you have the largest number of people at church, and they tried to target that head covering practice in particular, and they wanted to get rid of it. This is them producing their own, because this is what these organizations do, right? They produce their own uh, news releases, then they go and do these protests. So it was around this time that the practice fell away, largely fell away in the American churches. It was around the same time as feminists were targeting the practice. There's women alive today who remember when everybody went to church, all the women would wear coverings, a hat or something. So that, I mean, you have to admit that that's a little sketchy. Let me share with you the quote I put up a moment ago from R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, who I, I really like R.C. Sproul a lot um, and I respect him a lot. And he was one who actually thought this was a transcultural rule. He didn't push it on others. He said in his church, it was just mostly his wife and his daughter were the only ones wearing head coverings on Sunday, but they thought it was something God did want them to do. R.C. Sproul 
notes the following. The wearing of fabric head coverings in worship was, the uni was universally the practice of Christian women until the 20th century. What happened? Did we suddenly find some biblical truth to which the saints for thousands of years were blind? Or were our biblical views of women gradually eroded by the modern feminist movement that has infiltrated the Church of Jesus Christ, which is the pillar and ground of the truth? Now, I'm not sure if it was absolutely universal in every single church, but it was super widespread, right? Like throughout history, head coverings in times of worship were super widespread. And only more recently, in concert with feminism, with the rise of feminism, do we have it being pushed against real hard and eventually just being dissolved in American churches in particular and probably other Western churches as well. I don't know. I don't live out there. <clears throat> so um, that's circumstantial. Let's acknowledge that's circumstantial. Right? That doesn't prove what the Bible's saying. Just because feminists argue against something doesn't mean the Bible automatically teaches whatever they're arguing against. That's, that would be bad reasoning. But it does seem at least significant, right? The thing feminists didn't like about head coverings was precisely the thing Paul was trying to preserve with head coverings. That seems pretty reasonable to me. We are at a place today, however, where we have to ask, is the disuse of head coverings actually because of rejecting headship. Uh, are women in churches today thinking any of those types of things? Are they like, I'm not wearing a head covering because that means male headship. Most women, I think, Amer you know, American Christian women I've talked to, most of the women there are thinking like, I don't wear a head covering because I didn't think it was a thing. Like, is it something God wants me to do? I I'll do it. I, you know, it's not like a rebellion thing. It's not like they're, they're, they're my feminist principles. Um, but I will say that a last thing I'll say positive for the pro head covering movement is that in churches where head coverings are there, gender roles are also strongly preserved. It seems like every church where you've got head coverings, every Christian who's using head coverings is also very serious about observing gender roles. And so there's like a preservative impact that's there that seems positive. Um, of course, the Galatians will disagree with most of what I'm saying, but that's the entire series. So um, <clears throat> now let's talk about the case against head coverings as a transcultural practice. Here's my best case against it. While I'm very sympathetic to the case for it, I see one hole in the case for it, one significant hole. And um, I think it needs to be discussed. And I'm mentioning this because I have looked and looked and I have not found anybody who offers a thorough case, a thoughtful case, that head coverings are not transcultural. They just say it with a sentence. Most, everybody just says, meh. It's, it's, we can tell it's cultural. Like we, we can tell, right? Like we can just tell it's cultural. I'm like, well, that's not good enough for me. As you guys know, I'm, I'm afraid of reading my own culture into scripture. So here's the case, my own case. I've not had anybody push back on this. I'm interested in your guys' responses to it. I think it's a, a, a solid case. So Paul, and it bases on, just on one principle. Paul never argues for the meaning of head coverings. That is, Paul never says, this is what head coverings mean and it's a transcultural thing. He never argues for it. He argues for their use in a way that is entirely dependent on their meaning. He assumes their meaning for the sake of what everything else he says. Um, yet, the meaning itself that head coverings represent, this idea of female submission or female, uh, that would be like the most offensive way to put it probably, or subordination, there you go, um, or the idea of different gender roles related to authority between men and women. That idea is not something he actually teaches. Nowhere in chapter 11 do you read that. Nowhere, I think, in the New Testament do you read that. Nowhere, I think, in the Old Testament do you read that. That meaning was never taught in the Old Testament. It may have been in the cultural background of the Old Testament, but it's not actually taught there. Did Eve wear one? Did Eve wear a covering? At what point is that there? Um, I don't think God made her skins to put on her, her head or something. Yet, um, that meaning is also not taught in the New Testament. It is part of the cultural background. Head coverings have symbolic meaning to the to everyone in the culture, but it's not taught as the meaning of head coverings anywhere in Scripture, to my knowledge. If you have one rule in mind when you interpret 1 Corinthians 11, it will allow for the following interpretation that <clears throat> it, it's not transcultural. Um, the rule is, what Paul does not argue for is not something the passage is teaching. Catch that? That's the rule. What Paul does not argue for or teach explicitly is not something the passage is actually teaching. It's just something in the background. If you are in a culture that sees head coverings as messaging men's headship and women supporting their role difference, then you wear them. 
That's the rule. If you are not in such a culture, then you still need to honor and be happy with ways of making sure you're observing biblical headship, but you don't need to wear the head covering. That would be the idea. Now, how would this impact the case for head coverings? Let me walk through the case for head coverings and respond to it now with my, my pushback. All the churches did it, Mike, so we should do it today. And I'll say, um, it's not universal church practice now. So one could suggest that it, this means that if Paul wrote 1 Corinthians now, he might have written it differently because he couldn't write verse 16 now. Like it, it fits in first century, but now he couldn't go. All the churches do it because all the churches don't do it, not even remotely. So all the churches did it, yes, but he's just making an observation about what all the churches are doing. Anyway, I'm, you get what I'm saying? I don't want to stretch that fact too far, too far. Um, that could be an appeal to culture. All the churches are doing this could be an appeal to universal accepted culture of the time, which would make it a culturally bound appeal. Number two, Paul argues from headship for head coverings. That's the second argument. Hey, Paul argues from headship for head coverings. Headship's not cultural. I agree. But it's the headship that's not cultural. Read the passage carefully. The, the remains, uh, headship remains an abiding principle, but he doesn't argue that the head covering is the abiding principle. Catch it, it's the application, but he just assumes that everybody already has that meaning in their mind, which not everybody does today, um, I have to acknowledge. Paul argues, number three, from the created order for head coverings. It's, it's right, and it's not cultural. The created order is not cultural. But when you look at it carefully, Paul's actually arguing for male headship here, not for head coverings. He extends it to head coverings. He applies it to head coverings and requires something he doesn't argue for. It requires that head coverings have a meaning, a symbolism that he never expresses. He assumes the meaning of head coverings, but doesn't say it's divinely given, right? So what's the, the arguments of Paul more carefully are, he's arguing for male headship over and over again, and he applies it to head coverings, which he doesn't argue for. He doesn't argue for their meaning, is what I'm suggesting, the messaging of head coverings. Um, number four, the argument for, for using them transculturally, is Paul argues from nature how God made us for head coverings. Yeah, but, but that's actually a little different. In verses 14 to 15, he's arguing that nature teaches us hair length matters. He applies this to head coverings in a way that requires head coverings have a similar meaning. Like if the head coverings don't have that meaning, then it wouldn't apply. It just assumes it. Meaning that if you move this text into an, a culture where head coverings don't carry that symbolic meaning, then a key element of applying it to you is not there, and it's not something that's actually argued for in the scripture. Nature didn't give women head coverings, cloth coverings. It gave women longer hair, and he's applying that to coverings because of its symbolism. So this makes me think that hair length, speaking of application, how we apply this, hair length is a general rule. I think this probably is the case, and I didn't think this when I was younger. When I was, when I was like 18, like I had like the long hair coming down just past my chin even man i you know yeah and i think that actually would have been better if i'd cut my hair i don't think you're in great rebellion against god but there's like a it seems to me that the scripture is here arguing not necessarily that head coverings are transcultural but hair length does seem like it is transcultural because it's argued directly from nature it's applied to head coverings but it's not um, directly about head coverings so this makes me think hair length is a general rule. Guys have longer hair, girls have, uh, excuse me, other way, guys have shorter hair, girls have longer hair. Um, I like what R.C. Sproul said about this. He's like, how long is long and how short is short? And he goes, well, in different cultures, this seems different. Some girls have really long hair over here. Other ones, they have pretty shorter hair. But you're generally going to see guys have shorter hair than girls. And girls have longer hair than guys. And this is a nice outward way of pushing gender differences into the foreground of our interactions. It's not a surprise that the transgender movement constantly changes the hairstyles to make androgynous looking um, girls or, or feminine looking guys. This is a, a deliberate pushing out of gender norms that we should actually fight against if we're going to be, at least for our own selves as Christians, if we're going to be consistent. But like if you're listening to this and you're a guy and you got long hair and you're like, I don't like my hair, Mike, or you have a girl and you got like your hair's like this long and you're like, I don't want to grow my hair. Like I totally get you, but it's not just about you, right? But let's talk about it in a little more detail. Um, Paul and the rest of them knew that there were exceptions to this rule, like the Nazarite vow. Okay. And this doesn't mean that if you like having long hair, oh, I'll just make a Nazarite vow. <laughs> Go read the Nazarite vow, my friend. <laughs> um, 
But uh, but yeah, Samson literally got in trouble for cutting his hair. So obviously there's exceptions to the rule. Maybe you're an exception. It's not up to me to decide. Um, that's possible. At least to do the following checklist. You're going to go against these hair length norms that scripture seems to support. Check your motives and check the messaging of your hair. These are two different issues. Men, are you trying to avoid your manhood? Being a teenager with long hair is sometimes about avoid, avoiding manhood. You don't really want to be fully responsible. So you want to act a little bit more like a young, goofy kid. And I'm not saying it's always like that, but yeah, I, I've seen it both in myself and others. You get your hair cut, you get, you get cleaned up, and you start acting more like a man. Like that just tends to happen. Uh, not, not in every case. I'm not saying that if you have long hair, you're not manly. Look, I'm just saying it does happen. And I know from personal experience that it can happen to you. Um, so are you also, are you trying to look feminine? Is that the thing? Am I desiring to look feminine? Am I trying to like violate gender norms? Like, well, you're in rebellion to God then. Like that, that seems to be clear teaching of scripture. Um, are you intentionally doing that? The, the, feminine or masculine? Um, that's a big deal. But what if you're doing it unintentionally? Here's the part that people aren't going to consider, I think, today. We're so individualistic. We think, well, as long as my motives are pure, I can do anything I want. Well, no, other people matter too. Is my hair sending a message to those around me where I'm unintentionally looking feminine? And like, I remember a buddy of mine who had long hair and like some guy was, you know, driving his car was like, woo, baby, and hit on him. And he turned around and the guy like, you know, probably threw up in his mouth and um, didn't expect it, like a goatee to show up uh, when he turned his face around. But yeah, this can be the case where you just do it for your own trendy reasons, but you're sending a message to others that you're feminine and you're not meaning to. Or girls are sending a message to others that they're masculine, even though they don't intend to. That can be happening. So women, men ask these questions. Maybe you're an exception, like the Nazarite or the philosopher, and there's some other reason, or maybe not. Um, but I think the principle seems to be sound. Um, okay, the fifth reason why <clears throat> they would say we should apply head coverings to all cultures would be because, the phrase because of the angels, right? Angels aren't bound by human culture. By my own interpretation of the passage, it's angelic observers who want to see head coverings on the women and not on the men. Okay, and angels aren't bound by human culture. So if you're in a culture, here's my application of that, that sees head coverings with that symbolism, then not wearing them is an act of rebellion. So an angel who's, who's in a culture where he knows that culturally head coverings mean something and you're rejecting them, the angel wants to see you wearing them. If you are in a culture where they mean nothing, then they just don't have any implications. It's the implications that matter, not just the symbols themselves. So angels want to see God glorified. Uh, this argument also, like all the others before it, it depends on the symbolism of, of head coverings already being in place. But the Bible doesn't actually argue for that symbolism or teach it. It just assumes it. Could that have just come from the cultural background? That seems reasonable to me. Imagine the following scenario. If Paul the Apostle, the Apostle of Gentile evangelism, encountered a culture where head coverings had no symbolic value whatsoever, right, related to gender roles or anything else, would he have asked them all to start wearing those head coverings? Now here I'm going out on a limb. This is only one point, but I'm going to suggest he is the one who became all things to all people, to the Jew, he becomes a Jew, to the Gentiles as if he was a Gentile. And that involved like, traditions and sim symbolism of different things and that kind of stuff, Torah observant, all that kind of thing. The head coverings were a shared tradition amongst Jews and Gentiles around that world at the time. But if Paul had encountered a culture where it wasn't the case, it seems at least he would have probably been consistent to not worry about it. But he would have absolutely driven in gender roles between men and women as still being preserved and demonstrated in the way people behaved. I think that's consistent. Uh, now, here's a challenge to this view. You might be like, Mike, that's pretty, I like your view there. That's good. Yeah. He doesn't actually argue for the meaning. So if you're in a culture where the symbolism is there, you wear the coverings. If you're in a culture where the symbolism isn't there, you don't worry about it. You just preserve the roles. Here's a challenge to this view. You could say, Mike, is this an argument from silence? And my answer would be, well, I mean, you, sort of, you could say it's an argument from silence because I'm, does scripture ever say that it's just cultural? No. Um, I don't have an indication either way. So I'm arguing that in the silence, maybe it's cultural. And I could be right there, um, but what if I'm wrong? But it's not just an argument from silence. Like we use that phrase sometimes to be like, oh, so you can ignore it. Well, there's always more to it than that. It seems to be true that the Bible does not teach that head coverings have this meaning forever. That seems to be true. It just responds to a cultural environment where they do have that meaning. Okay, I'm saying maybe the cultural environment changing really does change the application here. 
the proponents of the transcultural head covering idea, they're not just arguing that you should wear them. They're arguing, or they must argue, that head coverings mean the same thing in every culture throughout time. That's difficult to prove biblically, and it's difficult to prove when you actually look at cultures where sometimes head coverings don't mean anything. So how can we tell if, if, if I'm not just forcing my culture onto scripture here? Again, I'm not 100% sure, okay? This is why I, I say this with a little bit of trepidation. I'm just exposing all my thinking here for you to consider. Um, <clears throat> it is honestly not entirely clear to me. Perhaps the safest thing is for you just to wear head coverings if you're not sure. Then that's up to you. And I just recommend you don't be just judging everybody else about it. I have total respect for anybody who decides they're going to wear head coverings. Go for it. Go for it. Do it under the Lord. That's fine. Don't turn into an ego thing. Don't get weird about it. But, but my case is not arbitrary, right? It depends on the following, just to remind us. I really don't want to lose this point because I think that application is actually one of the key issues that almost nobody talks about when it comes to the head covering issue. Number one, the fact that Paul's logic depends not just on the practice of head coverings, but on their symbolic meaning already being in place. It's not something he establishes, not something he teaches, not something he connects to creation or anything else. It has to just already be there. Number two, the fact that Paul who are used from creation and nature for either male or, or either male headship or hair length propriety, he never are used for the symbolic meaning of head covering. He never are used for it, even though he are used for all those other things that we say, I will say are transcultural. Number three, the fact that the symbolic meaning of head coverings doesn't seem to be given anywhere in the Old or New Testament outside of Paul. It's not a rule from God, as far as I can tell. It's only a present cultural reality in a lot of the scenarios. Number four, the fact, this is not arbitrary, it's based on the fact that this meaning is not present in cultures universally, which is why this passage is so hard to understand for many modern readers. Because we don't all look around and go, oh, I know what head coverings mean. Like, I have to like sit there and go, what are the head coverings even about? Like, what does it mean when they're wearing? Because my culture doesn't understand that. It doesn't seem to be a natural human thing, the way we understand that murder is wrong and stuff like that. Like, it's not like that. Number five, <clears throat> final point, the fact that Paul would always hold his principles strongly while seeking to emulate cultural differences when he brought the gospel to new people. This one we have to handle very carefully. It doesn't make room for homosexuality. It doesn't make room for any of that kind of stuff. It doesn't make room for transgenderism. It makes room for the idea that you can hold gender roles together in an environment where head coverings have no meaning whatsoever. And that's all I'm suggesting. And one last little danger before I get to my conclusion for this final, this whole video, I don't even know how long this thing is going to be, it's my longest video ever most likely, um, <clears throat> is a, a warning. I have a warning for those of you who are part of the head covering movement. Um, and I say this as your brother who, I support you wearing head coverings, I say go for it. I, I think you're doing something to honor the Lord and I don't have any weirdness to you whatsoever and would, yeah, go for it, go for it. Totally understand it. Um, but head coverings can lure you into even a cult and weird teachings. And here's what I mean. And this can happen in lots of ways, but head coverings can do it too. It's not uncommon for weird groups to find a secondary issue that most churches get wrong, to focus on that issue and use that as the gateway to bring you in to their identity. They highlight the secondary issue, then they form an identity around that issue. Then they show you all the other stuff you got wrong. And pretty soon they're like, you know, like the deity of Christ. Yeah, you guys got that wrong too. Weird new doctrines like the serpent seed doctrine. I have a video on that. I'll link down below. Um, and they start taking control of your life. And the thing is they have this outward sense that they're the only ones doing it right because they observe head coverings. Right? I, I, like the Korean mother God cult observes head coverings in their worship services. They absolutely tell, tell people, look, we're the only ones doing this. They're not the only ones, but they'll tell them we're the only ones. And it's seen as proof that everything else they teach, which is her heretical garbage, that that stuff must be true as well. Don't become a pawn, right? Your identity should not revolve around head coverings, but around Christ. So I just want to warn you in that. Don't be pulled aside in this. Don't disfellowship people who have different views on these issues, please. These are secondary issues. All right, that being said, what is... Oh, that was 14. I never changed the timer. Man, I'm such a loser. All right, 15, which I never even gave a number. What is 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16? What does it mean for women in ministry? The conclusion as they says, nobody says. Okay, male headship. Here's the conclusions. Male headship is a biblical teaching. There's evidence that it relates specifically to authority, right? Verse three, I'll give several reasons for that. Verse three shows us that male headship is a real thing. It's a transcultural reality that applies to all cultures. 
video number eight, I deal with male headship and what kephalae means. Um, it is just a fact of reality about the sexes. There's no way around it. It particularly applies in marriage, not just in all men have authority over all women or some nonsense like that. Um, number two, creation's order in verses eight and nine also support the idea of male headship. It shows that man was made from, woman was made from man, verse eight, and woman was made for man, verse nine. And we looked at the egalitarian alternatives interpretations and they fail poorly, really badly on those things. They pretend the passage is focused on lust issues or distraction and worship rather than headship in the created order. Verses eight and nine show authority roles between men and women. The whole context of 1 Corinthians 11 fits this. Um, this idea of male headship, in the activity of prayer and prophecy, it's, a, it's important to maintain headship according to scripture here. While women can and should do ministry, right? While they're doing it, the order of male and female should still be maintained. And that's the complementarian view in a nutshell. And that's why eldership issues, there's an eldership requirement for them to be men because we're still trying to maintain this God-given structure of male, female. And I say, We've fallen in two counts in the modern church. We not only don't maintain the order, we've also failed because we don't celebrate it. And that's what scripture is calling us to do. See it as a wonderful thing. Fourth reason why it, it shows uh, male headship is because verse 10, it shows us that the whole reason why head coverings mattered was because they were a symbol, yep, a symbol of authority. Uh, my case doesn't rest on verse 10, but I think it's true. So I think it should be part of it. <clears throat> so head coverings clearly a symbol of authority. That's what they're seen as, um, uh, although interestingly, verse 10 doesn't argue that head coverings are a symbol of authority. Paul never argues for that. He, um, argues based upon the idea that they are. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's back to my last point about application. So it's actually very important that we do hold to this complementarian idea of male headship, but it's balanced out. Let's talk about how it's balanced out a little bit. This is why I call myself complementarian and not patriarchal. I've got to have some term to use to separate me from the from the abuses and stuff that the Galtrains are rightly complaining about sometimes and other times they're exaggerating. Um, but these are they're real are really are abuses and stuff that happen. Anytime there's power, there's abuse. But this doesn't mean that power itself is wrong. And that's really the complementarian view. So remember that verse three also says the head of Christ is God. Right? So there's a submission and a yielding and a headship between the father and the son. But in no way does this devalue the son. Does this make the son lesser? Does this make him like, like it, there's no abuse going on here, okay? So that egalitarian uh, push that is very common, very common across most egalitarians I've seen, that all authority difference equals abuse between genders is, is I think, just proven, proven wrong by the relationship of the father and the son. This does not require saying that the son has always been in submission to the father from eternity past. You may hold that view, but it's not required for that, for that position. So submission and yielding are seen in Jesus as a wonderful thing. When he yields to the father, brings glory to him, the head. But in our culture, it's seen as the icky, ugly thing that we should be embarrassed about. Biblically, it's wonderful, and that's something we need to know. That's some of the balance that's being brought. In verses 11 and 12, we read in 1 Corinthians about mutual dependence. Man comes from woman through childbirth. And so men and women have dignity and have importance and have value. And so there should be no devaluing. Okay, this is this is the thing. I feel like a lot of egalitarians would hear me saying this and they think, I don't mean it. I'm just saying it to placate them. And I would just say, you think too much of yourself at this point. I actually mean it. Um, and scripture means it. Any devaluing, the husband doesn't treat his wife right. It, it, it hinders his prayers before God. The husband's called to self-sacrificially love his wife as Christ loved the church. Talk about value. This is a biblical concept here. It's not just something complementarians mouth to placate egalitarians or stop them from claiming abuse and stuff like that. This is something we're supposed to defend and champion because scripture does. Verse 15 <clears throat> says that her hair is her glory. That's an interesting idea. Women are not being devalued here. Her hair is her glory. Feminism, I've found that in my own observations of feminism, it shames women in many ways for being women, right? Like a woman is suddenly embarrassed to say that she is a stay-at-home mom. She's embarrassed about that. This is obnoxious that she's actually embarrassed about that. Or a woman's ashamed, feels bad, that feels like she's failed somehow because her husband is the breadwinner for the family. Or like, like as if she was to say in public, well, I'll have to ask my husband about that. And then she'll be like, oh, you're one of those. Oh, you poor, poor woman. Oh, you poor depressing human being. It's such, you have such a miserable, hopeless life. Like this is the impression you get from modern feminism, to be honest. 
Rather, the Bible suggests that these gender roles are glorious for women. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go with scripture on that one. And until you are celebrating the female role, you have not thought rightly about it. Um, the reason that this was an issue <clears throat> is probably because of how active women were in ministry in the first place in the early church. Women are praying and prophesying. Women are doing so much in church ministry that Paul does have to talk about what the limits are, as he'll do later in 1 Corinthians 14 and in 1 Timothy 2. Those are our next two videos. So yeah, that's there. Um, that's why 1 Corinthians 11 is all about the activity of prophecy and prayer. Women, have your head covered when you're doing what? You're openly prophesying to the congregation. You're praying in front of the congregation, right? This is something they can do. God wants women in ministry, but he wants them to uphold male headship while they're in the midst of being in ministry. There can be a balance there. That's the heart of this series in women in ministry is be active in ministry, get out there and do much for the Lord. Don't believe the lie that if you're not a pastor, you just can't really do things in ministry. It's like, that's silly. And no, I don't know where you got that. It wasn't from the Bible. <laughs> be active in ministry um, and observe male headship at the same time. Yep. Which means there are, there are differences in who can be, say, elders. So there's equal dependence on each other equal value and status in Christ, but in relationship to each other, men and women have different roles assigned by God from the time of creation. This is what 1 Corinthians 11 says. It drives it all the way back to Genesis. This has been set, uh, seen, excuse me, in almost every culture in human history to some extent. More importantly, it's not just something that happens in scripture. It's something that's taught clearly and consistently in scripture emphatically. It's not just culture happening to the Bible. It's the Bible proclaiming to us God's order for mankind. The church should honor God by reflect, reflecting these roles because our culture, how many times do I have to say this? Our culture is wrong. Our culture is wrong and angry about it. Okay, so be right and be peaceful about it. Christians, be complementarian because the Bible calls you to be that. Don't demonize others who are just, maybe they're just wrong on these issues. I mean, the scriptures, we can't pretend that the scripture is just this big puzzle that can never be solved here. Okay, look, it's real consistent. It's just that um, there's so much noise about it now that people have stopped noticing it. Next time around, we're going to deal with women keep silent. That's 1 Corinthians 14. Women keep silent in the church, which I promise will be a much shorter video. I will never do a video this long again until one day I do. All right, thank you so much. Lord bless you. I'm going to lead us in prayer for those who are interested. Um, Father, we ask for great wisdom. Wisdom in the capacity to uh, take in scripture and let it lead and guide not only our heads, but our hearts as well. So we can celebrate and love the things that you love. And we can glory in the roles that you've given us and celebrate those things. So it's not this thing where we're embarrassed because the world tells us that we should be ashamed of it, but rather we're, we're confident and we're passionate and we're yielded in a way that brings honor to you, just like Christ obeying the Father brought honor and glory to the Father. We pray that we would yield to your lead in gender relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.